Honorable Prime Minister John Bersenyu and his cabinet, the opposition leader, Honorable Shane Barrow, to the Honorable Madam Speaker, Valerie Woods, and to all the members of this house, guests and media personnel. I invite all persons of faith to join with me in asking and thanking our Heavenly Father, Father's blessing on this house, this nation, for all who sit in the seat of power and influence, for wisdom, for favor, to guide this country, Belize, objectively. Let's pray. Almighty and eternal God, who through Jesus Christ has revealed your glory to all nations, please protect and preserve Belize, our beloved country. God of might, wisdom and justice, please assist our Belizean government and people with your Holy Spirit, counsel and fortitude. Let the life, light of your divine direction direct their plans, their plans and endeavors so that with your help we may attain our just objective. With your guidance, may all our endeavors stand to peace, social justice, liberty, national happiness, the increase of industry, sobriety, and useful knowledge. We pray, O oh God of mercy, for all of us that we be blessed, may be blessed in the knowledge and sanctified in the observance of your most holy law, that we may be preserved in union and in peace with which the world itself cannot give. And after enjoying the blessings of this life, please admit us, dear Lord, to that eternal reward that you have prepared for those who love you. Amen and amen. Thank you. Announcement by the speaker. Good morning. Good morning, honorable members. Apologies for the late start this morning. I'd like to take the opportunity to welcome visitors in the gallery. I take a special note of the attendance of Our Lady of Guadalupe High School. Welcome. Today we resume our presentations on the budget debate, and before we do that, I would like to direct your attention to our standing orders, especially Standing Order 38, that deals with contents of speeches, but more specifically with Standing Order 38, 4, 5, and 6, which reminds us of how we use language of not imputing improper motives of members, and also referring to each member by their electoral area and not by their name. Kind of review that standing order in particular. Standing order 42 also speaks to the issue of allowing other members to speak. So we need to allow members to speak by remaining silent. Please also refrain from naming members in the general public as they are not here in the parliament to defend themselves. I would like to also remind you that the reason we are here is to debate the budget which means that members should confine their comments to the bill at hand, which means that members should refer to the economic and financial situation of the country, as well as the government's policies and administration, confining comments to the bill at hand. This refers to Standing Order 6 to 4 in particular, and as mentioned in yesterday's session, while references to past events, of course, can be used to illustrate points it is important, please, to be reminded to link it to the budget debate at hand, on the bill at hand. And of course, we should always keep in mind Standing Order 91, which refers to the general authority of the Speaker. I thank you very much. We will now proceed with the debate, and we have the resumption 
of that debate on the General Revenue Appropriation 2023-2024 Bill 2023. I recognize the member for Corazal South. Good morning, Madam Speaker. Thank you very much. I rise to make my comments on the Corazal South East, yes. Corazal South. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I rise to make my comments on the uh, fiscal Appropriation Bill 2023-2024, and with your concurrence, Madam Speaker, I'd like to refer to my notes extensively. Thank you. Madam Speaker, it is my great pleasure to stand before you today to share the outstanding achievements of the Ministry of National Defense and Border Security in this fiscal year. The Ministry, with the Belize Defense Force, the Belize Coast Guard, and the Joint Intelligence Operations Center protects Belize's land and maritime spaces from foreign threats and provides security and defense for this beautiful nation. Our soldiers, sailors, and civilians have displayed dedication, professionalism, and unwavering commitment to the security and defense of Belize. To better serve the people, our ministry has worked diligently in this past year to transform and enhance the capacity of our defense organizations. Firstly, the Belize Defense Force at Binham Training. I would like to highlight the work of the BDF, which has maintained a deployment of an average of 250 soldiers on, repeat, on routine operations across the country, daily in each areas of responsibility on a weekly or bi-monthly basis. The most challenging zones include the entire western border with Guatemala due to incursions, cattle ranching, illegal construction, illegal fencing, corrals, illegal cultivation, and illegal settlements. In the southern area of responsibility, the most problematic zone is the Dolores area due south and east where scores of illegal aircraft and airspace incursions takes place and a variety of irregular migration and illegal plantations occur. In respect to special operations, our special operations task force and members of the infantry units perform a sequence of patrols with specific targets across our area of responsibilities. These deployments in the past year have successfully destroyed coca plantations, which is the precursor for cocaine, in the south of Belize on the border with Guatemala, for the first time in the history of operations and deterred and has deterred many illicit aircraft landings and incursions. Our BDF have, have had 175 adjacency zone link up patrols which were conducted successfully with the Guatemalan Army. Our BDF conducts its annual forecast of events for training successfully and these include 41 local promotion and or skilled courses which were delivered. BDF has participated along with the Coast Guard in exercise trade wins, which was also hosted in Belize during this reporting period, and it was a remarkable success for both our BDF and for our Coast Guard personnel. As the BDF progresses in the development of its personnel, there were several foreign courses offered as part of the overall success in the objectives of our 2022 goals. Of these courses, the majority are offered by the United States of America, Jamaica, Mexico, Guyana, Honduras, and the United Kingdom. These overseas courses include conferences and seminars that our BDF consistently attend. These courses are designed to enhance our interoperability and strengthen our partnerships in the region, while also providing valuable training opportunities for our soldiers. In addition, the Ministry currently, Madam Speaker, in, in partnership with the Minister of Education, we're preparing to sign a memorandum of understanding with the University of Belize to provide educational opportunities for our soldiers and for our sailors in the Ministry to improve their personal and professional uh, careers. In it comes to welfare, Madam Speaker, we are well aware and alert to the overall health and well-being of our soldiers sailors and staff. 
Although soldiers historically have had a suicide rate well below that of the population, the Ministry is committed to intervening and mitigating any self-inflicted loss of life. We have requested assistance from our partner nations, which are Canada, Mexico, and the U.S., to help us provide a training that will assist both forces in addressing these issues. The Louisiana National Guard, a very generous partner to us and a good friend, is providing mental health training to the BDF and the East Coast Guard personnel in the fourth quarter of 2022 and will continue to offer more training opportunities. The BDF has also officially formulated a wellness department which provides mental health and resilience training and counseling for our soldiers. Additionally, the force drafted and ratified a suicide prevention policy that will steer the unit commanders toward recognizing soldiers or officers who require wellness care and allow those soldiers to be afforded that care, afforded that care through the force wellness department. This care policy provides comprehensive guidance to the unit commanders as to how that care is applied to the soldiers. The Belize Defense Force has also partnered with government and non-government agencies to join efforts in awareness programs, building spirituality, and building resilience amongst our ranks. Foreign partner nations have initiated programs to assist the force with the wellness department. Furthermore, the BDF has now developed its media center and has officially renovated a building dedicated to highlighting the Belizean soldier through social media platforms, the annual magazine publication, and continues to work on a website development to realize similar objectives. The Ministry is also lobbying and we have received support from Cabinet for the first time to allow the members of the BDF to contribute and to receive the benefits of Social Security. This will take some time to come through, but we are working diligently on it, Madam Speaker. I would like to turn to, in particular, the end of last year, Hurricane Lisa, Madam Speaker. All right. The hurricane made its way inland to Belmopan which unleashed moderate flooding and winds that gusted as much as 92 miles in the city. Despite the challenges, I am proud to report that the BDF teamed up with NEMA and our Coast Guard, and they were able to come together and make crucial changes in staffing personnel that provide invaluable support during and after the storm. The BDF and the Coast Guard both implemented 12-hour tours to maintain staffing, staffing levels and operational frostbile brought in more than 500 additional personnel to assist with the cleanup efforts. Before the storm, the various battalions were given a prepared task and deployed liaison officers to NEMO and to the district emergency centers to advise the city council and other government officials of the evacuation order, notify residents of the availability of various shelters, and distribute prepackaged food, supply kits, etc. One of the things I want to comment and thank the BDF and the Coast Guard, Madam Speaker, is that out of this operation, one of the very senior government officials commented to us, only the Belize Defense Force and the Belize Coast Guard has the discipline and work ethic to get the work done. I believe, and I think I want to thank the BDF and Coast Guard for their superhuman effort in helping Belize City in particular and the Ladyville area in the cleanup effort. Without them, it would not have happened so fast and so efficiently. Hurricane Lisa has also caused a lot of damage to the infrastructure of the BDF Air Wing, approximately $575,000, which houses valuable flight assets, fixing and renovating the buildings to withstand a minimum of a Category 3 hurricane. Hurricane damage assessment to infrastructure at BDF headquarters price barracks were estimated to $2.5 million. BDF noted that new facilities and renovations that have been constructed under the new uniform facility criteria codes and not under the previous old building standards, these new ones withstood hurricane forces significantly better than the old assets. Following Lisa, in December 2022, Please allow me this one. The Prime Minister, Honorable John Bussenio, and Minister of Finance handed over 10 troop lifting vehicles to the Ministry to place special emphasis on ensuring that the Ministry is properly equipped for the job at hand. 
This was a direct contribution of the Belize Integral Security Program funded through CABE. The 10 Hino trucks, which are valued at approximately $3 million, addition, were given to the BDF that will provide for other initiatives, including, sorry, that were given to the BDF. There are other initiatives that will the BDF will receive, which includes a new kitchen with the state-of-the-art industrial equipment, dining areas, cold storage, pantries, and a generator to ensure function functionality in time of emergencies such as hurricanes. The kitchen will be constructed to serve double duty as a hurricane shelter, ensuring troops are safe and able to quickly mobilize after a storm. We're trying to, Manasika, we're trying to set the date for the groundbreaking for the new barracks and for the new kitchen facilities at Price Barracks. Other installations such as Fair Weather Camp in Punta Gorda will benefit from a well-equipped medical center and Camp Belisario in the Cayo District will benefit from the construction of a battalion headquarters. This brings BDF's total resource allocation under the program to $13 million to ensure our soldiers are no longer living and working in dilapidated conditions but are provided for as is appropriate for the sacred duty to protect and defend Belize. Additionally, to support collaboration and coordination across ministries, the Ministry of National Defense and Border Security has acquired its first ever special mission, Cessna Grand Caravan EX aircraft earlier this month. This aircraft will be used as a multi-mission platform for intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, casualty evacuation, search and rescue, air mobility, light drop, and other necessary operations in support of various ministries of government. This US 7.84 million donation comes from the United States Southern Command of the Government of the United States and it will modernize the Belize Defense Force Air Wing. And this donation also includes training, spare parts, and on-site maintenance for the BDF Air Wing, which this year, Madam Speaker, the Air Wing is gonna be celebrating its 40th anniversary. I wanna congratulate the Air Wing and all the pilots and all those who are working there for the stellar job they're doing. Looking ahead, Madam Speaker, there are several projects planned for this financial year in, light with, in line with infrastructure needed. We are planning for the renovation of the forward operating base at Sarstoon in this coming financial year. We're gonna be renovating the barracks for the female soldiers of the force. This is through a generous donation of the Taiwan's Women Initiative Program. Constructing a new building at Fairweather in the Toledo District to commence in the upcoming reporting period. We also have tra training coming up, Madam Speaker. Trade Winds again will be participating in Guyana. The Joint Readiness Training Center in Louisiana will host approximately 120 Belizean soldiers for a one-month training package later this year in June, which we are quite pleased with that, Madam Speaker. It will keep our soldiers at the high-level state of readiness that we're expecting of them. The British Army Training Support Unit also has also extended partner training packages in our country for platoon size training teams from the BDF, which will start promptly. We also have support of training from the US Special Forces, which will commence shortly in the country for force members in preparation for their deployment to the JRTC. Forecast of events of 2023 promise to deliver over 60 military courses that will accommodate our partner agencies and in some cases, foreign military partners. A lot is gonna be happening this year, Madam Speaker, in our Belize Defense Force. I turn now to the Coast Guard. Highlighting the achievements of the Coast Guard in protecting our maritime spaces from threats and, provide, and providing maritime safety, security, and protection the Coast Guard comprises of 500 strong personnel who provide services through the headquarters, through the foreign, the fo <sighs> through our forward operating bases and other stations, maintaining a reasonable fleet of small vessels 
with skilled personnel to carry out these functions. Our Coast Guard has made significant accomplishments over the past year, Madam Speaker. Part of it was also their participation in trade wins, which was co-hosted along with Mexico. We have also re received approval from Cabinet for our Belize Security Forces to participate in the United Nations peacekeeping operations. All of this is in part of staying ready for any event the government may call us upon. Our Coast Guard also hosted the 14th Annual Border Commanders Meeting with our Mexican counterparts. And for this year again, Madam Speaker, next week actually, we'll be having another Annual Border Commander Meeting in the north of the country. The Coast Guard has also signed a security cooperation agreement in September 2022 with the Ocean Affairs Council of the Republic of China, Taiwan, to develop expertise and exchanges to search and rescue, fisheries enforcement, and combating transnational crime at sea. The projects for the upcoming year, Madam Speaker, are the installation of internet service and the purchase of smart TVs for the San Pedro Forward Operating Base, the Consejo Patrol Base, and the Barranco Patrol Base. This will provide additional effectiveness and welfare to our sailors. To our sailors. Some groundworks at the HQ compound was achieved with the delivery and spreading of material on unselected areas and the repainting of Coast Guard headquarters buildings are ongoing projects. The Coast Guard also purchased a guard hut for the back entrance of its compound to enhance security and access control to the headquarters facility. We have also completed the rewiring of the Kalabashki FOB building with new light fixtures and outlets. We have done repairs to the pier at Hunting Key FOB to strengthen and reinforce the structural integrity of the pier for future use. A boat trailer was purchased using CAP2 funds, Madam Speaker. For our future plans, the most significant ongoing project, and again, next week we'll be inaugurating this with the Prime Minister, none other than the Prime Minister himself, Madam Speaker, uh, is the construction of the forward operator, sorry, the construction of the Coast Guard station at Big Creek. This station is strategically located to reduce maritime security threats in southern Belize and protect Belize's maritime and tourism economy. This project is currently nearing its end point and is scheduled to be uh, inaugurated, well, as I just mentioned, next week. Turning to the Joint Intelli Intelligence Operations Center, Madam Speaker, I am pleased to report on the success of the Joint Intelligence Operations Center in combating transnational criminal affect activity affecting Belize. The JIOC, as we call it, is staffed by members of the BDF, the Coast Guard, the Belize Police Department, Customs and Excise Department, and the Immigration Department. The staff at JIOC work 24 hours a day, Madam Speaker, 365 days a year, controlling joint enforcement team operations, monitoring communications, intelligence and reconnaissance, and allowing real-time decision-making in Belize's security operation. The JIOC has developed a regional strategy to, inhab to inhibit the illicit use of airspace and aeronautical infrastructure by transnational criminal groups. We have recently received four Ranger trucks valued at over $412,000, a generous donation by the U.S. for use in, invest in investigation and countering transnational organized crime. The vehicles supports the deployment of JIOC assets to remote areas in its ongoing efforts to disrupt illegal move, movement of people, weapons, drugs, and other contraband throughout Belize. Without going into too much details, Madam Speaker, I think we're quite pleased to see that this year we've had a significant decrease of illegal aircraft landings, and we pray it stays that way. I'm nearing the end in the part of my ministry, Madam Speaker, and I just want to discuss some of the ministry initiatives and plans. As Minister, I have been fortunate to be able to liaise with various fellow ministers of defense across the region, those in Panama, in Honduras, in Colombia, in Brazil, and in particular with the SOCOM Commander General Richardson. These communications with the different, secret uh, with the different ministers of defense helps us to strengthen trust and security among the American nations and contribute to strengthening of cordial relations with the states, international organizations, and special missions. 
We are also preparing and finalizing our national defense plan, which is a fr crucial framework that guides the defense of our nation. It outlines the need for diplomatic, informational, military, and economic campaigns during conflict and ensures the unity of effort to preserve the territorial integrity and sovereignty of Belize. We recognize the need to update our plans regularly, and both BDF and Coast Guard are doing, doing so accordingly, Madam Speaker. One last thing I want to comment, Madam Speaker. It is, we are still in the, the Women's Month, and I want to comment in particular that some of the details that we're having right now, and I think we are quite pleased with this, and I believe yourself and certainly my colleague from Belize Rural Central, would be that in the past year, in our selection board of cadets, we've had half successful cadets being female. This year, we had the first BDF female soldier jungle instructor. We have a female BDF studying at the Caribbean Military Academy School of Aviation. We have a female who is doing five-year bachelor's degree officer training in Taiwan. We have a Sergeant Major studying at the United States Sergeant Major's Academy. And we have a female, uh, sorry, we have a senior female officer in the Coast Guard who is studying at the Taiwan Coast Guard Academy. Her name is Lieutenant Commander Alma Penelo. And we also have Major Roberta Usher, the second woman to reach the rank of Major, who is studying at the U.S. Command and General Staff College. Madam Speaker, these are significant achievements for our military. The military and in our ministry, we are not going to stay behind in having women active participation. On the contrary, I believe we are leading that effort in every which way. I want to, at this point in the ministry, I want to thank all the soldiers and sailors for the stellar work they've done in the past year. Madam Speaker, I want to talk the thank the personnel at the ministry. In particular, I want to thank my partner here, the member for Belmopan, Honorable Oscar Mira. Please forgive me for that. But together, he and I work quite well. We always disagree, but at the end of the day, we come together and we find good solutions for our ministry. I want to thank the CEO, who is in the audience on my AO, those who could have made it today. All right, they really make our life and our work easy in the ministry, Madam Speaker. I want to now turn to the wonder, wonderful division of Corozal Southeast and a little on the Corozal District. Madam Speaker, no. We have a voice in this government. We from the Corozal District. No longer we are the second poorest district in the country, Madam Speaker. This is due to a caring PUP government, a visionary Prime Minister, and also active representation from myself my other two colleagues from Corozal Southwest and Corozal Way, as well as an active town council under the strong leadership of Mayor Rigo Veos, and also the active PUP village councils in the Corozal district. <laughs> Madam Speaker, with the free zone now being open for several years now, this has significantly alleviated the unemployment in the district, which was creating a lot of havoc for us when we entered. On a whole too, Madam Speaker, road works in the Corozal District can't done. We've had road expansion from Buena Vista all the way through San Joaquin, Calcutta, Carolina, Ranchito, Corozal Town, up to the border. We also have the Remate Road being upgraded. And of course, I have to comment on the crown jewel of road works in the Corozal District, the Corozal Sartaneja Road, Madam Speaker. Of the 30 miles to be paved, about 12 miles have been paved already and almost the full 30 miles have been prepared and ready for paving. The bridge at Laguna Seca is taking shape and is expected to, com to be completed before this year is finished, Madam Speaker. And the Pueblo Nuevo Bridge is also expected to be completed before this year ends. In discussion with OECC, they tell me that they will have the road fully ready within the contract period, Madam Speaker. I want to thank the Republic of China, Taiwan, for this generous loan given to Belize to improve the lives of our Belizeans who are living in the North, in particular, in my 
division, Madam Speaker. Recently, three BPOs in conjunction with the Investment Policy and Compliance Unit in the Ministry of Investment held an interview simulation exercise for over 100 college, junior college and high school students from, from the Belize Adventist College and the junior college in the Calcutta village in Corozal. The aim of this exercise is to determine how many students are ready for employment in the BPO industry in Corozal. Madam Speaker, BPO is coming to Corozal another part of Plan Belize, and also a huge effort in creating employment in the Corozal district. My office, Madam Speaker, over the past year, and I believe we're kind of putting it a little, we're underestimating here, we have supported 400 students in giving tuition assistance. I have to thank the member for Free Tongue, the Minister of Education for his full support in this effort, I also want to make it very clear, Madam Speaker, that in the past government, only UDP students used to get help. I have not done that, Madam Speaker. Every student who has reached my office or reached me, I have given support. I don't question the politics. Our motto in Corozal Southeast is an old one, but it is a timeless phrase. A mind is a terrible thing to waste. As long as the beautiful people of Corozal Southeast support me, Madam Speaker, I will always help as much students as I possibly can with regard to whatever their politics is. I also want to mention that we have identified as a priority to help the La Immaculada RC school in Sartaneja with a new kindergarten school. This will greatly help and alleviate the burgeoning community of young students there in Sartaneja, Madam Speaker. We are also helping many schools, if not all, with internet access and will continue to do so. With food, with food programs for the young children, a vital and much needed project, we got help from the Minister, Ministry of Agriculture and the FAO to commence this program in Corozal South, Southeast, Madam Speaker. This, upon its successful uh, execution, we hope to spread throughout the schools in, our, in my area. We have also managed to save the Sartaneja Baptist High School. Thanks again to the Minister of Education. All right, we are working closely with the management of the Sartaneja Baptist High School to keep that school going. That school, Madam Speaker, was struggling, in particular in the past 13 years of the UDP government, but now our government is going to give it the support it needs. We have opened the newly built Calcutta Government School in the last year that also has a kindergarten school attached. We are working closely with the Adventist Primary School in support of children and teachers. We work with their high school and also with their sixth form. Thanks again to my good friend and the member for Freetown, the Minister of Education, Honorable Francis. When it comes to land, Madam Speaker, we have now issued just in this year about 150 land documents, which include land certificate, permission to survey, purchase price, lease approval and transfers. It is not the amount that we would like to deliver, Madam Speaker, but we know that takes time, but we are continuing working and we have a lot more documents in process. In Caledonia, there were several lots that were issued out in the previous PUP government that were locked. We have begun to unlock them so that people can begin to construct. And I have committed to the people that I will open up the roads in that area so that they can have access and begin to create the new community in the Caledonia village. In Calcutta, we are working on acquiring property to subdivide and issue to young people. We are having village expansions in the village of Ranchito and San Joaquin. We have proposals for Progreso, Sartaneja, Calcutta, Chonush, and Capabank that are in the pipeline for consideration and approval. Here, Madam Speaker, I want to big up again my good friend, the member for Leikai, for his Herculean work in that ministry, Madam Speaker. I cannot thank him and the workers in the ministry. I wish you would be able to see how they work in the land clinics. I've been to three of them, Madam Speaker, in my area. And those public officers, then they jam, then they jam from morning till night. I remember, I believe with the, with the Deputy Prime Minister, we did to like midday, to, sorry, to like midnight. And those young workers in the Ministry of Lands, they were putting in more than their pound of flesh. Thank you very much, Cordell, thanks. One love, my brother. When it comes to road, group, road upgrades, this is ongoing within all the villages and sugar roads 
in the Corozal Southeast area. This is a new phenomenon, Madam Speaker, because for the past 13 years that didn't occur in Corozal Southeast. We are continuously upgrading the entrance road from Buena Vista to Caledonia and also the sugar roads in that particular village. We have also, through the MIDH ministry, we have built five of the starter homes and we're working to get five more this year to hand out to the needy people. Our priority, Madam Speaker, in this effort are single mothers. We are, like as the saying say, you support the female in the community, you're supporting the community. Again, I can't thank enough the member for Cayo South. I know he couldn't be here today, but no problem. Thanks, Brother Julius. When it comes to medical assistance, Madam Speaker, just in the past three months, I have supported over 150 persons with some small medical assistance. Thanks to my colleague, the member for Orange Rock East, we have opened the NHI clinic in Chunush. We're finally now, all of Corozal Southeast is covered. And thanks to Prime Minister, and thanks to Plan Belize, all of Corozal Southeast and the district now is covered with NHI service. As a rep, in this area, Madam Speaker, I can see the difference. I can actually feel the difference in the sense that when that clinic was opened, Madam Speaker, the amount of people asking for medical assistance, the number had decreased because now the NHI service is there in the Tronosh village and it is providing invaluable service. Thanks again to the Minister of Health. With the support of BEL, lights were installed in San Joaquin, Calcutta, Ranchito, Tronosh, Carolina Sartaneja, and soon more lights will be installed in Capabanca and Progreso. We are working on getting solar lights installed in San Joaquin, Ranchito, Capabanca, and Chunush. We are also working on upgrading the lights on all the football fields in the area, Madam Speaker, to continue to promote sports, which we all know benefit our youth. Football tournaments are taking place throughout the division, Madam Speaker. And the phenomenon with this, why this is very important for me, not, we all know, yes, sports is important. That is very critical. One of the things I'm noticing now, Madam Speaker, is the impact of drugs in the community where you don't see as much young people being as active as before. And I believe this is not the full solution, but I believe this is one part we can help combat that plague upon the country if we continue to push and promote sports in our area, Madam Speaker. We have appointed new water boards in Caledonia, Tronosh, Sartaneja, and Progreso. Earlier in the year, the government quickly moved to get a new water pump for Progreso that had blown out on us. The government, along with Plan Belize, has approved for a new water system for Sartaneja that for the past 13 years was neglected. And we're closely monitoring the one in Tronosh that needs, that is in dire need of repairs, Madam Speaker. We also have small projects currently underway in Southeast, fixing the bathroom at the San Joaquin football field, fixing and upgrading the fence in the Sartaneja football field, working along with the Capabang Village Council in land erosion project to help reclaim the lagoon due to, sorry, to help reclaim the lagoon beach due to the climate change effects. We're also in the village of Progreso organizing the Pebble Fest in Sartaneja, the annual regatta. All these activities will be occurring in the coming months, Madam Speaker. And I want to invite everybody at this point in time to come over to visit Southeast, come visit, you could visit Sartaneja, Chonosh, Capabank, Progreso. They all have waterfront. A lot of activities will be happening over the Easter, so come and visit this beautiful area, Madam Speaker. I also want to say we are working with the village council in Progreso to build some small touch house along the lagoon side and try to create some grill area where the families who come to visit can you know, have a nice place where they could sit down, enjoy the lagoon, and do them barbecue if they need to do that. Corazon Southeast will be alive, Madam Speaker, over this Easter. I want to big up my good friend, the Minister of Tourism, member for Pickstock, who has committed to help out in tourism development throughout the division. He said, he told me, and I know he will comply, he will create Sartaneja to be what I think called a magical village, right? It's a magical village promoting tourism, and he will pave the front street in the village, Madam Speaker. This will be a game changer in that area. He will also help the other villages. I know I'm committing to it just yet, because this might embarrass him, but we're going to keep it that, to that for now. In Sartaneja, Madam Speaker, too, uh, we have gotten the commitment that after this new recruit, 
uh, recruiting take at the police, we will, um, the new recruiting take at the police, we will now be getting two policemen in the village of Sartanea. Very critical, because that is a growing community. Madam Speaker, in closing, I can't go on without expressing heartfelt gratitude to the people of Corozal Southeast for their confidence in me. I want to promise you guys I will keep working as hard as I can, Madam Speaker. Last year, I was, uh, I was down for a while with a surgery, and I had to slow down a bit. I was blessed that the people, they were understanding, they knew that I couldn't be as active as before. But this year, we're getting there again, and we're beginning to continue and push doing all the work that is needed in this division, Madam Speaker. I want to thank all the elected village councils in Southeast. All of them are active. They're all hardworking. I don't have to be behind any of them to get anything done, Madam Speaker. On the contrary, it's always them calling me. I want to do this. I want to do that. Let's do it. I'm like, let's go. We have to move. All right? So these, the works that I've mentioned in particular in my division, Madam Speaker, it's all thanks to the hardworking PUP village councils and their elected council. Together, we get the job done. Finally, Madam Speaker, I can't close off in, without shouting out my team. I have two wonderful people who work for me. They work very hard. They make my life very easy. The first one is Licenciado Julio Tzol from San Joaquin and Mrs. Susan Daniels, because they have some superhuman ability that make all my tasks easy, and they have the administration of the constituency running quite smoothly. Thank you very much, Susan and Julio. In Southeast, Madam Speaker, we have one little phrase that we use in Spanish, right? It says, porque la manera mejor, let me correct it, right. um, la mejor manera de decirlo es hacerlo. What that means, Madam Speaker, is that the best way to say it is by doing it. Corazal Sotis and the PUP is about action, not words. Madam Speaker, I fully support this budget. Thank you very much. I recognize Good morning, Madam Speaker. Good morning to the Honorable Prime Minister, our leader of the opposition, colleagues on both sides of this chamber, our future leaders sitting in the gallery, and Belizeans all. Let me first, Madam Speaker, extend my sincerest condolences to my colleague, the member for Cayo South, to him and his family on the passing of a beloved mother. He often reminded us that she kept us in prayer, in earnest, that we as we sought to do the people's business in the people's house that we would maintain a measure of decorum and respect. I wish, Madam Speaker, to assure the member for Cayo South and his family that they are in my thoughts and prayers at this difficult time. Madam Speaker, as I rise to make my contribution to this year's budget debate, I am ever so mindful that I stand in this honorable house on the mandate of the good people of the Albert constituency they who elected me to serve as their representative and to be their voice on issues of national importance. None more important in my view 
than to carefully examine, provide constructive criticism, register concerns, and submit recommendations on the spending of the people's money. Serving as the representative of Albert, Madam Speaker, is a privilege of a lifetime. Madam Speaker, I listened carefully to the Prime Minister's budget speech in the National Assembly on March 10th. Impotent on any new strategies to navigate the current economic times and what lies ahead. The PM, in his usual fashion, reverted to his status quo approach, beating his chest, blaming the United Democratic Party, offering no meaningful relief or real solutions for the crippling costs of living and paying more lip service to the Belizean people. I truly marveled, Madam Speaker, on how boisterous the Prime Minister was in his pronouncements of the historic economic performance of his administration, completely aloof and devoid of the day-to-day -day realities on the ground. The Prime Minister has no idea what poverty feels like. Sleepless nights, Madam Speaker, for those who grapple with how they will continue to put food on the table, how they will continue to keep the lights on, how they will send their children to school, keep up with mortgage payments, have access to affordable healthcare services, how they will continue to address the family's daily transportation arrangements and protect their livelihoods, just to name a few. I hope, Prime Minister, that you and your cabinet are not believing those fairy tales you're telling yourself based on this new rebasing exercise. Rebasing of the statistics, Madam Speaker, and comparing apples to oranges. The Prime Minister clearly is not Mem members please 42b while another member is speaking thank you thank you is not attuned madam speaker with the mood or the sentiments of those who voted for the people's united party as well as those who did not, he would know that only the favored few believe that under this Briseño led blue PUP administration, everybody feel it. Madam Speaker, as I move about the Albert constituency on a weekly basis, the concerns expressed by my constituents have been consistent. 
These include high cost of living as it relates to the procurement of goods and services, limited access to primary health care services, even though we have an NHI clinic and an NHI pharmacy right up the street. Limited access to improved housing conditions, either by way of housing repair grants or via the 10,000 new homes this administration has pledged to deliver. Access to affordable higher education Particularly, can continue at member. the tertiary one, level. One second, member. Members, I do hear there's a muffling song, um, but even if there wasn't, the point is 42B is there for a reason. Please just let's respect it. Thank you, not, Madam Speaker. One second, member. Corruption, members, it's about the silence while somebody is speaking. You can interrupt on a point of order. That's all I ask. Please, let's respect it. Access to affordable higher education, particularly at the tertiary level. In the Plan Belize Manifesto, Madam Speaker, free education from kinder to university was the call to action prior to the 2020 general elections. Limited access to social safety net programs. They may be available in other constituencies, but certainly they don't exist in Albert. And most importantly, Madam Speaker, the crippling costs of fuel prices at the pump. These concerns, Madam Speaker, along with matters relating to citizen security and the lack of transparency and accountability in public affairs are top of mind for our Albert residents. Let us be reminded, Madam Speaker, that it was this administration who promised to pledge to set the gold standard for transparency and accountability in our public affairs. You see, Madam Speaker, the benefits of a rapidly growing economy and greater economic prosperity that the PM keeps beating his chest about must be evidenced by the services and support programs made available to the most vulnerable in our communities. As it is proposed, this year estimates, Madam Speaker, 70% of every dollar collected in the public purse will be consumed in non-capital spending. That is recurrent expenditure. This reality limits the government's ability to invest in programs and initiatives that serve the welfare and well-being of our citizens and preserve the livelihoods of our Belizean people. 
improving the quality of life for all Belizeans must be the litmus test to which we hold this government-led, this Brisenio-led government administration to account. Madam Speaker, if the 2021-2022 fiscal year and the 2022-2023 fiscal year can be used as a reliable barometer, we on this side of the House have no choice, Madam Speaker, but to question the reliability of the budget estimates as presented. Let me give you an example to underscore this point. In 2021-2022, the budget presented in this House provided for $1.3 billion in government expenditure. Before the close of that fiscal period, the government had brought a total of five supplementary appropriation bills to the House, accounting for $227.1 million in new expenditure. Additionally, to meet the financing gap, six loan motions were tabled for a total sum of $165.6 million. This, Madam Speaker, at the early stages of Belize's economic recovery post the COVID pandemic, the IMF, in its Article 4 staff report for 2022, made the point that COVID-19 pandemic had a severe impact on Belize in 2020, leading to a 6.7% contraction in real GDP and an unsustainable increase in the public debt as a result. I listen, Madam Speaker, time and time again to the, Prime, to the Prime Minister and my colleagues on that side of the House who keep criticizing the Barrow administration, this UDP blaming for borrowing $1 million a day to provide food for Belizeans, wage subsidies for those who had lost their jobs as a result of the pandemic, and to keep public officers employed during a time when the world over had experienced the worst economic downturn since the Great Depression. We hear very little though that post the COVID pandemic, the Briseño administration borrowed $365 million in 161 days from February 2022 to July of 2022. When you do the math, this accounts for borrowing at a rate of $2.27 million a day when the country was no, under, no longer under lockdown and people were going back to work. In his budget presentation, Madam Speaker, the Prime Minister reported that in this fiscal year, revenues overperformed revenue collections by almost 7% or $89 million. Not to be unexpected with the windfall and taxes being collected on the cost of fuel at our local gas stations. 
Recurrent expenditure was overspent by $48 million and capital projects by $119 million, a total of $167 million more than was originally projected. In this fiscal period, from May 13th, 2022 to March 10th, 2023, 11 loan motions, a total of six, $360 million were tabled here in the National Assembly and four supplemental appropriation bills accounting for $244 million in expenditure that was not previously considered or properly budgeted for at the start of this financial year. I highlight these scenarios to signal to Belizeans that we on this side of the house are highly doubtful that the figures outlined in this year's estimates are a true reflection of how the government intends to manage the public purse while maintaining its commitment to the IMF for fiscal consolidation. Let us be fair and let us be honest, Madam Speaker, the fiscal consolidation that the government has been able to achieve was achieved largely on the backs of our hard-working public officers, our teachers, our armed forces, our police officers, and our other permanently, permanently established public servants who had to endure a 10% cut in salaries and an increment freeze that will now be restored on April 1st. What was glaringly, glaringly, glaringly missing in the presentation, Madam Speaker, was that there was no mention on what other fiscal consolidation measures will be put in place to ensure that we keep the public debt within the generally accepted ratios provided by the IMF. Madam Speaker, for the upcoming 2023-2024 fiscal year, the government has laid out a budget proposal that if, if realistic, will see $1.408 billion in revenues and $1.496 billion in expenditure accounting for a financing gap of $210.8 million, which, as the Prime Minister has indicated, will be sourced from the international financing institutions. Of this amount, Mr. Speaker, welcome, $1.12 billion has been allocated to meet recurrent expenses, expenses such as salaries and wages, subsidies, allowances, increments, material and supplies and the like, and the sum of $383.4 million is program for capital investments. You know, Mr. Speaker, there's an old adage that says, 
show me your budget and I will tell you what your priorities are. Mr. Speaker, while our Honorable Prime Minister painted the broad strokes in strictly positive terms, as the saying goes, the devil is in the details. In these allocations, the allocations for 2023, 2024, there is no bread subsidy program. There are no fuel subsidies for the transport and tourism sectors. There is no increases to the Restore Belize Social Assistance Program established to provide wraparound services for vulnerable families and to reduce violence and gang-related activities. There are no subsidies for the agriculture and agro productive agro-productive sectors. No new investments for youth support services and sports development. Negligible at best support for the orange economy. Yet there are significant increases in wages for the non-established staff. Mr. Speaker, I took a sample. I looked at 21 either ministries or departments, subunits of ministries, to look at the wage bill for non-established staff. Nine ministries and departments. These include immigration and nationality, hospital services, Ministry of Finance, its Strategic Management Unit, Treasury and Accounting Services, Internal Revenue, Customs and Excise, Office of the Supervisor of Insurance, and then in the Ministry of Health, I looked at a sample representing strategic management and admin, medicine and technology. I took a look as well, Mr. Speaker, at the Ministry of Education, operations, school supervision and support, student support services. In the agricultural ministry, research and development, National Agricultural Extension Services. In the Ministry of Sustainable Development, Strategic Management. I also took a look at the Forestry Resource Management, the Office of Emergency Management, Human Development, and the Ministry of Infrastructure and Youth Support Services. Madam Speaker, I'm speaking about the allocations for wages for non-established staff. I went further, Madam Speaker, I looked at, for each one of those 21 units, I looked at what was budgeted for 2021, 20, what was budgeted for 21, 22, what was budgeted for year 22, 23, 
I did a three-year average. I'll be happy to share it with you, PM, to determine what was the average wage bill for non-established staff over a three-year period. And then, Madam Speaker, I looked at what was, what is being budgeted for this year. I won't go through all 21, even though I think the Belizean people ought to hear. But let me give you an example. In immigration and nationality, in 2020, 2021, the budget for non-established staff was $7,913. In 2021, 22, it went up to $18,446. In 22, 23, it went to $56,500. $1,587. The average over the three-year period, Madam Speaker, stands at $27,649. But in this financial year, the budget for wages for non-established staff is now at $895,000. The excess is a sum of $867,000, Madam Speaker. I did this exercise. I looked this as a subset. You don't hurry me, Prime Minister. You will listen because this is what your government has done. Hospital services, Madam Speaker, 2021. 20, I can go through all 21, you know. Okay. $442,197. 21, 22, $422,101. 22, 23, $81,918. The three year average, Madam Speaker is $315,405. This year, in this financial year alone, what is budgeted? Budgeted is $5.9 million. Madam Speaker, for all 21 units, that I analyze. The three year average cumulatively was $1,552,740. In 2022-2023, Madam Speaker, I want you to, the Belizean people to hear very carefully, the cumulative average for this year, of these 21 units alone, for, non, for wages for non-established staff, no seats at $25,160,031, in excess of $23,607,000. $291. Madam Speaker, it is not that we do not have the resources to assist with social safety net programs. It is how the monies are being allocated. The same run through, Madam Speaker, and this was a less extensive exercise when we look when i looked at allowances 
allowances, Madam Speaker, for non-established staff. I looked at the Ministry of Public Service, Customs and Excise, Hospitality, Hospital Services, Immigration and Nationality, Ministry of Works, Community Police Services, and Crime Prevention. I use this, I, I follow the same methodology. I looked at what was budgeted for 2020, 2021, what was budgeted for 21, 22, what was budgeted for financial year 2022, 23. I then average those three years to determine what that figure should look like. Cumulatively, for those six departments that I took a look at, Madam Speaker, the average is, should be six million nine hundred and ninety-four thousand a hundred and fifty-two. Well, Madam Speaker, for 2023-2024, that figure now sits at 15,486,272. This, Madam Speaker, cannot achieve the kind of fiscal consolidation that our government has promised to maintain with the IMF. Show me your budget and I will tell you what your priorities are. Just take care of the procedural matter, thanks. Madam, Madam Speaker, in accordance with Standing Order 12, um, Subsection 8, I move that the proceedings on the order paper may be entered upon and proceeded with at this day's sitting at any hour no opposed. Honorable members, the question is that the proceedings on the order paper may be entered upon and proceeded with at this day's sitting at any hour though opposed. All those in favor, kindly say aye. aye. Those against, kindly say no. I think the ayes have it. Yes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. This budget also fails miserably in addressing the most pressing concern of local producers, micro, small, and medium enterprises, and consumers alike. What is the government's plan to mitigate the high cost of fuel at the pump that has contributed to the doubling of inflation on a society that cannot continue to bear this kind of price gouging on fuel by the government itself? The IMF cautioned that the measures that were being adopted by the government to stabilize fuel prices should at best be temporary. Madam Speaker, I recently checked the crude oil prices on the world market, which is down substantially, a little over 70 US dollars per barrel in spite of the war in U U Ukraine. This is the lowest it has been in years. It is most convenient to deflect on the premise that inflation is largely outside of the government's direct control. The last time Belize saw average inflation rate above 6% was in 
was in 2008. Between 2008 and 2022, inflation averaged about 1.1% a year. This sudden hike has undoubtedly impacted our Belizean families in a way we have not felt in 14 years. Madam Speaker, under the UDP-led Barrow administration, there were several safety net programs to assist households until conditions could improve. Citizens should expect no differently from a government who made the sacred pledge, everybody fill in. We must insist, we must demand that this administration act in a manner that will defend livelihoods and support those who are being pushed to the margins of poverty as a result. Madam Speaker, the Prime Minister in his budget presentation, again beating his chest, boasted that times of austerity were essentially behind us. Madam Speaker, I quote, once again, I table a new budget that contains a primary surplus and a budget that does not include any tax increases whatsoever. End of quote. How disingenuous when there is no relief on fuel at the pump. As we say in local parlance, Madam Speaker, fool the talk, but they're not fool the listen. Fuel import data produced by the Ministry of Finance, errors and all, suggests that every category of fuel, except for premium, did exceptionally well. The cost of fuel, you see, Madam Speaker, affects every aspect of day-to-day -day life. Transportation, industry, food production, utilities, energy, entrepreneurship, insurance premiums. If there was just a recent hike due to the inflation rate, access to basic goods and services. Madam Speaker, I quote from the IMF Article 4 staff report of 2022. This is the report the Honorable Prime Minister and his cabinet used as a trophy in declaring victory in an unfinished race. Madam Speaker, a cost of living crisis, the kind of crisis our Belizean families are enduring at this time threatens livelihoods everywhere and the most vulnerable, the hardest. The IMF explained, and I quote, policymakers should prioritize fighting inflation and protecting the most vulnerable to mitigate the impact of the cost of living crisis while addressing death and other vulnerabilities. Fiscal policy, this is not me, Madam Speaker, this is the IMF. Fiscal policy should prioritize the protection of vulnerable groups through target near-term support to alleviate the burden. End of quote. This government then, Madam Speaker, has both a duty and an obligation to provide solutions for Belizean households. Expanding 
the free education pilot program to other schools on the south side of Belize City is a step in the forward direction. And so is the commitment to allocate $7 million primary health care services to citizens living in Orange Walk. I hope for their sake the experience is different than we have in Belize City, where there is a clinic and where there is a doctor or a nurse but there is no med medication or medical supplies to support the most vulnerable. And the $1 million for land surveys and processing fees for new low-income homeowners are all welcome. But these initiatives are simply not enough to deal with the cost of living crisis that our Malaysian families have to endure. Let us, for example, Madam Speaker, so we can make this point crystal clear, look at our investments in human capital. Investments in human capital are largely linked to investments in health care and health support services. Our health care shambles, to describe it best, is in shambles. Health centers, NHI facilities, and hospitals countrywide are struggling to provide basic services and medication and other medical supplies to patients. That's the reality. You will visit anyone. That's why our doctors and nurses were out demonstrating, Madam Speaker, because they didn't have the basic supplies to take care of their patients. The budget for the medicine and technological program has been reduced. Even though there's an insufficient supply of medication, the budget has been cut, cut, Madam Speaker, by $9.4 million relative to the revised estimates brought forward from last year of 25 0.5 million, which is a 16.1 million dollars less than was required or is required. The budget for medical supplies was cut by 50 percent from last year, 22.6 million dollars to 11.25 million dollars. There is a need to ensure that our primary referral has hospital, the KHMH, has functioning diagnostic equipment as a start. Public health education and preventative care are also critical components, Madam Speaker, and should be given the appropriate budgetary support. Hospital services got a boost, yes ma'am, by almost $14 million from $51.7 million to $65.1 million. The bulk of this increase, however, is via personal emoluments. Emoluments jumped from $44.9 million to $55.27 million, and an increase of $10.3 million. Madam Speaker, with such a sizable increase, it, was, it is interesting to note 
that total staffing members, staffing numbers, 1,686 remain unchanged from last year. Even non-established staff workers' figures remain identical to last year, 601 individuals. World Bank, Madam Speaker, tracks countries' social protection initiatives to help struggling families and businesses. At a bare minimum, the World Bank recommends that 0.44% of GDP for countries in Latin America and the Caribbean at minimum be allocated for direct social assistance to the vulnerable groups. The global average, Madam Speaker, is 0 0.56. Using this minimum standard, Madam Speaker, Belize should be allocating a sum of 20 $3.2 million in direct social assistance support to citizens. The budget this year is $9.8 million. And this is how that is broken down. I even included the Community Development Fund, Madam Speaker. Restore Belize, $487,518. Food pantry, $4 million. Back to school support, 200000 And community development fund, which is normally not considered that type of direct support at the World Bank standards, $5 million. $9.8 million. more investments in and greater trade facilitation for local productive sector are also key. We have to grow the economy. While the economic cooperation agreement was finalized to facilitate pr primarily a new market for sugar and sugar products, this elusive trade agreement with Mexico seems to be going nowhere. I remember when my colleagues sat on this side of the house, how they made a big issue, Madam Speaker, of formalizing a trade agreement with Mexico. We need formal arrangements for the exports of our cattle, poultry products, and shrimp. In the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, foreign trade and immigration, just to illustrate this point. Institutional strengthening for foreign affairs more than doubled from 600,000, Madam Speaker, to $1.5 million. Why? Institutional strengthening for trade was only received a budget allocation of $100,000. $100,000. I don't know, Madam Speaker, but I. As the adage says, show me your budget and I will tell you what your priorities are. The cost of inputs for local producers has skyrocketed, Madam Speaker. We are an import-led economy and more must be done to close the trade imbalance. We need to be producing more. We need to export more. And if I can make a plug for 
local producers, Madam Speaker, more of us need to make the commitment to buy Belizean. There's a lot to unpack in this budget. We could be here all day, but I have to, before I close my, inter close my contribution, Madam Speaker, to comment on the fact that there are no new monies allocated for establishing the gold standard for transparency and accountability. Oh, there is no new monies for the Integrity Commission. There is no new allocations for the Ombudsman Office. There is no new money for the Contractor General. There is no institutional support or new resources allocated to the Auditor General. And there's certainly no new monies set aside for election and boundaries. There are no new monies set aside for this National Assembly to ensure that our House committees, Madam Speaker, can function with greater efficiency. And there's certainly no money allocated for the functioning of the newly established Joint Public Accounts Committee. Yet, Madam Speaker, we beat our chest and say that we are, we, the government, will establish the new gold standard for transparency and accountability. In concluding, Madam Speaker, I wish to place on record on behalf of the good people of Albert, our gratitude for allocations from the public purse provided to the people of Albert, the taxpayers of Albert, uh, through the Constituency Development Fund, the Annual Education Assistance Program, the grocery bag program made available to us randomly and for the home improvement housing grants provided to those families who suffered losses in the aftermath of Hurricane Lisa. The PM reported in his budget presentation, Madam Speaker, that Nemo estimated damages to be $212.4 million, with 172,000 persons being affected. We look forward, Prime Minister, to continued collaboration with the various line ministries as we seek to address the needs of those individuals who are still awaiting relief for either home repairs or replacement of homes that were completely destroyed in the storm. While we may be small in number, Madam Speaker, this opposition, those of us on this side of the house, will continue to do all we can to educate the people we serve, and more importantly, to hold this government administration to account. The IMF will not be the only ones who will be keeping a close eye on them. In the weeks and months ahead, we will continue to unpack this budget and provide our analysis on the details 
the devil are in the devil is in the details while we are pay, while we pay attention to the movement of dollar and cents we will be also be sure to be vigilant madam speaker on the impact to the quality of life of our Belizeans, how those, how that is improving. The member for Lake I said that the sun is shining, Madam Speaker. <laughs> it may be shining in his corner of the city, but I can assure him that the sun is not shining on many of our vulnerable populations. Those that most need our support at a time when we are grappling with the crippling cost of living. And finally, Madam Speaker, if you allow me one further intervention. We're coming to the end of Women's Month. And I would like to take this opportunity to salute all women and girls in our Belizean society. May we always know our worth. Madam Speaker, in figuratively and um, literal language, women give birth to our nation. We nurture our families, we nurture our communities. May we work together and continue to support each other, to fix each other's crumbs, if I will to advocate, Madam Speaker, for greater gender equity and gender equality in all facets of our Belizean society. And may we never forget that we have a place at the decision-making table. Progressive societies, Madam Speaker, ensure that women's voices are heard in all our national deliberations. I thank you. Uh, one Member for Albert, can I um, thank you. I recognize the member for Pickstock. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Finally. Um, good afternoon. Madam Speaker, good afternoon, colleagues. Good afternoon, friends in the public gallery. Good afternoon, good people of Big Stock. Good afternoon to all Belizeans listening here in Belize and all across the world. Madam Speaker, uh, this morning, the session, today's session, should have been led off by the Honorable Julius Espat my good friend. He couldn't be here today because his mother passed away recently. And so on behalf of my ministry, the change agent team, the members that we have in the Pickstock division, the people of Pickstock, my family and I would like to extend, extend my sincere condolences to Honorable Julius Espat and his family. Madam Speaker, I rise on behalf of the good people of Pickstock to make my contribution to this budget debate for the fiscal year 2023-2024. Madam Speaker, kindly allow me to refer to my notes as I present to the Belizean people the work that we're doing in the Ministry of Tourism, Diaspora Relations, the BTB, and the Border Management Agency. Madam Speaker, before I get into the meat of my presentation today, I would like to debunk some of what the member for Mesop 
said yesterday, and my colleague from Albert, who said in her presentation that she presented today, Madam Speaker, if you listen to the member from Albert, you would think that our administration isn't doing anything for the south side of Belize, that we have for totally forgotten the south side of Belize. I remember, Madam Speaker, for 13 long years, the most powerful ministers in cabinet and on that side of the aisle represented the people of the south side. And no, no time during that 13 years did they have free ed education on the south side. And I want to mention it. Never in that 13 years did they have the Community Development Fund and worse for the PUP. In fact, Madam Speaker, the member for Mesop said yesterday that my good friend Honorable Colonel Hyde was doing a wonderful job in the Ministry of Land. And the member from Albert knows well that there is little land in Belize City, especially in Belize City. Albert no land for two. Pigstock no land. Madam Speaker, no time in that 13 years was there a serious raise in the minimum wage. That is why the wage bill has gone up. Madam Speaker, to address to five dollars. Madam Speaker, this budget and this government have 25 programs to fight against poverty. We have programs in health, programs in education, programs for rural development, programs for human development, and the list goes on. Madam Speaker, there is a book that I often refer to called Why Nations Fail. And nations fail far too often because of broken institutions. This, the past UDP administration, left all our institutions broken and in tatters. Madam Speaker, the member from Albert said that we were gloating about our victories. Madam Speaker, to win the war against poverty, we have to win small battles first. We are not a big economy with an abundance of resources to invest. So we have to win small battles first to win the battle against poverty. And with the leadership of the Prime Minister, we have said that we would reduce poverty by 50%. And we are committed to that. Madam Speaker, like I said, I would also like to debunk some of what the member from Mesop said yesterday. Madam Speaker, unlike the previous administration, who would just cut and paste budgets year in and year out, we on this side of the aisle take the budget process very seriously. The budget process is led by the Prime Minister and the Minister of State in the Ministry of Finance, Honorable Chris Coy. Madam Speaker, all the budgets that we have presented to the Belizean people have been thoroughly ventilated and the numbers in each line item are derived using historical data and trends, trend analysis. Madam Speaker, this is not cut and paste budget. Thank you. Madam Speaker, a well-planned budget is the most important tool for any government to ensure economic stability, growth, resiliency to shocks, and for developing a nation. Large or small, developed or developing, governments need to project whether they will have enough money to spend on programs needed to improve the quality of life for the masses, or if they will need to borrow to bridge shortfalls. Madam Speaker, no government anywhere will ever have a budget that is enough. This is especially true 
in the developing world. And that is why we have to prioritize our spending. That is why we have to be prudent. That is why we have to be innovative. That is why we have to be responsible. And that is why we have to be accountable to the Belizean people. Madam Speaker, I bought a book the other day entitled Noise, A Flaw in Human Judgment. This title truly describes the member from Essop's presentation yesterday, Low Noise and Gross Lifford. Madam Speaker, the first thing I want to highlight is that this budget has a primary surplus of 0.39% compared to the last UDP budget that had a primary deficit of 10.81%, double digits. That's almost a failed state, Madam Speaker. The member for Mesop also stated that in 2019, our economy was booming. Madam Speaker, this is utter nonsense. Just take a look at the Statistical Institute of Belize website and you will find the fact. So I did some fact checking last night. Fourth quarter for 2019, the economy declined by 2.8%. Third quarter, it declined by 0.9%. Second quarter, it declined by 0.8%. So what is that, Madam Speaker? You're right, Prime Minister. And two consecutive quarters of negative growth traditionally would be referred to as a recession. That a tree for the member farm is up three more than two. Since we are here to educate and inform, like I said, three quarters are more than two. Madam Speaker, the member from Mesop said that in 2019, under the UDP, the unemployment rate was the lowest in history. That too was a lie. According to the SIB, preliminary results from the September 2019 labor force survey show that the national unemployment rate grew from 7.7 percent in April 2019 to 4 to 10.4 percent in September 2019. The last thing I want to counter by saying is that we are trying very hard to bring down the cost of living. We have subsidized fuel. We have reduces ta reduced taxes on certain items. We are going after those unscrupulous businesses that are price gouging. Madam Speaker, the reality is that we import far too much and we export far too little. That means we're importing most of the inflation that we're seeing today. The last time I checked, Belize imported $2.7 billion in goods and services and exported $500 million. This is a huge trade deficit. We can produce, and Madam Speaker, the problem is that we can produce almost everything we need to eat and it will always be healthier. So Madam Speaker, I really don't know where the member from Mesop got his numbers and what he was referring to. Out of the sky budget, no? Madam Speaker, I am truly honored to stand here in support of this budget. Every single program that is being funded by this 2023-2024 budget is earmarked for the betterment and security of Belizeans. This budget speaks to some very important areas, including more free education for our children, more low-income housing for our families, the expansion of national health care insurance for our people, upgrades of our main roads and municipal streets for our commuters, and more security forces to keep us all safer and more secure. In planning for the future and to truly appreciate all that the Jan Bresenio administration has been able to accomplish, we must look at where we are and where we have come from. We often talk 
about what our economy, what our country and the world experienced when COVID hit three years ago. But Madam Speaker, the fact of the matter is that Belizeans were suffering far long before COVID hit. The DPM broke it down yesterday and also other members on this side of the house. Let us not forget, Madam Speaker, that the Belizean people were punishing under the UDP before COVID. When COVID hit us, it only got worse and we had to walk through the economic and health inferno that, is, that was COVID. The economy was in the doldrums and had contracted by almost 15 percent. Our people were out of work with their bills mounting each month. Madam Speaker, the past UDP administration left our institution, in, institutions broke and in shambles, and our nation was broken. This, Madam Speaker, is what makes the turnaround that we're seeing in Belize today truly remarkable. The economy is doing well with unprecedented growth. There has never been another time in the history of Belize with so many of our people working. We went from 30% unemployment to now 5% unemployment. For the first time in a very long time, we are seeing a, a decline in the poverty rate. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, this unprecedented turnaround can be attributed to the laser beam focus of, Prime Minister, of the Prime Minister and the members of this side of the House. We have worked hard and smart and in true partnership with the private sector. Madam Speaker, don't get me wrong, there is still much more work to be done. Far too many of our Belizeans are still living in poverty. Far too many of our people, our young people, are not in school. There are far too many of our people without a piece of land or a home. Crime continues to hurt some of our communities. Madam Speaker, there is still far much destruction of our environment. Madam Speaker, what this country and its young generation experienced during COVID is unparalleled. Madam Speaker, except for those who live through the Second World War. No other generation has had to deal with a pandemic like COVID-19, a war like that in Ukraine, inflation rates that are still crippling nations, and the destructive natural disasters caused by Earth's climate change reality. But with all these burdens, we still have hope for a better Belize and hope for a better world. Madam Speaker, I stand here today extremely proud of the work that we have been doing and will continue to do in the Ministry of Tourism and Diaspora Relations and all the statutory boards that fall under my ministry. Combined, tourism and the diaspora inject close to $1.5 billion into the economy of Belize. And we will do more as the industry continues to rebound and as confidence continues to grow in the diaspora. Madam Speaker, as you know, tourism is a turbo engine that is propelling our economy forward. And like we Belizean mechanics would say, the engine, the purr, and with the click on all cylinders right now. Together with our industry partners, we have stimulated one of the greatest recoveries in modern times. A recovery that continues to perform international trends. Globally, tourism continues to rise with over 900 people traveling internationally in 2022. 900 million, sorry. 900 million people traveling internationally in 2022. This represented around a 63% recovery from pre-pandemic figures. 
Belize's rebound is outpacing the rest of the Americas and the globe. In overnight tourism, we saw over 270,000 visitors passing through all our borders, a 75% recovery from pre-COVID figures. And remember last year, the borders were still not fully open and we're not moving as freely. So, and the first quarter of last year, we were struck by Omicron. Madam Speaker, overnight tourism is a mainstay of our industry, but cruise tourism also showed a strong rebound as we welcomed 612,000 cruise visitors to our shores last year. Madam Speaker, so far, the numbers are strong for both overnight and cruise, which are clear indicators that this year will be a successful one. Madam Speaker, the outlook for global tourism for 2023 is that arrivals are projected to increase by 30% worldwide, and Belize is ready to take advantage of this kind of growth. Not only have our visitors returned, but our local industry has shown a strong resurgence. At the end of 2022, the BTB had licensed over 2,100 tour guides, rep representing a 104% of where we were 2019. Currently, we have over 885 licensed hotels and over 350 licensed tour operators. And Madam Speaker, our statistics clearly show that visitors are spending more time with us. In 2019, guests stayed on average six days. In 2022, the numbers have grown to almost nine days on average. And as a result, visitors are contributing more to the Belizean economy. What does this mean, Madam Speaker? There's a thing in the industry called direct, indirect, and induced, as you know. So direct, when the people can spend, in direct, that when people, they build resorts, when they build restaurants, when they invest in the industry, and induce is when you have to go to work, and you have to um, hire a babysitter or a cleaner. So the industry is far reaching. Madam Speaker, even you, having worked in the tourism industry, for so many years can attest that for growth and development to occur at this rate, it takes hard and smart work. The quick turnaround in tourism is as a result of the strategic and expert work of thousands of Belizeans and stakeholders in our industry. There is no magic pill, Madam Speaker. I will say it again. It takes hard and smart work to accomplish what we have done over the past two years. Our administration has built an excellent partnership with our tourism stakeholders, which is based on trust, mutual respect, and results. In 2022, Madam Speaker, we saw additional flagship airlines, such as WestJet, Air Canada, Southwest Airlines, and Sun Country return to Belize. Currently, the PGI load factors are over 90%, signifying that flights into Belize are coming almost full. We continue to work to build our airlift capacity and establish routes, new routes connecting Belize to the rest of the world. Madam Speaker, I can state that at this very moment, there is a team from Belize in Chicago representing us at Routes Americas, a conference that brings together senior decision makers in the airline industry. I'm also pleased to report that we'll, we will be hosting the first airline development conference for Belize under the theme Connecting Belize to the World. Madam Speaker, this meeting of the minds will occur on April 28th in Belize City. Madam Speaker, our very own Belize Air, Belizean airline, Tropic Air, has expanded its regional service to San Pedro Sula, Honduras, and El Salvador. So I take this opportunity to congratulate the new CEO, Max Grief, 
who brings new energy and new leadership. I also want to commend the work of the men and women over at Maya Island Air. Together, these two domestic carriers move the vast majority of visitors to their destinations across the country and are strategic partners for the growth and development of our industry. Madam Speaker, as we continue to record high arrival numbers, we must remember that when our guests land at our international airport, this is their first impression of our country. Madam Speaker, I know that there are plans on the way to fix the airport, but we need to fast track the modernization and expansion of the PGIA for the safe, safety and security and comfort of all visitors. This is critical as visitor arrival numbers grow. Also, it is high time that the PGIA has an FBO that services private aircrafts, which is a new focal point as we move to diversify our tourism product offerings. Madam Speaker, with regard to cruise visitors, we expect that the growth in arrivals and cruise ship calls will continue in 2023. Our projections are that we will welcome over 900,000 passengers this year. Madam Speaker, cruise tourism creates tremendous job and business opportunities for people, primarily in the Belize and Stan Creek districts. At this moment, my ministry is finalizing an update to the national cruise tourism policy. Our updates will ensure a vision for the future of Belize's natural assets, that the future of our Belize's natural assets are world class, and our cruise industry must continue to develop in a responsible and sustainable way that will meet the needs of our stakeholders and enhance the quality of life for our people. At our land borders, Madam Speaker, the Border Management Agency continues to rebuild. You will remember that I informed this Honorable House about the deplorable conditions of our border facilities when we took office. The reality is that before COVID, 20% of our visitors, primar primarily from Europe, entered Belize through our land borders. This means, like the PGIA, the border facilities and the officials who work at these points of entry provide our visitors with their first experience of Belize. Since we took office, Madam Speaker, we have brought back financial stability and viability to the BMA. We have rebranded and restructured the organization. We have trained our staff and continue to do so. We have modernized the financial and accounting systems at our borders. We have begun the work to refurbish all our border facilities and grounds. And we have modernized the security surveillance system. Madam Speaker, we still have a lot of work to do. This fiscal year, we will continue to improve the guest experience and advance efforts to recover pre-COVID tourism arrivals via our land borders. Madam Speaker, we always say that tourism is a national priority and it should be treated accordingly at all levels. We keep highlighting that tourism represents over 40% of GDP and that the socioeconomic benefits are being felt at all levels. When, even with all these positive developments, we still have some key challenges that must be addressed. Madam Speaker, I really don't like looking in the rear, mu rear view mirror because I always say forward ever and never backwards. But I must say that the UDP squandered a great opportunity to truly invest and improve in the infrastructure that supports tourism. They squandered close to $90 million in so-called tourism upliftment projects, which left the tourism industry with a weak foundation and many gaps. Most of our tourism destinations are growing and facing numerous challenges in meeting the expanding water 
and electricity demand. Placentia and Kikaka are currently addressing serious water shortages. However, BWS is doing everything it can do to find solutions. Then you then, and then we bought it for the 13 years. But we had to intervene a couple of weeks ago to help find a, a short-term solution for the water shortage in Placentia. These are challenges trusted on us because of the short-sightedness of the previous administration. Madam Speaker, there was absolutely no attempt by the UDP administration to provide our major island destinations with the proper health care facilities required to service our communities as well as the thousands of visitors that they receive annual, annually. Much respect to my colleague, Honorable Andrew Pires, who lobbied for better health care in San Pedro and Kikaka. Madam Speaker, as you know, when people go on vacation, they need to feel reassured that if anything happens, their health needs can be taken care of properly. In Placentia, the municipal pair is a staple in the community and we have com completed much needed renovations. Also in Placentia, the polyclinic Also in Placentia, the polyclinic in its fine, is in its final stages. And I wish to acknowledge Minister Bernard for his support on that tremendously important project. We have also partnered with and, and Minister Radwell. Well, he can't have me so much time, I can't forget Radwell. <laughs> We have also partnered with my colleague, the Honorable Julius Espat, and his team at the Ministry of Infrastructure Development and Housing to upgrade roads across the country. These include the ATM Road, the Altonha Road, the Jagwapa Road, and the Malakate Road in Independence Village. These collaborative community projects, Madam Speaker, are clear indications that our industry is moving forward and with conviction. Madam Speaker, despite starting with limited resources in 2020, under the leadership of the Prime Minister, Honorable John Bersenio, we are working at a blistering pace to close the critical gaps which will make us more competitive globally. <laughs> I have to try to keep up with you. <laughs> Yeah. Let me briefly divert to another difficult issue facing tourism and Belize right now. Madam Speaker, the experts are projecting that the entire Caribbean will be affected by a high level of sargassum this year. What this is not new to us. Our coastal destinations have been facing this problem for years. Just like COVID-19, sargassum is a serious threat to tourism. Madam Speaker, sargassum is a national emergency and requir requires the requisite investment to mitigate the negative impacts on all our coastal communities. Madam Speaker, even the Prime Minister himself traveled to Germany to find a long-term solution to this very serious problem. And we in the Ministry of Tourism and Diaspora Relations will continue to do our part as well I also know that the Minister of Blue Economy is working hard to create some solutions to mitigate the negative impacts of sargassum. It is a fact that the influx of sargassum is related to a wider threat of climate change. And because we humans pollute our environment on a daily basis. Madam Speaker, this morning I was driving and saying, it was a beautiful day. Like the Honorable Deputy said yesterday, it's shining there. But when I looked on both sides of the highway, all I saw was garbage a lot, a lot of, in a lot of parts on the road. Madam Speaker, hurricanes are getting stronger. Summers are getting drier and hotter. Winters are getting harsher. 
and floods are becoming more frequent. Madam Speaker, tourism security is another priority. We continue to strengthen the tourism police unit and in 2022, we assisted the TPU in expanding its personnel by 20 new officers. We also expanded the TPU's headquarters and have provided much needed vehicles and equipment to support operations. Just last month, we opened a new substation in North Hamburgis and we are in the process of building a police substation in St. Bite Village. We are also helping to refurbish the substation in San Antonio, that is in the Cayo district. These are a few of the initiatives that we have worked on with my colleague, Minister Musa, to strengthen and improve the safety and security in, tourism, in the tourism industry and for the Belizean people. Madam Speaker, I have also promised and committed to Minister Musa and the Compol that in this budget we will help to invest in additional cameras that are to be installed in key tourism zones. Madam Speaker, in product development we are investing in some of the infrastructure needed to support the growth and development in tourism. Even though we don't have the same level of resources like the previous administration, we will make meaningful improvements this year. These projects include upgrades for the Torreira District, improvements in Belize City, improvements in the main border tongues, improvements in Orange Wap Tongue, enhancements in San Pedro and Kikaka, work in the Cayo District, work in Dangriga, Hopkins, St. Bite, and Placencia, work in Sartaneja. And I'm pleased to say that I'm working with the Malantiman, Mr. Jamal Galvez, to develop a rehabilitation facility in Gales Point, Manante, for manatees, um, sea turtles, and other marine animals, a rescue center. This year, we will launch the Enchanted Villages project that will include the upliftment of our people and infrastructure in Gales Pine, Sartaneja, St. Bite, and a Maya village to be determined with the era rips from the Toledo district. Madam Speaker, like our anthem says, God has blessed us with wealth on tool, but we have to protect it, develop it, and nurture it. The product that is Belize is second to none. Madam Speaker, I emphasize that tourism in Belize is rooted in sustainable development. In that regard, the Ministry of Tourism and Diaspora Relations has wholeheartedly embraced our partners in the conservation world. But if we are to brand Belize as an eco-adventure destination, we must keep our country clean. For far too long, we have joked about our people going over to Chetamal and conducting themselves with decency. So why do we treat our country like a garbage dump? We throw garbage on the streets, in the sea, and we throw garbage every and anywhere. Madam Speaker, this is unacceptable. We are currently undertaking a beautification and greening project in Belize City, which involves adding plants and trees Madam Speaker, almost worse than the littering is a vandalism on this project. Madam Speaker, the government can only do so much, and it disheartens me to know that some Belizeans can show such tremendous disregard for a country and their civic duty. In this matter, I appeal to all Belizeans to do their part. Don't throw garbage on our streets and don't vandalize our public spaces. Be proud. Let us respect and love our country. These are the values and principles behind the Civic Pride campaign that, we're, that we have launched. With that said, I wish to acknowledge Mr. Rene Villanueva Sr. and Ms. Destiny Wagner for being a part of this very important Civic Pride initiative. Madam Speaker, 
we must continue to invest in our cultural sector. That is why we are bridging the gap that exists between the orange economy and the tourism industry. For those of you who don't know, the orange economy encompasses all the businesses and individuals whose activities are rooted in creativity. We have engaged a global firm called Song Diplomacy to devise an overall strategy to link tourism and the origin economy. Work has begun and should be completed later this year. Madam Speaker, just recently, we inaugurated a world-class music studio in Belize City, the Reef Recording Studio. If the member for my support can cut one track, he's always welcome. No, <laughs> no bad vibes. <laughs> We're completing another one in Orange Walk. And in this budget, we will build two more, another one in Dangriga and another one in San Ignacio. I'm sure his partner, E.J. Khalid, would be impressed by that. Song Clash. Song. <laughs> in 2022, Madam Speaker, the first ever music fest, food and, the music and food festival gave our local artists a platform to hone and develop their skills at a high level while at the same time injecting $5.4 million into the economy of San Pedro during the traditionally slow part of the season. We will build on our momentum from the first annual Belize International Music and Food Festival by hosting a bigger and more spectacular event, which will be held in Belize City at the end of July. As a result of the success of last year's festival, we have established an Orange Economy Fund that will support the transformation of the creative industry into a viable export-ready sector for tourism and the Belizean economy. Apart from music, Madam Speaker, we firmly believe that our culinary offer remains widely on top. To address this, only a week ago, we launched a cultural series hosted by Chef Sean Quillen that showcases the food, culture, and people of Belize. Madam Speaker, global statistics show that 40% of a tourist expenditure goes on food and beverage. Madam Speaker, for Belize, that would amount to about $480 million per year. This cannot be ignored. Madam Speaker, of course, our focus of Plan Belize is all about people. That is our hallmark. This could not be better illustrated by our commitment to capacity building and training of Belizeans. We have committed to making training more accessible and more affordable. Madam Speaker, we have reduced the cost of the tour guide training from an average of about $1,400 per person to now $400 per person. Through the implementation of our Elevate training program, over 2,500 Belizeans have been trained over the past two years, mostly free of cost. These training programs have helped to develop skills and capacity in areas such as customer service, food and beverage, business development, tour operations, and safety and security. Madam Speaker, I have a passion for training, and I'm pleased to announce that with the support of Minister Fonseca and his team at the Ministry of Education, we will soon launch our first ever hospitality training academy with a prestigious university as our partner, U.S. University, that is. Madam Speaker, this, this initiative will truly change the game as it relates to the skills and abilities of our tourism workers. Madam Speaker, visitor trends in 2023 
show that travelers are seeking experiences that are personalized, unique, and of high quality. The BTB continues to invest strategically by expanding our marketing efforts within our primary markets, but also by exploring emerging markets in Mexico and South America. For instance, in 2022, Belize was in the spotlight in New York and London. Grab Life campaign videos lit up the world famous Times Square in New York City. And in London, 10 electric cabs featured the iconic blue hole. The cabs also included a QR code to take persons directly to a modernized travelbelize.org website that helps tourists plan their vacation to Belize. As we continue to build awareness, we are quickly becoming the go-to destination for celebrities, digital influencers, and brands. Belize was on the cover of the May 2022 edition of Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Edition. This was definitely a major visibility boost for Belize, giving the print publication 63 million readers. Belize also welcomed lifestyle influencer Passport Heavy. This very in-depth coverage of Belize has received close to 2 million views on their YouTube channel. In 2022, several nat national co-branded promotions were executed for the U.S. market, resulting in more than 34 million impressions and a publicity value of nearly 4 million U.S. dollars. Madam Speaker, no longer Mother Nature's best kept secret, Belize is just now truly making its mark on the world stage. At home, at home, we have doubled down on our belief that Belizeans must also travel and experience their country in order to truly love and appreciate it. Mr. Speaker, the Belizean Traveler Campaign was relaunched in 2022 with a brand new logo, website, and videos to encourage Belizeans to explore the jewel. Through building awareness about all that our country has to offer, the campaign fosters appreciation and stewardship of our resources and creates local ambassadors and travelers. And Madam Speaker, this summer, we will launch a program that exposes young Belizeans to the wonders of Belize. We will also begin a raffle, which will provide a free vacation for Belizean families during the summer months. Madam Speaker, in 2022, Condé Traveler voted Belize as one of the friendliest destinations in the world. Several of our hotels also received TripAdvisor's Traveler's Choice 2022 Best of the Best Awards. Belize continues to be regularly featured in numerous major international publications, including Elle, National Geographic, Forbes, CNN Travel, and the New York Times, just to name a few. We have many new programs coming this fiscal year, including a program with Peter Greenberg, called Hidden Belize, to be aired on CBS. Supporting the industry, Madam Mr. Speaker, even with all the, these positive things that we have, we are conscious that external shocks can hamper our progress. Mr. Speaker, the government of Belize will continue to support this industry in every way we can. Last year's fuel subsidy supported over 180 tour operators and tender operators. We also rolled out the small grants program to assist businesses with their recovery, and we invested almost $3 million for that program. Turning to the Belizean diaspora, Mr. Speaker, I want to acknowledge the thousands of Belizeans living abroad and who offer substantial assistance to the local economy through remittances and other contributions. Through the work of the Diaspora Relations Unit in my ministry, several town hall meetings were held with Belizeans living in the United States. Additionally, 
Other events such as Belize Fund Days, Give Back Days, and Belize in Independence Fest were supported in order to engage our diaspora. In 2022, we also spearheaded a Donate to Educate campaign where over 200 laptops were donated to the Ministry of Education by diaspora mem members and Bill Belize. Madam Speaker, just over the last two years alone, we have received close to $3 million worth of contributions from the diaspora, including support during the aftermath, ma aftermath of Hurricane Lisa. I acknowledge all our diaspora members, donors, Belizean associations, especially the board members for Bill Belize, for their kind and invaluable contribution and for their continued commitment to help in the work of building a better Belize. Madam Speaker, I would not be here without the good people of Pickstock and my team of change agents. From day one, we promise to transform the Pickstock division and we're doing it day by day. Madam Speaker, under extremely difficult circumstances, we have been able to accomplish a lot. Over the last fiscal year, we managed to pave five streets in the constituency. We also helped over 120 families with home improvements, and we are currently building 45 homes for very needy individuals. Madam Speaker, with the help of the Belize Association of Planners, and the Mayflower Community Development Foundation, we built a half basketball court and a small park in the Mayflower area. With the support from the Belize City Council and the Leadership Intervention Unit, we conducted several cleanup campaigns to ensure that our neighborhoods remain clean. Madam Speaker, even the UDPs are coming to me to commend us for the work that we are doing on Berger Field. I'm not sure that. Huh? You, see, you don't know why I said, I don't know. Right? You have to say, it, it, it ain't Albert. And not because it ain't Albert, I never made a do it. Huh? Thank you, thank you, Deputy. 42B. Let's not get carried away. But I'm a speaker and I worry about Father do be sometimes. I, wor I worry about it, no member. I worry about it. Please continue. <laughs> Many said it would be another broken promise from politicians. Madam Speaker, when you pass Berger Field these days, you will see that a first class synthetic field has already been installed and the construction of the bleachers and other infrastructure is on the way. <laughs> Madam Speaker, this is not lip service. We are about delivering on Plan Belize. We are also getting ready, and I'm very proud of this, we're also getting ready to open the Hope Center which will include a training and counseling center, a factory to prepare soap, conditioner, shampoo, and other products. This program will hire mostly women, and we will ensure that there's a social component to it. Madam Speaker, we will ensure that all the women who are working at the factory go back to high school if they want to. The program will also ensure that their children are in school. Madam Speaker, we're about building up our people. Another component of this very important initiative is the establishment of the woodwork and craft factory. Most of the equipment have been already been bought and are being installed, and we're excited to get this going pretty soon as well. Madam Speaker, most of the souvenirs are imported. We want to begin to make more here in our country. Additionally, this year, 
we will be completing the Mahogany Street Hub project with the support of the area rep from Lekai and the Belize City Council. This project will provide clean and comfortable facilities for Belizean cooks and street side vendors on Mahogany Street. And I, and I want to big up my personal chef, Chef Ainsley, who just launched and opened, reopened his business on Mahogany Street to great fanfare. Uh, we need to support our local businesses like that, Madam Speaker. Uh, this was an individual who started from washing dishes and now is cooking and paying other people to help him to provide a high quality of food for people. Madam Speaker, it would be remiss of me not to highlight the importance of women in our nation building. I wish all our hard-working women the best during Women's Month. However, I would like to just take a little time, bear with me, to acknowledge some of the women from Pickstock who have helped me over the years to be here in this honorable house. And I'll just call them by their first name to be quick. Jalen, Juanita, Julian, Kyla, Kyra, Maxine, Patricia, Randine, Sherna, Sheena May, Cherie, Angela, Karel, Desiree, Jessica, Joala, Crystal, Roshan, Sharon, Shay, Tracy, Ursula, Vanessa, Amalia, Diana, Gertel, Glendine, Jessica, Carissa, Kenesha, Kishana, Lerna, Marlena, Mavis, Monique, Stephanie, Tanisha, Veronica, Flores and Ver Veronica Flowers, Patrice, Marcia, Natasha, and finally, but not least, Sandra. <laughs> Madam Speaker, politicians would never be successful without the support of women behind them in their campaigns. In fact, year round, we acknowledge the importance and critical role that women play in our homes and in our businesses, in our communities, and in our government. And to all my brothers out there, please remember to treat women, local and foreign, with the dignity they deserve. In conclusion, Madam Speaker, 2022 was a very strong year for tourism and the diaspora relations. I am certain that after careful review of this proposed budget, this PUP administration will continue delivering on our plan, Belize commitments. Through the support of government, mutual partnership with the private sector and civil society, and with a relentless drive to make Belize a world-class and leading destination, 2023 will be the year that we transcend and usher in a new era of tourism development. Together, we can look forward to greater successes in 2023. Through these initiatives, we have and will continue to play a crucial role in reducing the national unemployment rate. Our government has also committed to reducing poverty by 50%, and I assure you, my Belizean brothers and sisters, that tourism and diaspora relations will, contribute, will continue to contribute tremendously to this goal. Madam Speaker, I take this opportunity to express my unwavering support for this budget. I thank you for your time, and God bless Belize. I recognize the member for Toledo West. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I rise this afternoon on behalf of the people of Toledo West to give my contribution to the estimates of revenue and expenditure 2023-24 that was presented by the Prime Minister almost two weeks ago. Madam Speaker, if you kindly allow me, before I go to my presentation, I would like to take the opportunity 
to thank the beautiful people of Toledo West for the privilege and honor to represent them in this honorable host. For it would not be possible without their continuous support and their belief in me being able to represent their aspirations, their goals, and objectives in life. Madam Speaker, I also want to take the opportunity to extend my heartfelt condolences to our colleague, the Honorable Julius Aspat, on the passing of his mother. We pray that God will strengthen him and his family and that they may find comfort as they go through this very difficult period in their lives. But I'm speaker having said that, if you allow me before I get into the presentation with regards to the Ministry of Rural Transformation, Community Development, Labor and Local Government, I'd like to respond to some of the comments that the leader of the opposition and those members on the other side made. Madam Speaker, but before that, it is important that we point out to the Belizean people that as elected representatives, we are paid to be in this house, to represent the constituencies and to do the job that the people have elected us to do. And I want to point out to the Belizean people that the side of the opposition is totally empty. They have left. And in fact, we only see two members here. We saw two members since this morning. And one member has been totally absent. And the Belizean people must be made aware of that, that that member for Queen Square has not showed up to represent them, yet she's collecting a salary. But I'm speaker, when we listen to the leader of the opposition yesterday, he wanted us, he wanted the Belizean people to imagine a picture of doom and gloom since this new PUP government took office. He went on to rumble all over the place. And as my good friend, the member for Free Tongue said, he did not have any sense of direction, but rather to a great extent, was making up figures and statistics. And he must be called out for, them, for that, Madam Speaker. And I want to remind him, and I want to remind the Belizean people that it, that it was none other than his father who infamously said that he was sorry for the next government that would take over office. In fact, he said, and I quote, I weep for the Belizean people because he knew the mess, the disaster that the UDP created for 13 long dreaded years across this country, Madam Speaker. It was 13 years of the worst corruption, incompetence, and arrogance that, the U that this country saw imposed by the UDP. But I'm speaker, the members on the other side should be the last ones to speak about corruption and that this country is not moving forward, should be speaking about massive borrowing when they have the record, Madam Speaker, of spending billions of dollars on projects that were failed, that did not benefit this country, that did not provide the opportunity to grow this economy. And that is why when we took over office in 2020, it was such a difficult task and a huge mess that we found. But Madam Speaker, we did not back off. We did not chicken out. Rather, we rolled our sleeves together with our Prime Minister, together with our cabinet colleagues and all elected members on this side of the house 
And we said we were elected to do a job. We must create the policies, the incentives, the legislation to ensure that we can bring back this economy to stability, where the economy would grow, where we would provide job opportunities and opportunities for Belizeans across this country to improve their lives. And that is what we have been doing for the last two years, Madam Speaker. A PUP government at work. A PUP government at work. Madam Speaker, I listened to the member of the opposition want to smear and talk about corruption. Well, we just need to remind them of their so many failed projects. One mile on Faber's Road, $8 million. That is the legacy of the UDP. Lake Independence Boulevard. Lake Independence Boulevard, among many other failed projects that they oversaw. And they have the gall and the guts, the face of brass, the audacity to come into this house and want to speak about corruption. Madam Speaker, these people have no shame. The UDP killed this economy because, and, and I was reminded yesterday, he proudly boasted that the first nine years of their administration, they grew, the economy, GDP grew by very small percentages. And it was, it was only possible for them because they were spending over $500 million in petro Carib money and all the money that we left. And after they squandered it on Pibil and Tacos, what happened? The, accru the economy went down, Madam Speaker, causing, causing increments for public officers and, and teachers and soldiers and other frontline workers having to be frozen by none other than Mr. Barrow and the UDP. And who? Who, Madam Speaker, who restored it back? The People's United Party government. Two years before the due date. Similarly, Madam Speaker, the whole matter of the 10% cut that our frontline workers, public servants, and teachers had to take was not an easy decision. But today we see the fruits of that tough decision that we all collectively undertook. The economy is rebounding. Jobs are being created. There are more opportunities for education and health. More opportunities for Belizeans to have a good home. We are seeing this PUP government turning around this economy, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I want to focus a little bit on some key points, some key points that this budget is focusing on. Madam Speaker, in 2022, Belize's economy grew by an estimated 12.4%, 10 times more than what happened under the United Democratic Party. That is our record, Madam Speaker. Over 42,965 workers have benefited from the minimum wage increase to $5, Madam Speaker. That is our achievement and accomplishment in less than two years, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, exactly. They had 13 long years. Did they ever consider increasing the minimum wage? No, no. But we delivered it in less than two years. That is the record of the People's United Party. That is a government working for the people. Madam Speaker, 
It is important, Madam Speaker, that the Belizean people understand that the priorities of this government, as outlined by our Prime Minister in our midterm development strategy, is poverty reduction, economic transformation and growth, trade deficit reduction, and citizen security. For it is only when we focus on these very important pillars of development, Madam Speaker, that we will continue to see Belize's economy and development on the right path to self-sustainability. Madam Speaker, our Prime Minister presented a total budget of $1.4 billion, which reflects recurrent spending of $1.1 billion, capital spending of $383.4 million. This is important because capital projects represents projects and works that will continue to happen during this fiscal year to ensure that we bring development to our country from Toledo to Corozal, from San Pedro to Benque Viejo across this country, Madam Speaker. We also have capital tree of $158 million. Madam Speaker, I want to reiterate what other colleagues have said and what the Prime Minister highlighted, because it is important that the Belizean people know what we are putting priority on during this fiscal year. Madam Speaker, the impact of the 2023-24 budget is as follows. We are budgeting $4 million to expand free education to, to Southside, Belize City, and the Southern Districts, which comprises Stand Creek and the Toledo District. That is significant. That is telling us that we as a government have our priorities right. For one of the pillars that we must build to fight poverty is education. And I want to congratulate my friend and colleague, the Minister of Education, for his unwavering support and commitment to education, Madam Speaker. Minister spoke yesterday about the Rural Education Fund. We have seen in last year a million dollars allocated to that. This year, another million dollars allocated. We have seen where over 625 students across this country in the rural area have benefited from scholarships and tuition assistance so that they can get a sound education. That is what our priority is, and that is how we are going to develop our human capital, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, a million dollars for land surveys, very important. For first time landowners and ho homeowners, very, very significant, Madam Speaker. Seven million dollars for NHI expansion in the Orange Walk District. Seven million dollars. And yet we hear that other side, criticizing our, my colleague, our colleague, the Minister of Health, that we are not doing enough for help. Well, I am certain he's going to answer them, Madam Speaker. But it goes to show that our commitment to equal health for all is unwavering, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, $3 million for municipal streets and drains. So we will continue to support the development of our municipalities. Very important, citizen security. I spoke about that as being our priorities. And Madam Speaker, we are putting our monies where it is going to work. And that is why under this budget, 
Five million dollars is being allocated for an additional 225 police cadets, 110 new BDF recruits, and 60 additional Coast Guard recruits. That is significant, and that is going to boost our citizen security, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, it is important to note that under education, under the last administration, particularly after COVID, most of our students were out of school. But through the efforts of this Ministry of Education and a PUP government, we have seen more than 2,600 students returning back to school, getting an opportunity at an education, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, it is important to note that this government will continue to support education, will continue to support job opportunities, health opportunities for all, and will continue to ensure that we grow this economy in a very sustainable manner, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, having said that, I would like to turn to the Ministry of Rural Transformation, Community Development, Labor and Local Government, of which I am privileged and honored to head, Madam Speaker, together with our management team and our entire staff. I want to take this opportunity, Madam Speaker, to recognize our CEO, Mr. Valentino Schall, our heads of department, and our entire staff for their unwavering support and commitment to bringing development to Belizeans across this country, Madam Speaker. I salute them for their hard work, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, turning, turning to our budget, our ministry is charged with a very huge responsibility and mandate. And Madam Speaker, if you allow me, I want to share with the Belizean people the vision of our ministry. Our vision is to build a sustainable and resilient commitment, sorry, building sustainable and resilient communities across Belize. Our mission, Madam Speaker, is to build resilient communities in Belize through improved local governance, labor administration, and sustainable community development. Madam Speaker, when we compare the numbers in terms of the budgetary allocations of our ministry, we are seeing, Madam Speaker, that under recurrent expenditure, for 2022-2023, Madam Speaker, we had $11,136,182 allocated in 2022-2023, Madam Speaker. For this new fiscal year, 2023-2024, Madam Speaker, we have seen an increase to $12,140,000 and I want to thank the Prime Minister and our colleagues and all the hardworking staff at the Ministry of Finance for their support. Because, Madam Speaker, in putting together this budget, we have seen where our public servants, our finance officers at our ministry, and similarly at the Ministry of Finance, have worked and toiled for long hours to try to ensure that each ministry can be allocated what they need to be able to carry out their work. So we have seen an increase in our budget for this fiscal year. Similarly, Madam Speaker, under capital expenditure for last year, we had $2,297,703. That has been up, Madam Speaker, to $2,820,000. Three hundred and ninety-six 
dollars. So again, we have seen an increase in capital expenditure, Madam Speaker. But I'm speaker turning to rural transformation. And I want to particularly highlight goal six of the SDGs, clean water and sanitation for all. We take that mandate very seriously. And as such, we have a unit at our ministry that is solely responsible, Madam Speaker, to ensure that we have clean, safe, portable water for all rural communities across Belize. And I, I want to take this opportunity, Madam Speaker, to congratulate them and to commend that team, particularly our rig crew, headed by none other than Mr. Charles Galvis and his team, who work very diligently daily, Madam Speaker, to ensure that our people have access to clean, safe, portable water. But I'm speaking, if a, if a water system goes down in the middle of the night, at the earliest, at the break of dawn, we are there to fix it. We are there to fix it. And it is evident, it is evident, if a pump goes bad, a line breaks down, if the well runs dry, we are there responding because we take our job very seriously. Madam Speaker, when I swore to serve the people, that is what I meant. And that is the attitude, that is the principle that we are guided by at our ministry, that serve the people we must at whatever cost, because the Belizean people deserve only that, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, in 2022, under rural transformation, a total of 675,000 gallons of water. I'm sorry, let me go back to that. Madam Speaker, in 2022, a total of $675,000 were, was disbursed to 66 village councils. Very, very important. So we're seeing almost three quarter million dollars, Madam Speaker, that were disbursed to village councils in terms of village council support so that our village councils are able to carry out small projects within their communities. We also saw village council elections completed during the last year for all villages across this country. This is very important. Water boards had a combined total, Madam Speaker, of 4,286,540 dollars and 30 cents for 2022. While expenses came up to 3,653,318 dollars and 50 cents. This is the first time since taking over water boards under this government, Madam Speaker, that we have a cumulative surplus of $633,154.80. Let me repeat that. For the first time, we have seen a surplus of over half a million dollars. What does that mean, Madam Speaker? It means that the training that we have given to water boards, the supervision that we provide, the capacity building, and the motivation is working, Madam Speaker. No longer are our water boards overall as a country cumulative in, a, in deficit, but rather we have seen a surplus. Madam Speaker, that is commendable, and I want to thank the water boards across this country who are working diligently to ensure that they provide clean, safe, portable water, and that they manage the resources of the people in a very prudent manner, Madam Speaker. You know, Madam Speaker, 
When we took over, water boards across this country cumulatively owed over half a million dollars in bills to BEL. That has been reduced significantly, Madam Speaker. So not only are they managing their bills, but they are also saving so that they can have a sustainable water system. Madam Speaker, the Rural Water Supply and Sanitation Unit drilled over 30 new production wells during this last fiscal year. We have installed several pumps, hand pumps, across this country. We service over 90 production wells for rural water systems. We also ensured, Madam Speaker, that we regularly tested the water so as to ensure that these wells were not contaminated. Farmers across this country were also provided support, Madam Speaker. Over 60 new wells for farmers to support them in the agro-productive sector were drilled, Madam Speaker. We did this together with Rural Resilient Belize, the Ministry of Agriculture, and other institutions who have supported us. Our ministry is known, Madam Speaker, for that wonderful, huge water bowser that we have. Again, that was another acquisition that we got since taking over government. And whenever a water system fails, and the people are in need of water, Madam Speaker, from Toledo to Corozal, to Benke, Madam Speaker, we are there supplying the rural area with water, Madam Speaker. That is how seriously we take our commitment. Madam Speaker, we are also progressing. When I took over the ministry, together with our management team, we recognize that the method of finding water and drilling for water was very inefficient and expensive. So what did we do, Madam Speaker? We said we must improve. And we sought partnerships and alliances with a university out of Texas. And I want today to publicly thank Dr. Wiley, who came to this country and trained our rural sanitation crew in how to use geo-resistivity, Madam Speaker, to be able to find water. And I will say to you, in this day of, in this day and age of technology, we are putting that to work. So no longer are we just guessing, well, maybe we have water here or there. We are using science and technology so that we can improve our efficiency and save the government of Belize very much needed taxpayers' dollars, Madam Speaker. So I want to thank Dr. Wiley and his team and our team for adopting this new technology. Madam Speaker, donations have been made across this country. Across this country. We have made donations of pipes to countless villages across the entire nation, water vats, just supporting our people, making donations of weed eaters. I can say to you, for example, I clearly remember here, a couple, I think about two months ago, we were in Crooked Tree, where we donated over $15,000 worth of pipe to expand the water system. In the Toledo district, in the Cayo district, all over, that is the work of our ministry, Madam Speaker. Similarly, as I said, we have conducted training for village councils and water boards, and we are beginning to see the fruits of those training. Similarly, Madam Speaker, we held several training sessions for our rural development officers, our labor officers, because it is important that they be brought up to par, that they understand 
the policies and legislation that we need to enforce, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, we also, as the Ministry of Rural Transformation, continue to work with several partners and stakeholders. I particularly want to thank the Ministry, the Ministry of Infrastructure Development and Housing for supporting us in building streets in our rural communities. We have built streets, Madam Speaker, and I want to say, in the Toledo District, for the first time, we saw streets being built in San Vicente, in Pueblo Viejo, in Halakte, in San Miguel, we are upgrading streets. And similarly, we have supported other communities in the North, Madam Speaker. This is what we are doing. We recognize that we also have to work and partner with other ministries and stakeholders. And we are particularly concerned and working very hard to ensure that we can support the agro-productive sector. We want to support our farmers. We want to support our women. We want to support our young people so that they become engaged in sustainable economic activities so that they can improve their lives, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, so as I said, we have upgraded several farmers' roads, several villages, including Silver Creek, San Miguel, Big Falls, San Pedro, Colombia, Concepcion, San Narciso, among many others. Under local government, Madam Speaker, local government, we have facilitated installation of new financial management software in two councils, San Pedro Town Council and Kikaka Village Council to support improve access to real-time data aimed at improving prudent financial management and decision making. <laughs> we have provided in-service QuickBooks training to over 12 staff members of local authorities, including San Pedro Town Council, the Punta Gorda Town Council, Dan Griga and Key Cocker. We trained over 150 persons in the management and administration of liquor licensing, um, liquor licenses, including members of the police, the fire department, the health department, the environment, and other key stakeholders. Madam Speaker, turning to the Ministry of Labor. I just want to take the opportunity to share, Madam Speaker, with the nation, that as the Ministry of Labor, we take our responsibilities very seriously. And I want to share two critical objectives that we have as a Ministry of Labor, Madam Speaker. It is to administer, the objective is to administer labor legislations of Belize as it applies to all business, estab business establishments, to manage trade disputes, labor complaints, and to advise the Minister of Labor with regards to the improvement of industrial relations and generally on all labor matters. Similarly, our second objective is to develop policies consistent with our commitment to sustainable development strategy through our commitments through the international labor organizations and other stakeholders. So, Madam Speaker, what have we done so far in labor? Madam Speaker, during our campaign, we promised the Belizean people that we were going to increase the minimum wage. And we have delivered on that promise, Madam Speaker. So the minimum wage for manual workers, shop assistants, domestic students and manual workers engaged in agriculture, agro-industry, or export-oriented industries increased to $5 per hour, effective January 1st, 2023. The new increase is part of our overall strategy 
to combat poverty and reduce inequality, Madam Speaker. On November 28, 2022, the Ministry launched our new online labor complaints management system for workers. The newly designed system now makes it easier, Madam Speaker, to file a labor complaint and workers can track the progress of their cases online. This will improve labor relations management and management of service of our department. This is significant, Madam Speaker. On July 18, 2022, the Ministry launched the Belize National Child Labor Policy and Strategy 2022 2025. This policy seeks to reduce the incidence of child labor and to eliminate the worst forms of child labor by 2025. This is our commitment and we are delivering on our obligations and commitment, Madam Speaker. We established the Labor Complaints Tribunal which conducted, Madam Speaker, for the first time, we reactivated the Labor Complaints Tribunal. This was dormant. This was dead under the UDP. We brought it back to life, Madam Speaker, brought it back to life. And as I was sharing, for the first time, we conducted nine pre-hearings, two trials, two judgments. We received 38 new complaints and 65 complaints were closed. This is what we are achieving at our ministry, Madam Speaker. This is what we committed on the plan Belize. And this is your government at work, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, senior labor officers, labor officers and employment officers successfully completed a three-day virtual training on occupational safety and health provided by the Ministry of Labor and Social Partnership Relations from Barbados with the support of the American Inter-American Network for Labor Administration. The Labor Department oversaw the signing of a new CBA between the Central Bank of Belize and the Christian Workers Unit, Union benefiting 168 employees for a three-year period. The CBA seeks to enhance the good employment relations that exist between the bank and the union. The ministry, along with the Labor Advisory Board, completed all outstanding Article 19 and 22 reports Article 22 reports and two Article 19 reports. Additionally, the International Labor Organization's reports were submitted and verified, Madam Speaker, by Cabinet. So, Madam Speaker, what we are doing is we are delivering on our commitments that we make. And this is very important, Madam Speaker, because it signifies a government that is prepared to ensure that we live up to our commitments under our tripartite relationship, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, for the period of January to December 2022, the Labor Department conducted a total of 869 labor inspections settled a total of 349 labor complaints and recovered, this is important, recovered over $458,500 in benefits that were due to workers. Let me repeat that. Let me repeat that. We recovered over $458,500 in benefits that were due to our workers. This is what todos ganamos means. This is what it means, all are we for win, Madam Speaker. 
we take our job very seriously. The technical staff of the department conducted over 260 labor education sessions countrywide, gave approximately 800 labor, labor advices, reviewed 10 company employment policies, and attested 32 employment contracts. During 2022, a total of 54 child labor inspections and 42 child labor education sessions were conducted by the Labor Department, Madam Speaker. We take our job seriously. And I must say, Madam Speaker, that this is not my achievement. I want to commend all our staff at the Labor Department and similarly our staff at each and every other department that our ministry is responsible for. At our ministry, Madam Speaker, we have tried to develop and to nurture a culture of respect, a culture of understanding the importance of working hard, the importance of serving our people, and the importance of working together to build a better Belize for all, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, these are significant achievements that we have done. But moving forward, Madam Speaker, what are our projections? I want to share, Madam Speaker, with the nation and with this honorable house, our ministry's key upcoming activities for the fiscal year 2023-2024, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, we are the Ministry of Rural Transformation, so we are responsible for development in the rural areas. And we find it very important that we must have a rural development strategy, Madam Speaker. And that is why we are going to revise and implement a national rural development strategy. We are going to provide capacity building for staff in QuickBooks, conflict resolution, community development, and organizational leadership. We will continue to monitor the processing of the 24-hour special purpose temporary employment permit applications. When we took over, Madam Speaker, in 2020, TEPs took a month to be processed. We then went reducing it to two weeks. We are now at seven days, and we are now moving towards providing special purpose TEPs in 24 hours, Madam Speaker, because we recognize the importance of labor to the development, economic development of our country, Madam Speaker. We are going to continue to monitor the payment of the temporary employment permit uh, via online, Madam Speaker, and using the e-wallet platform. The implementation of the child labor policy and strategy 2022-2025 to reduce the incidence of the worst forms of child labor in Belize. We will monitor the implementation of the increased minimum wage of $5. We will conduct a comprehensive review of the Labor Act. Madam Speaker, it amazes me that we are still, you know, our Labor Act is so old and outdated. The time has come for us to revamp our labor act, Madam Speaker, and that is what we are working on. We are going to develop and execute a labor complaints management system for the Labor Complaints Tribunal. We will upgrade the employment services system. We will revise the temporary employment permit, which is a 2010 policy, and it is currently in place. We will revise the HIV AIDS workplace policy. We are preparing and getting ready to submit to ILO the report due in 2023. These are reports that in, are in line with Article 19 and Article 22 of the ILO Constitution. We will continue to partner with other stakeholders in educating the public, all affected on child labor, trafficking in persons, 
workplace education on HIV AIDS, labor education, and occupational health and safety. We will submit a total of 43 ILO on ratified conventions to the National Assembly for information purposes. We will continue our preparation in projects by CARICOM, the ILO, the World Bank, etc. We will continue to build staff competency through training opportunities, and we will also recognize and commemorate International Labor Day, World Day Against Child Labor, and World AIDS Day. Madam Speaker, these are but some of the many achievements and the many projections that we are looking forward for 2023, 2024. We are going to ensure, Madam Speaker, that we finalize the passage of the Trade Licensing Act 2023 further to the Trade License Reform Initiative, initiate consultations for the amendment of the Intoxicating Liquor License Act and advance the municipal boundaries redelineation exercise. We are going to conduct a national symposium to consider the revision of the national policy on local governance. Madam Speaker, we will continue to advance the Municipal Climate Resilience Initiative to support you know, climate adaptation to the urban sector. We will continue to collaborate with key partners and stakeholders to advance the digital agenda, including mapping of businesses and liquor establishments across Belize to support our efforts to ensure that everybody comes in on board with regards to the digital um, trading and capacity building. And finally, Madam Speaker, we are going to enhance the capacity of the Department of Local Govern Governance in knowledge transfer and enhance the capacity to improve voluntary compliance regarding public residence business obligations to the councils through the development and hearing of infomercials. The conduct, we will conduct webinars and publication as well as education sessions on trade and liquor licensing, garbage collection, property taxes, and municipal development. But I'm speaker, I am honored indeed and privileged to share with this honorable house and the Belizean people, what are some of our projections for 2023, 2024? Madam Speaker, I thank you for the opportunity to share the developments and achievements that we have accomplished during the last fiscal year and those projections, as I said, that we are considering moving forward. Madam Speaker, with your permission, I now turn to my constituency. When I'm speaker, as I said earlier, I am deeply honored and privileged to represent Toledo West. It's not an easy challenge. 28 villages, Madam Speaker, that were abandoned and neglected under the last administration. And Madam Speaker, I want to say that I am very grateful to the Prime Minister, to our cabinet colleagues, and all the elected members on this side for the support in ensuring that we can you know, work together to bring development to our constituency. It has not been easy. And one of the most challenging, challenging needs that we have in our constituency is just roads, Madam Speaker. Because of the high rainfall, we have seen where the Ministry of Infrastructure and our very own ministry and my own initiatives through the Community Development Fund have gone in to support the building of roads, farmers' roads and streets. But it is an ever-challenging task because just like how you build, the rains come down and destroy it. But we are not going to give up. We will continue to support that. And as I said, one of the flagship achievements was the San Jose Bypass, Madam Speaker. 15 years, 
15 years under the UDP. They never saw it fit to build that bypass. In fact, when I was sitting on that other side of the house, I literally pleaded to the prime minister every year. And I remember in 2017, he said, Monday, they are going to start the bypass. Never came, never came. In four months after we won government, Madam Speaker, we delivered the first concrete bridge on that bypass to San Jose. Today, that road has been upgraded and it is an all-weather road, but we are taking it further. Through rural resilient Belize, we are going to build that road to paving standards to support our productive farmers in that area, Madam Speaker. We have seen, Madam Speaker, as I said, streets being upgraded in several of our communities in San Marcos during this fiscal year. We completed a very important crossing that is a major culvert that connects the south side with the north side. Very significant work, and we are very happy to support that community. Today, as we speak, we are working on the Farmers Road, just like how we have worked on Farmers Road across the constituency. And for those who are listening, I know that my constituents will say, Mr. Rekina, but we still have a lot of more Farmers Road and streets that we need to build. And we are going to work to build them. But I say to our people, I thank you for your patience and understanding. We are coming to you one village at a time. One village at a time. We will bring development to our communities, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, during the last fiscal year, we saw major upgrades to all the streets in San Antonio. Abandoned for the last 15 years. We upgraded those streets, we put in, we resurfaced them for many of the people who are living in, 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 you know, in, the, in the bushes for the first time. We saw roads going to their homes. That is what we are doing, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, we rehabilitated several community centers. And this year, I intend to focus on the following community centers to be rehabilitated. We're going to rehabilitate the Aguacate, the Santa Teresa, the Criquehute, and the San Vicente community centers. Similarly, we provided support to San Benito Poite, where we donated beautiful new armchairs to the children so that they can sit comfortably and that they can learn in a very safe, comfortable environment, Madam Speaker. Similarly, I want to say that I am very grateful for the support that Minister, the Honorable Member from Caribbean Shores has promised to give us to upgrade police stations in San Pedro, Colombia. And Mr. Minister, we are asking for support to upgrade the police station in San Antonio. That police station is in dire need to upgrade because it is not, you know, able to accommodate you know, and it is not in a, in, a, in a situation where people can live there. So we need to certainly upgrade that. I am also very thankful to my colleague, the Honorable Minister of Defense and Border Security, for mentioning that as part of this budget, we are going to see upgrades to the Fiawera camp so that our soldiers and those who work tirelessly and diligently to protect our borders and to protect us can live comfortable, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I also want to say that in Toledo West, in the Toledo District, last week I had the honor to accompany my colleague, the Honorable Minister of Agriculture. <laughs> we will take you the next time, Minister. I had the privilege to accompany him along with Minister Mike and the management team of the Belize Marketing Development Corporation, where we launch the Big Falls Rice, truly Southern, a major achievement for the people of the Toledo District. That was a campaign promise that we made. The UDP killed the rice industry in the Toledo District. Killed it. Killed it. 
after, after the Toledo district was at the forefront of rice production, 14 million pounds under my colleague, the Honorable Member for Toledo East when he was Minister of Agriculture. 14 million pounds. That is what the farmers were delivering to the mill, both mechanized and mill performers. There was opportunity for the people to be able to, you know, generate economic activity to support their families. But under, under Gladwin Hulse, under Montero, under Gaspar Vega, they killed the rice industry in the Toledo district. But we made a solemn promise on the plan Belize that we would bring back the rice industry and bring it back, we have done. Our farmers now are encouraged to plant rice. And I will tell you, farmers in the Toledo district, the price has increased because we recognize that the cost of living has gone up and that we must provide an incentive to the farmers. So we have moved the price from 29 cents to 40 cents a pound for rice paddy. That is an incentive brought on by the People's United Party, your government at work. Sports. During this fiscal year, we were able to, to build this fiscal year that we completed, we were able to build a multi-purpose court in San Pedro, Colombia. <laughs> right. We developed a multi-purpose court where our young people can play basketball, volleyball, and other disciplines in a very safe environment. I am proud to say that three weeks ago, we launched the third annual Rekena football tournament. Magnificent. We are going to see four months of good football, sports playing across the constituency where our young people are engaged in positive energy. Positive energy because we care for our young people. We continue to support during the last fiscal year many of the football fields that were e electrified under the PUP government, Said Musa and the late Marcel Mess. May he rest in peace. Electrified many of our rural football fields. The lights were not working. I went there together with our communities and we made sure that we lighted them back so that our young people can engage in good sporting activities. So Mr. Speaker, we will continue to do that. We continue to bush hug farmers' roads, public spaces in our communities across the Toledo district. For the first time, we saw myself and the village council of Big Falls working together along with another set of volunteers to build the first children's playground in Big Falls. That is an accomplishment that we're very happy to partner with and we want to congratulate the Big Falls Village Council. In winding up, Mr. Speaker, allow me to say that we have done quite a lot. In the last two years, we have seen major achievements. In line right now, as we speak, we have several projects that we are working on. We are building a new water system, designing a new water system for Mabilha and for Mofredai. And we will go back into Halakte next week to start drilling for a new water system for them. Similarly for Santa Elena, we will go and drill and prepare for a water system for them. In the interim, we are going to drill additional hand pumps for Santa Elena and for Halakte because there is the need for the, to support them. So we continue to work. We will see Santa Cruz football field upgraded. We are going to upgrade that football field to make it, you know, accessible for our young people. So we have achieved a lot in two years. But Mr. Speaker, I would be remiss if I do not mention that there is still a lot of needs. And one of the major needs that we have is expansion of rural electricity. 
And whilst we are working on several projects, we are going to see in, the, in this fiscal year the development of a mini-grid system for San Vicente, for Halakte, for San Benito Poite. And we are going to see the inauguration of the mini-grid system for Indian Creek, Golden Stream, and Medina Bank. There is still need for additional electrification in rural communities. And I want to urge our Prime Minister for his continued support of our Prime Minister and Cabinet colleagues and our government to continue to support us so that we can bring electricity to those communities that have still not been able to get electricity. Mr. Speaker, I want to see that we have achieved a lot. I want to thank our CEO, our staff at the Ministry of Rural Development, Rural Transformation, Community Development, Labor and Local Government. I want to thank the beautiful people of Toledo West. I want to thank the Prime Minister and our colleagues. And together, with God's help, we will continue to build a better Belize, a Belize that works for all, where we create equal opportunities for all Belizeans. Madam Speaker, I wholeheartedly and 100% support this budget. I thank you. I recognize the member for Orange Walk South. Thank you, Madam Speaker. With your permission, I will refer to my notes, Madam Speaker. <clears throat> Madam Speaker, I rise today to comment and support on the Revenue Appropriation Bill 2023-2024. I refer to this, Madam Speaker, as a budget presentation and not a budget debate because there is no one to debate on that side. But, but before I begin, Madam Speaker, allow me to salute and big up my constituents, people of Orange Rock South, for their continuous unwavering support. It is because of them who have never lost confidence in the PUP and in their humble servant that I stand here today, proudly representing them for the 12th time, for the 12th budget presentation. And to show you, Madam Speaker, the level of confidence that they have in the PUP, you know, in Drag South, Madam Speaker, there is not a single UDP, PPP, or CDP, or all of these other parties. There is not a single village council, you know, in Drag South. Full blue. Everything is full blue. Further than that, Madam Speaker, there is not even a single member of a village council that is a UDP. Every single body elected or in Rock South belongs to the People's United Party. So I do not know why the leader of the opposition is saying that the people are unhappy with the PUP. If they were unhappy with the PUP, then we would have lost the British Council election, or at least get some independence in there. My constituents who all live in rural areas deserve and are receiving the maximum respect. They deserve to enjoy the benefits of a well-governed nation. For 13 years, Madam Speaker, our constituency, Orange Rock South, was abandoned, it was shunned, it was locked down by the UDP government because they chose to stand with the PUP for three terms. I don't know when was the last time the leader of the opposition visited Orange Rock South, but I am certain that he has not visited Guinea Grass in the last six months. It took us, the PUP, 20 years before we could win a village council in the village of Guinea Grass. 
It took us almost 25 years to win the general election in Guinea Grass. In the general elections of 2022, the biggest win in Orindra South was at Guinea Grass. Yes, Madam Speaker, the biggest win was in Guinea Grass. So, how can the leader of the population say that life was better under the UDP? He is not living in Belize, he is living in Disney World. The people of Guinea Grass, though, even though continuously, repeatedly, insistently voted for the UDP for 20 to 25 years, were neglected. They were disrespected and abused by their own government. Two ARFs for the UDP were from the village of Guinea Grass, two. But none of them, none of them did what the POP has done for the people of Guinea Grass in 28 months. The people of Guinea Grass are witnessing a total transformation. More than 50 culverts have been replaced. Village streets have been upgraded. The main road in Guinea Grass is now being paved. Madam Speaker, and we are working diligently to source financing to pave the entire road to Tower Hill. In 28 months, the people of Guinea Grass have seen a tremendous change for the best. In addition, Madam Speaker, the people of Guinea Grass suffered enough from a lack of water during the summertime. Every single year, Madam Speaker, there is a problem with water, not enough water for the village. That too, Madam Speaker, is shortly coming to an end. The people of Guinea Grass will now have an additional water system. It will be constructed in the Felix Estate area, courtesy of the wonderful people of Taiwan. So I can see, Madam Speaker, that the leader of position does not know what he is saying when he says that life was better under the UDP. All villages in Orange Rock South, Madam Speaker, got their streets upgraded. All villages got culverts replaced. As we speak, Madam Speaker, the work continues at this time in the village of San Felipe. In Agas Parish, culverts have been replaced. As we speak, the work continues. Much has been accomplished in my constituency in two years. Definitely a lot more than what the UDP did in 13 years. Work has been done on many of the sugar roads now in Joak South. Of course, Madam Speaker, there's always more to do. There's always still more roads to upgrade, and thus the work continues. Dozens of culverts have been replaced, and as Hurricane Lisa passed, it destroyed several of our culverts, which we still need to be which we still need to replace. In San Lazaro and Trinidad, we still have culverts to be replaced. We have sugar roads to repair. As a matter of fact, repairs and maintenance is not only a one-time deal, it is continuous. It is continuous, Madam Speaker. And, and as we stand here today, the job continues. I want to really thank Minister Julius Espat and his staff for providing all the excellent services to my constituency. <clears throat> and as we discuss today, Madam Speaker, plans are well underway, underway to commence the upgrading of 14 miles of road from San Carlos to San Felipe. This is being done under the RRB project, Madam Speaker. 14 miles will be upgraded up to paving standards. But Madam Speaker, we will not leave it up to, up to paving standards. We are a responsible government. And so we will do our best to pave
pave that entire 14 miles from San Carlos to San Felipe, where the heart of the production lies, Madam Speaker. An additional to that, Madam Speaker, both San Carlos and Indian Church will be beneficiaries of the state-of-the-art solar electricity system, courtesy of the EU, Madam Speaker. Both of these villages will now be electrified with the state-of-the-art solar system. <clears throat> But as Speaker, the lives of the people on Drug South are slowly being transformed. Being a rural community, more jobs are being created as the agriculture sector grows. The more the sector grows, more jobs are created, more families are employed, more parents can afford food, can afford medication, can afford school for their children. And so, Madam Speaker, it is critical that the cattle continue to go. It is important that the corn grows and goes. The rice, the beans, the soybean, the milk, the cheese, the pork, the chicken need to grow and go. Yes, Madam Speaker, it must grow and go so that we continue to strengthen and expand the economy. Never has the unemployment rate been so low. As far as I can remember, Madam Speaker, this is the lowest it's ever been. And as tourism grows, as tourism grows, agriculture grows with it because the demand for food increases. So tourism is a critical component of our economy. Madam Speaker, the agriculture sector shrunk very little in 2022. It continues, though, to be one of the main economic drivers of the Belizean economy. It remains a robust economic activity for the country, driving the economy forward, providing rigorous economic activity that translates to other sectors of the economy. It is quite fitting for us to congratulate the hard-working farmers of this country who, despite the challenges of global inflation, keep doing what they do best, toil the land. I must also salute, Madam Speaker, the staff of the Ministry of Agriculture for believing in Plan Belize, for trusting in me as their minister to lead the ministry at a time when it was considered the most difficult the COVID era, probably the most challenging time in the history of our country. I am grateful to them for having accepted the change that come with restructuring. Indeed, the restructuring of the ministry has served us right, and many of the ministry's programs and projects are performing and yielding great results. Indeed, I consider myself to be a fortunate minister, to be surrounded by competent, dedicated, and hardworking professionals and technicians. We must remind ourselves that we're only leaders if we have followers, and a leader without followers will go nowhere. I thank my CEO and my senior staff, my advisors, and our foot soldiers, of course, the extension officers, and of course, I must thank our partners in development for the great support they provide. Madam Speaker, in 2021, agriculture grew by 24%, partly due to the massive exports of cattle and other products to Mexico and other markets. In 2022, the primary sector shrunk, shrunk a little. The main reason being for the reduced exports of citrus, bananas, and cattle. In 2021, Belize exported 42,405 head of beef cattle 
as compared to 32,400 in 2022. That's 10,000 headless. The national herd, although we exported less, the national herd grew from 168,000 to 178,000, equivalent to 6.2%. This is a clear indication that our herd is still strong and growth and exports will follow in the very near future. Why was there less export of cattle in 2022? Several reasons. Two markets, one to Guatemala and one to Mexico. The, Guat the Guatemalan market, Madam Speaker, would pay more for a smaller animal and pay less for a big animal. The Mexican market would pay a set price for any size. Therefore, the farmers hold the animals for a longer time and sell it for a better price. That is the reason why less cattle was exported to Mexico. Secondly, Madam Speaker, the race to the border in 2020 to export cattle was a race to get rid of the excess animals we had, which the border was locked for about nine months and farmers rushed and sold the excess. So we can, ex that is why, Madam Speaker, we had less exports this year. Madam Speaker, citrus, due to good weather conditions, citrus stabilized. It maintained stability in 2022. This is due to good weather and to the implementation of a migrant labor support program. Orange deliveries to the factory remained stable or went down a little at 1.3 million boxes, while grapefruit deliveries increased from 117,000 boxes to 143,000 boxes. However, Citrus greening disease continues to create havoc in the citrus industry. The government made available a loan of $15 million through DFC to facilitate the rehabilitation and replanting with new tolerant varieties of oranges and grapefruit. But only a small portion of these funds have been borrowed by citrus farmers. And as such, the replanting program has not taken off as expected. As a result, the acreage under citrus production fell by 15%, with just around 20,000 acres of citrus remaining in production from a high of 60,000 plus acres. In addition, farmers cut back on their fertilizer and management programs due to high cost of inputs. The 2022-23 citrus crop is not going to be good. And with the combined production of oranges and grapefruit projected to be less than 800,000 boxes for the first time in recent history. Madam Speaker, there is an urgent need for the citrus industry to diversify into other fruit juices. CPBL is investing in a much versatile type of processing focusing on coconuts, passion fruit, sour sap, and pineapples. In, 20, in the 2022-23 crop, pineapple deliveries to CPBL is expected to be 1.2 million pounds. Sour sap processed is expected to reach 50,000 pounds. And passion fruit, which currently stands at just under 20,000 pounds, is expected to reach 60,000 pounds, which is a new record. Madam Speaker, this is happening under the PUP. And to save the industry, and to diversify the industry, to accelerate the diversification, the Ministry of Agriculture, along with Cartier in Costa Rica, 
has sourced 500,000 pineapple seedlings of the MD2 variety to distribute to farmers in southern districts to kickstart the diversification. The objective is, is, it, is to have in one and a half years at least eight times the amount of seeds and probably we could reach 250 acres of pineapples. But then speak of bananas, the production fell from 5.7 million boxes to 4.6 million boxes, equivalent to 13%, mostly due to much rain in 2022. Climate change, Madam Speaker, is real and it's affecting the productive sector. The acreage remain the same. The banana industry will recover and the BGA are engaging the financial institutions to obtain operational funds to address fertilizer and other inputs that are urgently needed to ramp up the production. When I speak of bananas, is a high consumer of fertilizers. We use two bags of fertilizer per month per acre. And when they are harvesting, that fertilizer has to be there. Fertilizer prices increased by 300% in 2020. 22, making it difficult for the banana farmers to operate. In addition, Madam Speaker, bananas is 100% labor intensive. There's nothing in the banana industry that can be mechanized. And hence, the increase in labor costs did not work much in their favor. Madam Speaker, but the PUP along with the banana growers, along with the exporter, are working to kickstart again the banana industry. In Shuakin, Madam Speaker, despite experiencing problems with the commercial agreement between the BSCFA, the biggest association, and BSI, the 2021-22 cane crop was quite in the range of 1.36 million metric tons of sugarcane, an increase of 157,324 metric tons over the previous year. <clears throat> this is almost the milling capacity of Tower Hill factory. Last year, approximately 167,000 tons of cane remained in the farmer's fields. Cabinet recognizes, Madam Speaker, how important the sugar industry is for the national economy and the socio-economic livelihoods of Northern Belize. It's a strong foreign exchange earner and contributes to at least 15% of direct and indirect employment. Cabinet recognizes also that the future prosperity of sugar industry depends on forging ahead with necessary legislative changes to the Sugar Industry Act. The successful negotiation of a new long-term commercial agreement between the cane farmers, BSI and BSISR, <clears throat> the long-term commercial agreement between cane farmers and BSI, and the need for technical and financial assistance to the cane producing areas is critical for the survival of the industry. The, the government, Madam Speaker, has appointed a cabinet subcommittee, a minister subcommittee under the, under the chairmanship of Honorable Karim Musa to work closely with all key stakeholders on finding the solutions and the way forward for this industry. Madam Speaker, and while bananas and citrus and cattle produce less foreign exchange, all other subsectors, Madam Speaker, should increase. Onions, Madam Speaker, an increase of 31.8%. Potatoes, that shrunk a little, Madam Speaker. Coconuts, 18,000 acres of coconuts now, Madam Speaker. Limes and lemons, an increase of 2.9%. 
Tomatoes, 15.8%. Hot peppers, 21.9%. Lettuce, 23.7%. Broccoli, 100% increase this year. Cauliflower, 3.6%. All this, Madam Speaker, is in line with our policy of food sovereignty. In milk production, Madam Speaker, the milk production increased from 12.5 million pounds to 14.4 million pounds, an increase of 12.4%. Sheep, Madam Speaker, expanded by 10.2%. This is directly linked to tourism. As tourism increases, the demand for sheep increases. Poultry increased by 6.2%. Turkey by 35.3%. Swine by 11.1%. Honey production increased by 9.2%. So, Madam Speaker, you can see that the agriculture sector is strong and that food sovereignty is something that we are working on. Very important, Madam Speaker, and a success story is that of a soybean. The soybean industry is considered very important for the food security, for food security in Belize. But for a long time, Belize has been dependent on importing soybean concentrates. Concentrates up to the tone of $25 million were imported. One, two, three oil, lard, corn oil, various types of oils, another $24 million imported. The government of Belize has encouraged soybeans research and production for the past 25 years. In the early days, production hovered around 5,000 acres only. But as farmers improved their soybean production systems and new varieties became available, production, Madam Speaker, continued to rise. And so from zero acres in the 1990s to 5,000 acres, and in 2021 now, Madam Speaker, we are record producing 38 million pounds of soybean from 28,000 acres, Madam Speaker. We have grown significantly. From being a country of importing soybean, we have now become a country of exporting, exporting soybean, Madam Speaker. And Madam Speaker, if 2021 was not successful enough, in 2022, farmers planted 36,000 acres and harvested over 55 million pounds, allowing Belize, for the first time in the history, to export soybean meal to the Caribbean countries and to Guatemala. That, Madam Speaker, only occurs under the PUP. This, Madam Speaker, has caused serious investments, serious investments in the processing of soybean. $25 million investment occurred in a soybean oil refinery and is about to be completed in the Cayo district. That will be completed by July of this year, Madam Speaker, by this, by this year, July in this year. Belize will have its first refinery of soybean oil. It means, Madam Speaker, that now the consumers will see the soybean oil on the shelves in the stores, made in Belize, produced in Belize. The processing capacity of the plant is 12 tons per day. Belize currently extrudes about five to eight tons of soybean per day. So the plant is well equipped to do what we have and there's room for expansion, Madam Speaker. The government of Belize supported the soybean oil refinery by providing duty exemption on the processing equipment. Similarly, similarly, duty exemption support was given to another soybean plant in Blue Creek. They, is a, this is a state-of-the-art soybean meal that uses the solvent extraction method to get all the oil out of soybean efficiently. And again, that oil will be channeled to Spanish Lakota, where it will be processed, where it will be, where it will be refined and put on the shelves for Belizean consumers. So, Madam Speaker, 
No longer will the farmers need to import soybean meal. No longer will the consumers need to import cheap oil from other sources. The oil is going to be produced in Belize. That's a savings, Madam Speaker, of 50 million Belize dollars in foreign exchange. So we will save 25 million US dollars in foreign exchange. Turning to shrimp, Madam Speaker, the shrimp industry was 90, 90 million dollars in 2014. It is now on the verge of a rebound after being decimated by the early mortality syndrome disease. Production fell from 16 million pounds in 2014 to a low of one and a half million pounds during the 2016-2020 period. In 2021, production reached its lowest of 1.1 million pounds. However, in 2022, production rose to 1.9 million pounds. And with the new investments, the use of superior resistant genetics and the application of intensive technology, Madam Speaker, our projected, our projected amount is going to be 3.2 million pounds in 2023. Madam Speaker, shrimp is on the rebound, especially now with the exports to Mexico. This is going to increase. We have found, Madam Speaker, the solution to the problem of shrimp in the South. It is going to begin. And the important thing about the shrimp industry, Madam Speaker, is that women are employed in the processing facilities. And that is an important aspect of rebuilding this industry. Madam Speaker, at this time, there are seven shrimp farms that are still in operation and three processing plants remain operational. The Shrimp Industry Task Force was formed and this includes the key stakeholders in industry that have come up with recommendations to continue expanding the industry. Madam Speaker, Another success story is that of the dairy industry. It is no secret that the lack of support for processing and adding value to locally produced milk has been affected by past policies that support the importation of cheaper, heavily subsidized dairy products. Madam Speaker, one of the products that's mostly subsidized across the world are dairy products. And Belize imported millions and millions and millions of subsidized milk into the country. Many times, Madam Speaker, under the previous government, these importations did not even pay GST, competing with the local milk who was subject to all the taxes. So, Madam Speaker, under the PUP, we changed that policy. The importation of contraband goods, particularly pasteurized milk and ice cream, also affected market access for locally produced dairy products. In fact, for over a decade, Madam Speaker, the importer of assorted milk was not paying even GST, even though, by law, GST ought to have been collected. And this resulted in significant loss of revenues to government as well that further stagnated the dairy sector in Belize. Madam Speaker, milk is stored best in the form of cheese. And so when the local milk could not be sold, it was converted to cheese. And therefore there were containers and containers of cheese stacked, unable to sell because of cheap imported subsidized milk and cheese products on the market. We put an end to that, Madam Speaker. Lessons learned, Madam Speaker, 
during the COVID-19, and thanks to the government that has a farm-to-table approach, Plan believes outlined that we must consume more of what we grow and grow more of what we consume. Madam Speaker, new investments have been made that has facilitated the processing of UHT milk. Now, no longer, Madam Speaker, will you go to the refrigerator and buy a gallon of milk, and the next day, it's not good. That has ended, Madam Speaker. The UHT technology now used is the milk can last on the shelf for 90 days. That, Madam Speaker, occurred under the PUP, because we again allowed the importation of equipment duty-free, creating an environment for the private sector to invest. And therefore, Madam Speaker, the dairy industry is growing across this country. Growing so much, Madam Speaker, that now we are, we are trying to access the CARICOM market with our dairy products. Madam Speaker, earlier, my colleague, member for Toledo West, mentioned Big Fars Rice. In 2016, the Big Fars rice mill was ordered, shut, closed down, closing the door of opportunity to small farmers in Toledo. Since we won, we have been working on a plan to bring back to bring back the Big Fars mill. And on 17th of March, Madam Speaker, we launch the Big Fars brand rice. Rice grown by small farmers in Toledo. And so, Madam Speaker, we expect the rice industry to grow in the south. This year's milling started two weeks ago. And our Big Fars package will be available countrywide. 850,000 pounds of paddy with a value of $340,000. All paid to small farmers, Madam Speaker. This season, we had 60 farmers delivering to the mill. This year, we have now registered 130 mill per farmers. And that, Madam Speaker, are farmers that will benefit so that they can feed their children, they can clothe their children, and they can pay their medical bills, Madam Speaker. This is a step in the right direction and a step well taken under plan, Belize. We are working, Madam Speaker, with 15 mechanized farmers right now. And in the near future, as this expands, we will again, we will again involve mechanized, uh, mechanized services for the farmers of Toledo. Carefully, we have, to, we have to tread carefully. We do not want this to get out of hand and not able to control. It has to be done carefully. It has to be planned carefully so that we don't oversupply and we don't create a culture of dependency that the government will do everything. The government is supporting the farmers, but we will do it in a responsible manner. Madam Speaker, in the past, there was, we used to produce 8 million pounds of rice in Toledo. It went as low as 260,000. There were only two farmers. The interest that government has taken in the rice industry in the South has been tremendous, and lives have been changed. Lives have been improved by once again restarting the rice industry in the South. Madam Speaker, the main improvements are these. We increased the price from 29 cents to 40 cents per pound of paddy. It's a 38 percent increase. The payment plan has changed. Milpa rice farmers We'll be getting 100% on delivery. And the mechanized rice will get 60% on delivery and 40% on the first week of December. We upgrade, we have an upgrade on the bill. For example, we are converting our scale to a digital scale, more accurate. We are rebranding the packages with new designs and a revived marketing strategy for the big false rice. All of these, Madam Speaker, were the result of an intensive consultation process with farmers. Their needs have made farmers, their needs have made farmers renewed interest and investments in the once flourishing industry. In short, in short, this coming 2023, crop promises to be even greater. 
the projection will be 1.6 million pounds of rice paddy. Madam Speaker, this will definitely improve the livelihoods of the small farmers in the Toledo district. I want to assure the House that our agri-food strategy and action program are sound technically and economically in that they are based on strengthening our agri-food value chains in terms of one, modernizing and enabling legislative policy and regulatory environment, developing our human capital resource, ensuring investment in appropriate technology, improving our infrastructure for production, transport processing and marketing, and analyzing the economic and financial constraints and solutions that can enhance the profitability and financial sustainability. Madam Speaker, by working together, we can deliver results for our sector. And our field teams are demonstrating this with concrete outcomes, concrete outcomes and impact. Madam Speaker, the Ministry of Agriculture has in its management a large number of projects all geared towards small farmers. Breeding sheep and goat, honey production and development, covered structures, climate resilient and sustainable projects, rural resilient release program, a follow-up cooperation for training on development in agriculture cooperatives, Belize agriculture sector policy with focus on seed, sustainable development of resilient village councils, Sembrando Vida, digital agriculture services, and more, Madam Speaker. All this, Madam Speaker, all this is definitely going to impact the lives of the rural community. In concluding, Madam Speaker, allow me to express my greatest appreciation to Prime Minister Bresenio and Cabinet colleagues for appreciating the critical role of the agro-food sector for national building. Also, the loyal opposition, those on that side, for seemingly, seemingly showing some sign, some sign of support for what we do in our ministry. Our collaborators and beneficiaries in their productive sectors, the people, and especially the voters of Orindra South constituency, the private sector stakeholders, the banks, the credit unions, and local investors, our Belizean processors, consumers, and exporters, and our international partners and donors. Madam Speaker, with all these on board, and with God on our side, we will succeed and we will deliver for Plan Belize. I thank you. I recognize the member for Fort George. Good afternoon, Madam Speaker. And good afternoon to all the Fort George supporters, POP supporters, members of the public in the gallery. It's good to see you guys. Dan Grigger is also here in the house. Madam Speaker, this feels like day two of the La Ruta Maya, and I have to congratulate you for overseeing this um, three-day marathon of a house debate. So congratulations on that. Madam Speaker, I rise to give my contribution on behalf of the bold and wonderful people of the Fort George constituency to the draft estimates for revenue and expenditure for fiscal year 2023-2024. I ask your indulgence as per Standing Order 35-6 to read from my notes. Madam Speaker, this is my third budget debate since being elected on November 11, 2020. And as always, I give thanks to the Almighty and I am guided by the great leaders of the past, the examples they set, and the lessons they imparted. 
None more so, Madam Speaker, than the father of the nation, the Right Honorable George Price, who, more than 50 years ago, in the pages of the Belize Times newspaper, wrote two articles, the first entitled, One People, One Nation, and the second, The People Must Benefit. In the first article, he explained that the people as a whole are the true builders of the nation, and a nation exists to make better their lives, and especially to satisfy their basic needs. In the second, Mr. Price continued, it would not only be unjust, but it would go against the march of history if the few would reap all the fruits of the people's accomplishments. This present government will not be put in a role of creating and perpetuating the dominance of a small elite class over the majority. The people are the reality of national greatness. Madam Speaker, this was before independence. But today, in 2023, led by Prime Minister the Honorable John Bersenio, the government of the People's United Party is living the mantra that the people must benefit. The budget entitled Delivering on Plan Belize will help to transform Belize to a more inclusive and sustainable country, leading to prosperity for all. As the Prime Minister said in his budget presentation two weeks ago, there is no duty more inviolable than the management of the public purse. The people expect those they elect to allocate these monies wisely and those in the public service to spend these monies carefully. As the Minister of the Public Service, I extend my gratitude to all our public officers. Public service is not the most glamorous of jobs, nor a profitable line of work, but it is one of the most important. Public officers, you are the face of the government. You provide direct interaction with our citizens. Your daily work is the fuel for the government engine and keeps democracy alive. Yes, Madam Speaker, it is an honor and a privilege to serve the people, and each of, the, each of us in this honorable house has a duty to get up each day and work to the best of our ability for the benefit of the Belizean people. At the very least, it is owed to the people who elect you to show up to house meetings. It has been highlighted before, Madam Speaker, but it is a national disgrace that there is an absentee representative who continues to collect a salary paid by the Belizean people. This member has been absent so long from her parliamentary seat that this seat has become a bug for the stand for the member of Albert. The Prime Minister implored all of us to reduce the waste and minimize the expenses wherever possible. Well, PM, as Minister of Finance, you can start by eliminating the salary of the member from Queen Square. And Madam Speaker, since I'm on the subject of the opposition, allow me to say a few words about the Leader of the Opposition's pathetic reply yesterday. My colleagues have already rubbished his rumblings, but Madam Speaker, it is becoming more and more apparent that the member from Mesopotamia has jumped into the deep end of the pool and does not know how to swim. He is splashing and kicking, and obviously nobody on his side is going to try to help him. He vacillates from issue to issue, falsifies numbers and statistics. These numbers and statistics can easily be verified, mind you, and flip-flops on positions. So desperate to keep his visa, he mounts attacks on nations friendly to Belize, yet embraces corruption in his own party to maintain his leadership status. Caution, member. Caution. Guided, Madam Speaker. In the past, he tried to distance himself from his father's administration. He did so again yesterday. But he was also forced to admit that he was benefiting from the public trough. And as I said last year, sucking from the spigot of power. Yes, Madam Speaker, all the members on the other side either sat around the table or were on the periphery of the table as the country sank into financial ruin, turning a blind eye to the pain and suffering caused by the misdeeds and corruption and national robbery of the past administration. But Madam Speaker, the leader of the opposition made bold statements before yesterday 
that he was going to present an alternative budget, a better way. Well, the country is still waiting. It was all a show, a trick, a sham. Remember, he has boasted that he's an entertainer, so maybe it's all smoke and mirrors, done for the benefit, one assumes, of his entertainer friends in the US. Maybe he's just living a fairy tale. Yesterday, he mentioned Waterloo on several occasions. I wonder why. Or maybe Delroy can tell us why. It reminds me, Madam Speaker, of the story of a UDP politician. I promise, Madam Speaker, this is the last comment on this. This Keep UDP it within politician. The Keep it within the Ardans. Of course, Madam Speaker, of course. This UDP politician was a flashy, smooth talking, braggadocio, just like the leader of opposition. He wore brand name clothes, drove the latest car, had the best phone. Now, this was a few years ago, so it wasn't an iPhone. It was probably a Motorola Razor, one of those things there. Anyway, he drives into a village with his entourage as the big man. He brings the villagers together and tells them to name anything they want, and they would get it. The first villager raised his hand. Well, we don't have a water system. So this man, this UDP politician, pulls out his phone, calls somebody. Yes, we need a water system in this village right away. No, man, I said right away. Okay. Second villager raises her hand. Well, we need some farmland. Takes out his phone and calls again. What, Minister Lands, we need some farmland for this village immediately. Yes, you heard me, immediately. Good. The third villager raises his hand. Well, the thing we want the most, and the thing we have never been able to get in this village, is cell phone service. So I don't know who you're calling on that cell phone right now. You see, Madam Speaker, it was all a show. It was all a trick. It was all a sham, just like the leader of the opposition. That's the behavior of the UDP. And that politician was kicked out of that village, same way the UDP is going to kick the leader of the opposition from that leadership seat very soon. Madam Speaker, turning back to the budget, it has been quite a remarkable year for Belize. The economic recovery undertaken by this PUP administration, working closely with our social partners and the people of Belize, is unparalleled in the region and has outperformed even the most optimistic forecasts. The alphabet collection of IFIs, the IMF, the CDB, the MCC, they are all saying that GOB is exhibiting the kind of fiscal responsibility and prudence that has led to a recovery. A recovery, Madam Speaker, that the former Prime Minister said could never be done. The UDP gave up. They threw in the towel. They bankrupted the country and tried to wash their hands of the numerous fiscal sins they committed while in office. You see, Madam Speaker, facts are very stubborn things. It is important that we collect as much data as possible so that as policymakers, we can make data-driven decisions. This data is not conjured up or fabricated as the leader of the opposition has done now on more than one occasion doubling down yesterday with fiction and fantasy. The information is coming from reputable sources, the Central Bank of Belize, the Statistical Institute of Belize, and using internationally certified methodology. So let's look at some of the statistical facts that the opposition can never counter. One, all indicators reveal that Belize was in a prolonged recession under the UDP. Real GDP per capita was on a steady decline since 2015 and fell sharply in 2020 to levels not seen since 1992. They went back in time. Even with all the Petro-Caribbean BNE dollars, the economy contracted under the UDP three years and never experienced more than 4.5 percent growth. In 2020, there was a severe contraction of 13.4 percent. Under the PUP, the economy is growing, expanding in 2022 by an estimated 12.4 percent, added to the growth rate of 2021, 15.1 percent. This is over 25 percent growth in just two years. Number two, when the PUP took office, the actual downturn 
in the economy, sorry, the actual outturn in the economy revealed a primary deficit of 10.81% and an overall deficit of 12.82%. Fast forward two years and the projected outturn for 2022-2023 is for a primary surplus of 1.20% and a manageable overall deficit of 0.60%. A clear signal of Belize's fiscal strength. Three, debt to GDP had climbed to an alarming 133% under Dean Barrow's reckless incompetence. Imagine, it took 27 years, from 1981 to 2008, six administrations, three different prime ministers to reach a debt of $2 billion. It took Dean Barrow alone to double that to $4 billion. The domestic debt alone increased from 333 million in 2008 to 1.3 billion in 2020. Pre-pandemic borrow was borrowing $143 million per year from domestic sources, 2.75 million per week. And with the onset of COVID, because he had not built up any reserves or planned for any contingencies, borrow had to incur borrowing of $1 million per day effectively just printing money from the central bank and saddling the country with very expensive credit. In contrast, this PUP government through its public debt management has reduced the amount owed by the people of Belize by over $1 billion. Blue bond savings, $630 million, Petro-Carib savings, $326 million, and legal damages avoided, legal damages caused by Dean Barrow, $78 million. As a result, the debt to GDP ratio now stands at 64.1%, reduced by more than half in just two years. Those facts cannot be denied. Number four, let's do the unemployment numbers. At no time under the UDP had the unemployment rate go below 6.6%. Pre-COVID unemployment was actually steadily growing and then, of course, soared to 29.6%. Two years later, the latest unemployment figure is at 5%, a remarkable recovery for our jobs market. Add to that the increase in the minimum wage to $5 per hour, benefiting almost 43,000 workers with a 51% increase in their per hour salary. Five. In 2020, the UDP left an overdraft at the Central Bank of Belize of close to $100 million. Again, through prudent fiscal debt management, the overdraft was cleared, and the deposit at the Central Bank, at the Central Bank reached close to $100 million, a $200 million turnaround. The gross official reserves at the end of 2022 was at $960 million, with import cover easily exceeding the three-month recommendation. Last year, I spoke about the three R's, rescue, recover, reposition. It took this government over a year to rescue the Belizean economy from the doldrums it was in. The last half year, we have seen the recovery progress. Now, it's time to reposition the economy for the global realities of 2023 and beyond. Many issues are outside of Belize's control and can cause shocks to our small and vulnerable economy. Extreme climate events. The latest, of course, was Hurricane Lisa, which caused over 200 million in damages. But we also are experiencing freak storms and the ever-worsening Sargassum scourge. Two, pandemics. I was reminded that it was exactly three years ago, March 23, 2020, that most of the world went into lockdown. All of us know persons who lost their lives because of COVID. We miss our brother, David Dido Vega, and are grateful to his sister, the Honorable Elvia, for taking up the mantle to serve the people of Corozal Bay. We are grateful to the Ministry of Health, led first by the Honorable Michelle Shabbat, and now by the Honorable Kevin Bernard, for prioritizing the vaccine rollout and for encouraging healthy living. We can never take it for granted, as the next pandemic could be right around the corner. Three, high global inflation. Just as how Belize imports most of its goods, we also import inflation from our major trading partners. 
Global inflation reached 8.8% in 2022, while in Belize it increased to 6.3%. While inflation is forecasted to slow down in 2023, we have to be mindful that prices tend to be sticky. Once they go up, they very rarely go down. Added to this were supply chain disruptions causing demand to far exceed supply, again adding to the price increases. Now, there is a possible international banking crisis. We have to monitor that one. All of these have been encountered by the government in a type of multi-pronged onslaught that has had to be defended against and mitigated. This is real, and it was affecting the present, causing the cost of fuel to skyrocket, the price of goods on the shelves to go up almost overnight, resulting in our people not being able to access basic commodities. Unfortunately, the situation was exacerbated by unscrupulous merchants who engaged in price gouging. Government is clamping down on these gougers through stronger legislation and enforcement and by partnering, partnering with public officers and private citizens to be special price constables. Of course, the price of fuel continues to be high, but another supply side measure that the government undertook was to forego an average of $3 million per month in fuel taxes to stabilize the price at the pump. Madam Speaker, I have highlighted the policy decisions of the government over the last two years, and have made the future, these decisions have made the future more sustainable. But while we are being architects of tomorrow, we must always address the needs of today. We can't speak to a hungry person about the future when he or she is struggling in the present. Prime Minister John Bresenio has spoken about the Belizean Bill of Rights, as highlighted in Plan Belize setting out the roadmap to development, prosperity, and peace for all Belizeans. As explained in that document, it requires nothing less than a fundamental reorganization of the economy around the values of social justice and equity. The vision that drives the PUP is to create an environment in which every Belizean enjoys as their right and in a meaningful way the following opportunities. One, Every Belizean should have an opportunity to go to school and be educated and trained with relevant skills. Personal success starts with a good education. We have a saying in Fort George, your skills pay your bills. That is very true. We are all endowed by our creator with certain skills and attributes, academic, vocational, artistic. What we may need is help in harnessing that skill into an income that indeed the skill will pay the bill. A priority area in this budget is an additional $4 million to expand the free education program to schools in the south side of Belize City and in the Toledo District. I was recently in Cuba and had a chance to visit with some of our students there. I am proud of each of them for their hard work, their dedication, their patriotism, their willingness and eagerness to come back to Belize and serve. Two. Every Belizean should have access to adequate health care, including timely access to quality primary health care. Everyone must be healthy in order to produce. Government just announced the rollout of national health insurance to the Orange Walk District. The goal is coverage for all Belizeans. Over the years, we have seen millions of dollars lost to failed investments and misadventures. We need to invest in basic health services for all. Number three. Every Belizean should have access to a piece of land. With land, one immediately has a valuable base to create opportunities for empowerment and personal growth. It was announced by the Prime Minister and the Minister of Lands that 11,000 lots were being subdivided and being made available for first-time landowners. If you are one of those who receives one of these properties, hold on to it, invest in it, don't sell it. Land is a precious commodity and it saddens me that so much of Belize's prime real estate is now in the hands of foreigners. Four, every Belizean should have access to decent housing. A home breeds stability, family, and love, and is essential for nurturing and developing our children. So far, the government has built almost 250 houses. 
We have to continue to build and partner with local developers to increase the housing stock. In Fort George, we have turned over the keys to nine houses, and at each handing over, I am as excited as the new homeowner. I certainly want to thank the team at the Ministry of Housing, Minister Julius Espat, CEO Victor Espat, Marissa, Sheena, and all the others for the job they are doing. And of course, on behalf of my family, I would also like to extend my condolences to Julius and his family on the passing of his mother, a strong, amazing Belizean woman. Five, every Belizean should have access to employment, J-O-B, job, that is a driving force for personal growth and development, and a basis for promoting self-esteem and human dignity. There were two big developments in the job sector this year. First, the increase in the minimum wage to $5 per hour, and second, an amendment to the fiscal incentives legislation so that medium, small, and micro enterprises, MSME, can benefit from tax breaks to allow their businesses to get off the ground, become competitive, and hopefully expand to hire more people. I need to acknowledge the work being done by the Ministry of Investment and by Bell Trade. Both foreign direct investment and local investment is on the rise. There was a $100 million increase in private sector borrowing this last fiscal year, mostly in mercantile trade, agriculture, and transport. This signals a renewed confidence in the Belizean economy and will lead to more job creation. So to recap, the five fundamental pillars, the Belizean Bill of Rights, upon which our economy must be built, are one, education, two, health, three, land, four, housing, and five, jobs. In addition, earlier this year, the Prime Minister shared with stakeholders and the Belizean public Belize's medium-term development strategy, which lists 224 programs and projects to address six cornerstones, poverty reduction, economic transformation and growth, trade deficit reduction, citizen security, protection of the environment, and stopping corruption. Madam Speaker, in these 224 programs and projects, the Belizean people must benefit. The decisions we make must benefit the people, and as my wise senior secretary reminded me yesterday, Ms. Christine Hyde, these decisions must be explained to the people. We have to do a better job of communicating, of allowing the citizens to participate in this democracy. And the only way they can participate is if they are informed. Let me just briefly comment on the additional $5 million that is being allocated to recruit 225 more police, 110 BDF, and 60 Coast Guard. I have huge respect for the women and men who serve in our security services. I was brought up in a family where duty to Belize was programmed into our DNA. While I chose an easier path, though the political battlefield can be just as dangerous, I have siblings who serve this country with patriotism and honor. I am proud of each of them and of their brothers and sisters in arms. And let me put in a plug for Fort George Strong Erlin Teol who topped the recruitment class of uh, 95. I know Derwin and Candy are very proud of this young man. Public officers must also benefit, Madam Speaker. As I said earlier, they are the fuel for the government engine, the frontline soldiers. Of the five-part economic recovery plan, the most difficult was the salary adjustment and increment freeze. I want to thank all public officers, nurses, teachers, police, soldiers, clerks, admin officers, finance officers, all the women and men who, make, who made a sacrifice for the common good. What was achieved on the debt restructuring side would not have been possible without your sacrifice. A few weeks ago, the ministerial team continued the dialogue with the joint union negotiating team. A number of issues were discussed. Principal among them, was the unfreezing of increments. I was glad that the Prime Minister had informed that the unfreezing could happen this year, and the only matter was determining the date. We started with September 1st, then July 1st, and finally, thankfully, April 1st. Believe me, it was a more difficult negotiation with the Ministry of Finance to get to April 1st. 
but I believe that this date is the best date and the most fair date. And for the avoidance of doubt, the increment that will be applied this year on your increment day is for performance during fiscal year 2022-2023. There was some confusion about public officers who received increment April 1st, 2020 for fiscal year 2019-2020. The increment freeze under the previous administration. Yes, Mr. Leader of the Opposition, the UDP did implement an increment freeze and announced that increment freeze on May 1st to take effect on May 1st. So there were some public officers who weren't affected until 2021. But we agreed with the joint union team to discuss these increments, including this particular anom anomaly, going forward, so that some compensation may be possible in future fiscal years. And of course, this has to be based on the continued good performance of the economy. Another major issue discussed and agreed upon is pension reform, a topic that has belabored consecutive administrations for over 25 years. It is a major accomplishment that finally we have a way forward, including the July 1st date for new cohorts or entrants into the public service to be part of this new plan. There are three areas on the pension reform, the retirement age, the contribution rate, and the replacement rate. Belize has one of the lowest retirement ages in the region and the world. As the Prime Minister highlighted, Caribbean countries with special pension plans have retirement ages of 60 in the case of Trinidad, 65 in the case of Jamaica, Barbados, Antigua. Most public officers will tell you that they still have plenty to offer at 55 and are willing to continue in service employment. Second, the contribution rate by public officers is currently zero. Pension is paid from the Consolidated Revenue Fund, and this year was at $97 million. If it continues on this non-contributory track, it is projected to reach $150 million in the next 25 to 30 years. The union team recognized this, and so have agreed to look at a phased-in approach to a contribution rate. The proposal is 10% of wages, half from employer, half from employee. But this will still be discussed. Third, the replacement rate, or the percentage of the last salary received, the last salary received when you retire. In the Caribbean, that rate is 67%. It's the same in Belize. So if a public officer's last salary was $2,100 per month, then the pension would be 67% of that, or approximately $1,400 per month. However, in Belize, public officers are also part of the Social Security Pension Plan, which has a replacement rate of 27%. Public officers in the region do not benefit from their Social Security Pension Plan. So the effective replacement rate for Belize's public officers was actually 67 plus 27, 94% when you combine the two, making Belize an extreme outlier. Using the same $2,100 salary, the combined replacement rate would be $1,974. The proposal then is to reduce the GOB pension replacement rate to 50%. Combined with the 27% from Social Security, Belize would still have the highest at 77%. Of course, special consideration must be given to the BDF soldiers and officers who, do, who don't form part of the Social Security Plan. I believe it is high time that they are part of that Social Security Pension Plan. Madam Speaker, the discussions with the joint union team have been very instructive for the overall goal of public sector reform. We have agreed that, reven that the Revenue Enhancement and Cost Saving Committees would be re-established. We also have to look at tax reform to make sure that the tax landscape is fair. We need to look at the PAYE system to see how the burden can be eased. And we have to make sure that the tax dodgers and evaders are brought to justice. Madam Speaker, the government of Belize can only carry out its policies if there is an effective and efficient public service. When the Prime Minister asked me to take on this challenge, I found a public service that was politicized and demoralized. 
Many public officers were clocking in or checking out. There was no accountability for inefficient work or consequences for bad behavior. But Madam Speaker, in just two years, and led by an incredible team, the super majority of whom I'm proud to say are women, in the last two years, we have engaged, we have trained, we have professionalized the public service and brought back a sense of work ethic. We are living up to our mission statement to establish, manage, and promote sound human resource management, good governance, free and fair electoral administration and service excellence through innovation and reform for a modernized Belize public service. This would not have happened without the leadership of the CEO, Mr. Rolando Zetina. Today is actually his birthday, Madam Speaker, so allow me to wish Zet a blessed, urge strong, a blessed birthday today. I hope wherever he is, he's enjoying himself. He's not in the gallery. Over the past year, and in line with Plan Belize, a number of accomplishments have been made by the various units. Allow me to just share a few. And I asked the units, Madam Speaker, to put together their accomplishments, and they gave me a whole book. So you can show you how the hard work that has been going on in the public service. And I'll just highlight a few. From the Accounts and Finance Unit, Madam Speaker, led by Mrs. Sonia Pat, the continuous assistance and work being done by this particular unit, by the finance officers in that unit, is incredible. They assist the wider public service relating to payment of transfer grants, or including allowance, financial assistance, rental of office space, etc. This is an addition to their duties in the ministry. In 2022, they brought back the summer intern program, which I know a lot of our young students benefited from in school throughout the ministries. Rental expenditure, rental of dwelling quarters, these are all part of the duties of the Accounts and Finance Unit, Madam Speaker. And let me highlight something that the member from Albert brought up earlier in her presentation, where she spoke about an increase in allowances. Well, Madam Speaker, it's a very simple answer. Allowances were grouped together. If you looked at previous budgets, the allowances were spread out in different cost centers. So now they were put together, and that is why you're seeing an increase going forward. And this was after a recommendation made from the Ministry of Finance. So it was just a red herring, a red flag that, uh, remember from Albert tried to raise, Madam Speaker, but it really had no merit. In addition, we're looking at an increase in wages. Why? Because our public officers are now benefiting from the $5 minimum wage, Madam Speaker. And that is the reason why we're seeing an increase in a lot of these car centers. The $5 minimum wage has been applied. The Employee Assistance Program, Madam Speaker, this is something that benefits our public officers. They continue to work diligently in providing confidential and effective services to all our public officers. The EAP plays important focus on looking at the wellness and well-being of employees to ensure productivity and creating a work-life balance. This program has successfully increased the number of doctors or counselors to the program, increased the number of sessions. They have more persons benefiting from the, person, from the program. They are working with other ministries. They are making sure to remarket the EAP to make sure that they understand that this is not a punitive tool. This is not a punishment for public officers. This is a place where they can get the necessary help that they may need. So led by Ms. Caetano, the EAP is certainly um, assisting a lot of our public officers, Madam Speaker. The other unit, the Human Resource Management Information System, or HERMIS. The HERMIS is operated by the ministry and represents a tool for the government of Belize's human resource management. It acts as a central repository of HR information for all categories of employees across the Belize Public Service. Its main function is to facilitate quick access to relevant HR information to increase efficiency, effectiveness, and transparency in decision making. For the past fiscal year, the following was accom were accomplished by, the, by this unit. Development of the Public Service Leave Management System. In June 2022, the Hermes Unit and the E-Governance Department and Digitization Unit started discussion to automate the management of vacation and sick leave across the public service. This system will be the first of its kind. 
to be introduced across the public service and will be managed by this ministry. The aim is to support the efficient allocation of human resources, compliance with public service regulations and labor laws, improve reporting and informed decision making, minimize data errors, reduce costs and paperwork, and increase employee satisfaction and commitment. This program, Madam Speaker, is endorsed by Cabinet, and we hope to see the rollout very soon. Second, the job search and employment application website, which was launched in 2021. This is continuously being improved. It is now recognized as the main tool for recruitment in the public service. Using its chat feature, job seekers have direct access to personnel within the Hermes Department for assistance. To date, we, had, we have had 4,692 registered users. 96 vacancies have been advertised on the site. 1,413 persons have created their electronic resumes, and 1,484 job applications have been submitted. Turning now to the unit called Job Classification and Compensation. This unit is tasked with the responsibility for developing, maintaining, and managing the job classification and compensation system for the Belize Public Service. For this past fiscal year, this unit conducted organizational development review for a number of ministries. This review designs current organizational charts, critiquing the weaknesses within the structures and proposing new designs, rectifying these weaknesses. It designs both current and proposed organizational charts chart, a, a span of control, clearing reporting relationships and career path, develops standardized job descriptions, sets the authorized number of job positions within the department or ministry, prepares a report linking each ministry's mission to the organizational design, and conducts ongoing discussion with the, with the particular ministry or department. The ministries that have been reviewed during this past fiscal year include the Ministry of Human Development, Families and Indigenous Peoples Affairs, the Ministry of Economic Development and Investment, the Ministry of Youth, Sports and Transport, the Office of the Governor General, the Department of Bureau of Standards, and the Ministry of Health and Wellness. I have to pay particular or mention particular the Ministry of Health and Wellness. This ministry is a very large ministry, and the CEO who recently walked in, CEO Dr. Sabido, he has been very instrumental in working with the Ministry of the Public Service to make sure that we understand exactly the organizational chart that the particular Ministry of Health. So, Minister, we hope that with the help of the Job Classification Unit, your ministry is able to carry out its HR functions better. Turning now to the Elections and Boundaries Department. The Village Council Act was amended last year before the Village Council, and we had a total of 190 villages going to Village Council elections between May and June of 2022. In addition to that, there were some villages that we had to conduct uh, by elections because persons had stepped down. Voter registration continues. Voter transfer period, of course, is July and August. The, ministry, the department continues its community outreach. It visited Kikaka to conduct voter registration, transfer of electors, distribution of ID cards, etc. The task that has taken up much of its time over the last few months, Madam Speaker, has been the redistricting exercise. The task force appointed by the Elections and Boundaries Commission continues with its review of electoral boundaries in accordance with the terms of reference issued by the Election and Boundaries Commission. Weekly meetings and field work continues to ensure that a draft report, which must be submitted by July of this year and must be proposed to the National Assembly. In addition, the Election and Boundaries Department continues to support the Ministry of Local Government in the municipal re the what do you call it, Minister? Delineation exercise, all right, thanks for that. I wasn't sure what you, how you were referring to it, because it, it seems to change names frequently. Turning now to the Training and Development Unit. The Training and Development Unit is one of the units that I have tasked with the most to get done. Why? Because I felt that the public service, the public officers on a whole were not receiving the proper training that they needed. They were not getting the induction training. The secretarial training was years behind. We had to make sure that we continue to support this unit and that this unit carries out its function. Well, I'm happy to say that 
870 public officers have been trained in this fiscal year alone. The training unit, this includes secretaries one and two, and in clerks across the board that have gotten this type of training. The training unit has also completed the draft onboarding handbook for the Belize Public Service. One of the strategic goals for this ministry was the creation of an onboarding handbook for the Belize Public Service. This handbook is essential to guide inductors or inductees within each ministry to provide a warm welcome to each new entrant. The handbook is a guide and provides information and processes before the new entrant's arrival, the steps to inducting the new entrant during his or her first week, and the necessary actions to ensure the public officer performs at the highest level after the orientation period. In addition, the ministry signed an MOU with the University of Belize to collaborate on training and development opportunities for public officers. The unit has completed the pilot phase of the online induction training for the Belize Public Service with officers in the administrative grade and a senior management team on this new UB learning platform. The official online induction training for new entrants will be launching by mid-June this year. Completion of the comprehensive training needs assessment for the public service. And finally, the restructuring of the secretarial and clerical in service programs for the public service. Madam Speaker, the baby of the bunch is a good governance unit. And I turn to them right now and I see, I think it's the whole unit that is with us this afternoon. So welcome the good governance unit to this house meeting. The good governance unit, in addition to its everyday task, is also the Secretariat for the People's Constitution Commission. And it has worked very closely with the UNDP to onboard, to onboard the Secretariat and to work with the PCC. It was there and supporting for the inaugural launch and meetings of the PCC. It has conducted capacity building workshops with the PCC on the post-independence experience of constitutional reform in Belize, the pillars of the Belize Constitution, developing a strategic roadmap and work plan. The Good Governance Unit has begun to draft a user-friendly guide to understanding our Constitution, and I hope that that guide is ready very soon. It has begun the development of the online hub in which the citizens of Belize can go and participate in this exercise, and it has started its media rungs on the Secretariat and PCC. In addition, the Good Governance Unit is working with the UN Convention Against Corruption to make sure that Belize is compliant with UNCAP. It has worked with the up updating the country experts, reviewing Belize, and preparation for visit of said country experts later this year. Belize will also be conducting uh, reviews of other countries, including Antigua and Barbuda and Suriname. The Good Governance Unit also works with Mesisic, Mesisic, that's the OS um, anti-corruption agency, reporting to the 38th meeting of the Committee of Experts of the Mesisic on Belize's development and implementation of best practices of the OS anti-corruption convention. They also attended the most recent meeting in, in uh, Washington, D.C., and I'm sure that you will hear very soon about that. The Good Governance Unit is working with Transparency International to make sure that Belize is once again ranked on the Corruption Perception Index. These rankings are important for us, Madam Speaker, so that we know where we are and what we have to work on to make sure that we develop our country in the right way. And finally, the Good Governance Unit has been partnering with other ministries, with other departments, with e-governance, with the Economic Development Council of Belize, with Open Government Partnership, with Humana Belize, at the Accountability Lab, and the Love Foundation. Madam Speaker, these are only a few of all the achievements of the Ministry of the Public Service over the last fiscal year. And with the budget allocated this year, just over $20 million, the Ministry will continue to carry out its objectives. Madam Speaker, I turn now to the People's Constitution Commission. This commission was launched on November 14, 2022. It is a comprehensive review of Belize's constitution and it could only be done, as I mentioned at the launch, when the people of Belize were ready and it must be people-driven. In this, our 42nd year of independence, 
we believe that the people are ready, ready to take the next step in the decolonization process, ready to throw off the last vestiges of colonialism, ready to own our independence. I encourage all Belizeans to be engaged with this exercise. Read the Constitution, visit the social media platforms, attend the public consultations, and make your contributions. We have called the Commission the People's Constitution Commission because the end result will be a true people's constitution. Because even after the consultations, and even though the law does not require it, the government is committed to holding a referendum. So the final decision is with the people of Belize. Belizeans, I encourage you to write your future. Madam Speaker, of course, I can't end today without speaking about my beloved for judge. I stand today in this honorable house because of the outstanding people of Fort George. Strong, hardworking, dedicated women, men, and children who give me the energy, the love, of course, the fire to serve them each and every day. I had to fill some big shoes, Madam Speaker, figuratively speaking, of course, of the leader emeritus of Fort George, the General, the Right Honorable Said Musa, who celebrated his birthday this past weekend and who remains engaged in the lives of his beloved people and for George. I want to thank my cabinet colleagues for the assistance they have provided to Fort George. Deputy Prime Minister for the land titles already issued, Minister of Education for the school assistance, Minister of Human Development for the grocery bags, Minister of Housing for the starter homes, nine already and more being constructed. Minister of Investment for the assistance to small businesses through the MSME program. I also need to acknowledge the Mayor of Belize City, Mayor Bernard Wagner, for the support he has given to Fort George. We look forward to continued partnership with our municipal team. I have to congratulate our Fort George resident city councillor, Michael Goodin, who made the important step to further his education. We are looking forward to his return, and of course he has to do some pro bono attorney work in the Fort George division when he gets back. Well, PM said he has to go to Orange Walk Central too, so. In addition, we continue to utilize the Community Development Fund to repair homes, support small businesses, encourage sports and refurbish recreational areas. Madam Speaker, on November 1, 2022, Hurricane Lisa brought a lot of destruction to Fort George. She came with a serious punch, but the resilient residents were able to absorb it and bounce back. Thankfully, there was no loss of life, but property damage was widespread. 130 houses received damages that needed repairs. 45 received major damage, and 18 houses were completely destroyed. Working with the resources provided by the Ministry of Finance and partnering with NEMO, we provided some assistance to all the households affected. It was not nearly enough, Madam Speaker, but we did our best to make sure that everyone received some assistance. My hardworking committee, Molly, Carol, Andrew, Alex, Lisa, Nichelle, they were all on the ground every day. Isis, Naila, Fallon, Michelle, Lafay, Tricia, Penny, Scotty. And of course, we now call him Mr. Nemo, that's Dennis. They were on the ground every single day working to get the assistance out. And I have to thank them for going over time, for going above and beyond to make sure that our Fort George residents receive the necessary assistance after Hurricane Lisa. Driving around the city now, Madam, Madam Speaker, it's almost like there wasn't a hurricane five months ago. It's amazing, the work being done. And I have to thank all our partners, the BDF, uh, the cane farmers from Orange Walk who came in and assisted with the cleanup. There is so much more that needs to be done, and I pledge to do everything in my power to help. This upcoming year, we will work on some streets, starting with Pickstock Street and York Street. We will work with the Ministry of Natural Resources to identify and distribute more lots for residents, and we will continue to build houses. We have received a design, Madam Speaker, for a cost-effective apartment that we hope to replace in the Majestic Alley and in the Pickstock Hutment very soon. 
We continue to support residents with their needs, and we will expand the assistance to make sure the social safety net remains. In short, Madam Speaker, we have blazed the fire these two years, and what I promise now to the Fort George residents is more fire. Finally, Madam Speaker, the preamble to our Constitution says, whereas the people of Belize affirm that the nation of Belize shall be founded upon principles which acknowledge the supremacy of God, faith in human rights, and fundamental freedoms, the position of the family in a society of free men and free institutions, the dignity of the human person, and the equal and inalienable rights with which all members of the human family are endowed by their Creator. This is in the preamble, Madam Speaker. The evidence of God's grace is not only to be found in a stanza of our national anthem, but throughout the annals of our history. And our uniqueness as a nation is not to be defined only by the human symbols on our national flag, nor the flora, nor the fauna, but more importantly, evidence instead by the living testimony of our people who affirm this belief and aspire for peace and rule of law. In writing our future, four decades after our independence, it would be wise and prudent to adhere to these principles, these declarations of our identity enshrined in our constitution. The people are the reality of national greatness, Madam Speaker. The people must benefit. Long live our beautiful nation. Madam Speaker, the people of Fort George supports this budget. Thank you. I recognize the member for Orange Walk East. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, with your permission, I ask to refer to my notes, and I will ask the Prime Minister, to, as who has given us the opportunity to be in this house to debate for three days. I, I, I do have a lot to say today, and so bear with me. But of course, I want to actually, uh, Madam Speaker, acknowledge the presence of my CEO and uh, the Director of Hospital Services and Allied Health, and of course, my original East office staff who is here in support and our friends from the other divisions. Uh, good afternoon. Madam Speaker, I join with the rest of my colleagues to pay tribute to women of Belize, including my lovely wife, Wendy, and all the mothers who are the glue that binds our Belizean societies together. Is a voter for Angel Accent? Sure, I am too. <laughs> As the Minister of Health and Wellness, uh, I wish to especially pay tribute and say thank you to our nurses, a majority of whom are women. March is the month to single out the indispensable role of women in our society. And I can think of no better way to celebrate and say thank you than at this significant event in our legislative calendar. Madam Speaker, for the women of Belize, I stand here proudly in support of this budget for the fiscal year 2023-2024. I consider it a great privilege to be a part of this Brisenio administration, this PUP government, who together with the people has restored confidence, created jobs, protected our dollar, renewed our reputation internationally, and is building a better nation for our children. All of us on this side were at first amused, but then greatly disappointed in the performance of the leader of the position response to the budget speech. If nothing else, Madam Speaker, we would have thought that for once, he would have been brave enough to at least confess that from the dark days of COVID and from the lean days of record unemployment and record poverty, he could have looked at what we have done all together in this house and admit that yes, we have come a long way indeed. For those Belizeans who lost their jobs because of COVID, for those victimized by 13 years of a UDP administration, for those who lived 
in a time of an incompetent UDP administration rocked by scandal on top of scandal. This time, today, we can be confident again, Madam Speaker. We can be hopeful again because we are a nation on the rebound, not just from COVID, but also from the devastating epidemic that was the Barrow administration. For 13 years, the arrogance and the neglect ravaged our people. For 13 long years, save and except for their friends and family, ordinary Belizeans suffered. It's a pity they are not here to listen. The leader of the opposition spoke of the economic growth on 2019. What about 2017, when even with the petro Carib money in the millions, we suffered negative growth of negative 1.7%? What about 2018, when the economy only grew by 1.1%, Madam Speaker? The Honorable John Bersenio and this government in 2021 grew the Belizean economy by 15%. No UDP administration in 13 years ever saw growth in the economy by more than 4.5%. What they grew, however, was the national debt to 133% of GDP. So they borrowed more and yet our people suffered more. The leader of the opposition was talking about how people were better off under his father. What a joke. As my friend from Lekai, the member for Lekai mentioned, and as we all know, all is not perfect and will never be. Inflation is real. Cost of living is real. It affects each and every one of us, Madam Speaker, and just about every country in the world right now. But for his own purpose, the member for Mesopotamia behaves as if Belize is the only country in the world with inflation, and that this is the fault of this government. We have gotten to the point, Madam Speaker, where the best we can do is feel sorry for him. This budget, Madam Speaker, is real. It is as simple as that. It is tangible. For 13 years, we listened to budgets we could not even comprehend. As a people, we watched the nation approach bankruptcy, the economy on life support, industries dying, and yet the former prime minister would stand here for hours talking pretty fiction and fancy and fantasy. Pure fiction and fantasy. But I am proud to say that our Prime Minister, my Prime Minister, may not be that pretty talker, but he speaks the truth. In this budget, Madam Speaker, there is money placed where it matters. Health, education, citizen security, infrastructure, land, and housing. As a government, we have a plan and we are fulfilling that plan. Five more secondary schools getting free education under the Education Upliftment Program. More than 11,000 secondary students receiving financial assistance. 100 more homes for deserving families will be built. 11,000 lots to be surveyed across the country for first-time landowners. Madam Speaker, in 2019, before COVID, there were 1,500 1, sorry, Belizeans employed in the BPO sector. In 2022, Madam Speaker, there were 8,000 persons employed in that sector, thanks to this government. And that projection is that by 2023, there will be 12,000 persons employed in the BPO sector. That is tangible development. That is good governance. Frankly, Madam Speaker, uh, I said I wasn't going to waste my time when I was preparing my speech on the leader of the position. 
But after sitting in here yesterday, listening to him, it's obvious that he doesn't know and understand how to decide for a budget. That is why, Madam Speaker, consecutive speakers from this side have had to be correcting him in, the me in their messages. Exactly. No money to fight crime, he said. But he was looking in the wrong category. He talked about no money for maternal and child health. And if you, if you only look into the budget and really dig deep, you will understand that the, in the Ministry of Health, we are advancing on mater maternal and child health. The member for Mesopotamia, Madam Speaker, is truly an embarrassment to himself, his constituency, his party, and to this nation. For sure, the member from Freetown described his response perfectly when he said that he was telling a tale of fiction and fantasy that could only be woven in the mind of a had-been rapper in the search of relevance and credibility. Perhaps the leader of opposition would wish for Belizeans to forget, but I will make it my duty to remind him, his colleagues on the other side, and yes, the nation, that as that from his high perch by the sea, his rich, arrogant, self-righteous former leader and father told the nation how he grieves for his poor Belize, while at the same time saying, I will borrow till I cannot borrow no more. Who do they borrow for, Madam Speaker? While the COVID relief program sputtered, and while people died in the hospitals by the hundreds, friends and other family members of their, of those on that side, got richer and fatter. You can just look at the former Attorney General and you will figure. Caution, I'm cautioning you, member. Uh, uh, caution, I take the Please, caution, but the I'll language, speak the language. <laughs> Prime Minister, I'm going to ask you to strike that. 42B, there's a reason why. Please. Ma continue, continue, member. Madam Speaker, I, 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 as well, I was listening to the member for Albert. And the member for Albert stood up here trying to paint a picture of gloom and doom. But what she fails to say, Madam Speaker, because I notice she keeps going back to the plan Belize, why don't she say what they did with the petrochemical money? and the 600 million from oil revenues. Where was the member when a hundred million dollars were lost in slippage? She was right here sitting on the government side. Thankfully, she's coming in. Where was the member of Albert when the Brads was getting away with millions in tax breaks for Bolido? But you know what? I think it's, you know, she was the one who signed the sweetheart deal, Madam Speaker. Member, member, member. You need to, yeah, wait, wait, one second. No. What's the point of order? No, what's the point of order? She's a point of order. I'm on my feet. I am the one that will ask what is the point of order. I stood because I was not able to do that. Is there a, a point of order still or have we moved? Please, all I'm asking is the language. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, let me, let me also say that the people who sent me here in this honorable house did not send me here to be quiet. That's right. But sent me here to hold those same people over there accountable for the years of bad management. And I have no mood to give them no quarters. Madam Speaker, the member for Albert, again, spent a lot of time talking about wages for unestablished staff. He found in the Ministry of Health and Wellness was a wreckage a Ministry of Health 
and a health system that was falling to the very ground. We in the Ministry of Health under this administration have been able, and I will highlight those in my message as well, to turn things around. We had to be searching and hiring our people for, 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 for the technical people in the ministry. But Madam Speaker, when she talked about the increase in the wages for unestablished staff, they failed to point out the fact that it is this PUP government who has raised the minimum wage to $5, and it is so reflected in the budget. But what you fail to say, member, and I will show you, because you see why I had to go back to the 2020 and 2019 budget. You fail to realize and fail to say to this nation, because you get up here and talk about 5.9 million, and that we only had 950, what, what did you figure I said? 950 uh, administrative staff and 601. But let me tell this nation what is so. And it is their budget that they presented with less staff, with only 785 administrative staff and 551 unestablished staff. They budgeted $6.4 million in unestablished wages for wages for unestablished staff. And then come here in this house and pontificate and try to act as if that's something wrong we're doing. But I won't, I won't, Madam Speaker, get too much into. Exactly. I'm not, I'm not going to get too much into the member um, from Albert. I will back to my message. Again, I said, Madam Speaker, the leader of the position, when he was ranting up and down, jumping from here and there, incoherent in his message. Perhaps the leader of the position would wish for Belizeans to forget, as I mentioned. But today, I will not let them take away from, as our Prime Minister said, from the marvel and magic of our efforts, of our administration's success, for we are and we will continue to deliver on Plan Belize. <laughs> Madam Speaker, two years ago, while one man was grieving for Belize in front of the cameras, the Honorable John Bresenio and the rest of us on this side were preparing the work to bring Plan Belize to fruition. This was no fancy plan full of glitter. It was and is a solid, serious, people-centered framework to rebuild a nation. From imagining the possibilities to making it a reality today. Tough decisions were implemented after we run to rescue the nation that was failing and failing as was said, over the edge of the proverbial cliff. That's where you all took us. When we don't have the cliff the in sector when we first met him. In my ministry, for example, there were huge challenges. And yes, there still remain challenges because we can't fix it all overnight. But what we have achieved two years after the near death of the health system almost defies description. I know my colleagues on the other side are in glee whenever there is a union dispute in the area of health or when there are reports of a shortage. But let me clear up something for the benefit of those on the other side, Madam Speaker. We are still clearing up the mess that the borough administration left behind in the area of health. And let me also remind the honorable members on the other side that there still sit container loads of expired medication that they left there, almost $4 million in expired medication. That was the wastage and wreckage that the UDP administration left for this government. 
than talking about shortages. They created the mess. We, were, we are just trying to fix it, and we will fix this problem. Even the head of the PUC, PSU, who is certainly no PUP, tells stories of how the union was hoodwinked by Dean Barrow. Today, we are working to restore confidence, and we are making progress. We have stopped the fear, and once again, our unions know they need not be afraid to speak up and speak out. This is the difference we are all seeing now. They are also seeing that while progress cannot be overnight, but over time, progress is happening because this government is serious about improving the quality of our lives by improving our health system. Governance is serious business, Madam Speaker, and we keep working together. When the unions have concerns, we sit down and work out solutions with mutual respect. And I know, and, and again, he's not here, that the, the member from Mesopotamia gets excited when the unions start agitating. How disappointed the member from Mesop and those on the other side must be when there is a speedy and constructive resolution to those issues with our health providers. Madam Speaker, I now turn to a ministry at work. As I go through the achievements of the Ministry of Health and Wellness in this past fiscal year, I want to place on record my appreciation to the men and women who have worked with passion and commitment to make those achievements a reality. The fine women and men who work in our hospitals, clinics, health centers, in the offices and in the field are all dedicated professionals who are not only brave, but caring. Every day, Madam Speaker, they work tirelessly for the health and wellness of this nation, and I am honored to serve with them. I can report today, Madam Speaker, that as soon as we were able to shift focus away from COVID, we placed renewed energy on childhood vaccines. And we have seen the results of that campaign with a steady increase in children being vaccinated. Thanks to the dedicated work of our vector control teams, we have zero malaria cases. A WHO team is currently in the country, Madam Speaker, for veri verification in preparation for certification of Belize as a malaria-free country. In 2022, we saw the reduction in case fatality rate for COVID, a reduction in maternal mortality rate, a reduction in infant mortality rate, and an increase in meeting our HIV targets. My ministry, Madam Speaker, has been able to launch the adolescent policy to improve access to care and treatment for our young people. We have completed the nutrition policy, which will be launched next month with a focus on reducing access to sugary sweetened beverages to young people, as well as improving the management of chronic diseases. We reviewed the mental health policy and incorporated training for frontline healthcare workers as well as police officers in addressing and managing persons with mental illnesses. Madam Speaker, we have been able to make significant progress towards finalizing the cancer registry, which will be utilized by doctors and nurses in both private and public sector in order to strengthen data and information collected, therefore improving early detection and management of cancers. My ministry has been able to build capacity in numerous vital areas, including emergency management, triage and treatment, training of over 20 radiographers, as well as two radiologists to strengthen regional hospitals in imaging services, training of physicians 
and nurses in the management of HIV and TB, malaria management as well as management of other vector-borne illnesses and refresher training in management of diabetes, hypertension, supply chain management, and forecasting. I know for many, Madam Speaker, these mileposts may mean little, but they are critical to the health of our nation and a testament to the competence and dedication of those at the Ministry of Health and Wellness. In the area of research, Madam Speaker, in 2022, my ministry developed the framework of a new research unit registering the Institutional Review Board with the Office for Human Research Protections and completed revisions for the Belize Treatment Literacy Manual for HIV, STIs, and viral hepatitis. Recognizing the importance of improving quality of care, we at the Ministry of Health and Wellness have assigned medical officers exclusively to this function. Medical doctors assigned to quality of care have been placed at every single district in this country. This focus has already allowed for improvement in vital areas and maternal and child health, will, and will also be expanded throughout other key areas in health, Madam Speaker. Our quality improvement officers are dedicated to achieving better patient care, better patient experiences, and better health outcomes across our country. Madam Speaker, and in speaking about the Quality Improvement Program, which, as you know, was established in 2022 with the support from Salud Mesoamerica Initiative, the IDB, UNICEF, and PAHO, and the Embassy of Japan. Let me just give a quick little results in terms of maternal deaths in 2022. We had one in January, one in February, one in March, and one in June of 2022 who died at home. The last maternal death occurred in June of 2022, Madam Speaker. And I want to take this opportunity to publicly thank the dedicated Dr. Bear and her dedicated team for making sure that Belize has been heralded in terms of the QIP program. Today, I met with one of the consultants and he has said that Belize must be proud and we must ensure that our quality improvement program is developed further. And it's so, Madam Speaker, both myself and my CEO, we have said to our team and we have said to them that we are now going to action the development of a quality improvement policy and strategy which will be supported through the development of a national health care quality improvement committee. This, Madam Speaker, will also at some point require that we hire and train quality improvement officers in order for us to be successful in the other areas of health. In the area of medical management, Madam Speaker, and lab strengthening, in 2022, the ministry introduced testing for HPV, the human papilloma virus, and procured gene export machines for all health regions. This has allowed for COVID-19, HIV, viral load, and tuberculosis tests to be done at district level, decentralizing these critical tests in order to improve the efficiency of the health system and to deliver re reliable results at the regional level in a timely manner. No longer will patients have to wait weeks for lab results. A microbiology lab is about to be completed at the Western Regional Hospital, which is the first of its kind outside of Belize City. When we took office, Madam Speaker, we recognized that there was a shortage of nurses. And we know how valuable a role nurses play in our health system. In fact, they are the backbone of our health system. We have created 
106 new nursing posts. Along with vigorous recruiting campaigns, we have filled posts for doctors, nutritionists, hospital administrators, epidemiologists, adherence counselors, social workers, and pharmacists, among others. We have increased the stipend for community, community health care workers. And yes, member from Albert, the wage increase that you see is also reflecting that increase in the stipend for our community health workers. This is such a significant gain for the Ministry of Health and Wellness, Madam Speaker, as our community health workers play a valuable role as they are the eyes and ears of the, of, for health in their communities. We have provided scholarship for nurses locally, regionally, and abroad, and have supported with study leave for over 10 doctors who are specializing. Madam Speaker, through our partnership with the European Union and PAHO, five of our premier health facilities were retrofitted to international smart standards. These include the San Ignacio Community Hospital, Cleopatra White Clinic, the Independence Polyclinic, Isabella Palma Polyclinic and the Palm View Center, along with the Punta Gorda Community Hospital, which was recently completed. The Southern Regional Hospital and the Corozal Community Hospitals are as well currently being retrofitted. After that, Madam Speaker, there will be similar retrofitting of the Central Medical Labor Laboratory, the Northern Regional Hospital, and the Western Regional Hospital. Through the EU, Madam Speaker, we have also engaged in a data exchange platform, which will allow for instant data exchange between the Ministry of Health and Wellness and health facilities countrywide, including those who purchase services from the National Health Insurance Scheme. Including in these upgrades, are not only the improvement of the physical structures, but also improved management of water and electrical systems, as well as up-to-date waste disposal mechanism, which will, all, which will all allow for greater sustainability of our health facilities. <laughs> Madam Speaker, we are all cognizant of the burden of the chronic diseases not only on our health system, but also at the level of individual families and at community level. With this in mind, the Ministry of Health and Wellness has been constantly increasing the number of persons receiving dialysis, as the financial burden on these families are great. This will ensure continuous productivity of our young adults with chronic diseases, Madam Speaker. In the past, under the previous administration, these persons were simply left to die. There were no effort or concern placed on how to address this grave situation. My ministry has been able to lobby for more centers to be open and have been able to secure funds to assist patients and families to get the treatment they need. With significant emphasis, Madam Speaker, and efforts being placed on health promotion, including behavioral change and health prevention by my ministry, the prevalence of chronic diseases will undoubtedly decrease. In this same context, Cabinet has approved interventions geared towards promoting healthy food among school children at all levels, while reducing the exposure of unhealthy food and beverages, which will lead to a healthier belief. We are also cognizant, Madam Speaker, of our limitations. And in an effort to improve access, access in its true definition to our population, we are considering implementing the use of telemedicine in our facilities. I will not get too much into that matter because we first want to consult 
with the users of the system to get their feedback and buy-in. To better prepare for future pandemics and issues of public health concern, Madam Speaker, we have been able to successfully train a total of 25 health workers in field epidemiology at the basic, intermediate, and advanced levels. Belize has been placed on the map in 2022 as our staff has been chosen to present their work in regional and international meetings in Panama and in the United States. These presentations have been selected among hundreds of other applicants and proves that our staff are being trained at a high level in an effort to better prepare for emerging and re-emerging diseases. Madam Speaker, two years in office, just two of this government of the People's United Party, and listen to these highlights. I especially invite the member from Mesop to listen, because maybe then he can learn something about working for the people. You see, Madam Speaker, it's a pity he's not here, because when he go about guzzle champagne with Didi and Jay-Z and Fat Joe, that does nothing for the Belizean people. He needs to be here to listen and learn instead of coming to this house and rambling and rambling all over the place and in a very incoherent manner. In two years, Madam Speaker, we have built three new fully operational health centers, one in Cookie Tree, one in Belmapan, and another in Kikaka. In a matter of weeks, a health center in the community of Santa Marta will be completed. And thanks to the Minister of Tourism and Diaspora Relationship, we are constructing a polyclinic in Placentia as we speak. We have totally upgraded health centers in Ladyville, in Hattieville, in Valley of Peace, and in Georgeville. The one in Georgeville was just completed. That is tangibly working for the people, Madam Speaker. That is how you develop a nation. I was going to say something, but I will skip that one. But, but, but indeed, Madam Speaker, you know, I wish the member was here, because I wanted to do an rap. I mean, I rhyme up on anything. But, but I can't rap, and I know if I ask him, he can't either. But, maybe indeed. Madam Speaker, do you know how long the people of San Pedro were begging for a work? Imagine the striving, bustling tongue, the nation's premier tourism destination, and they have no more work to store the dead. 13 years! of a borough administration and nothing. But two years, Madam Speaker, and we have already laid all the groundwork for a state-of-the-art hospital in San Pedro Tong, a hospital, Madam Speaker, that will has, where the land has already been identified and cleared and construction will start very soon. That is how you work for the people. Madam Speaker, I'm immensely proud to note and that thanks to the ministry and the support of the Ministry of Finance, my ministry was able to ensure that the KHMH received immediate assistance which allowed the institution to pay $1.8 million in outstanding debt and purchase much needed, yes, UDP debt. Let me correct it in the PM, UDP debt. And this has allowed for, for them to be able to purchase much needed items and equipment for the hospital, including, and I will name a few, a steam generator, an AC system for the accident and emergency unit, a water pump to support the fire hydrant system in case of fire, and they were able to replace glass windows with hurricane-proof windows. The money, Madam Speaker, will allow the KHMH to upgrade the medical and surgical wards to provide improved services to patients and better working conditions for staff. Purchase EKG machines, 
upgrade the HR management system, upgrade staff training facilities, purchase a C-arm for the operating room, purchase defibrillators, purchase a much needed orthopedic operating table, and purchase a Grostroduo endos endoscope. And since you brought up that point, um, Mr. Prime Minister, let me also put it on record. When I spoke to the CEO just yesterday, because when you listen to the UDP propagandists and their media, they want to, they want to, 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 to portray that all is wrong at KHMH. They talk about they don't have any sterilizer. That's far from the truth. What was the problem was a generator system, a heating element within the generator. But let me put on record that they have secured a brand new, uh, as I mentioned, a brand new steam generator, and they have also gotten the part to replace the old one. And that will allow the sterilizer equipment to continue to function. And there was, if only one day delay, that was many. Madam Speaker, let me emphasize as well that all these efforts continue to strengthen the foundation toward achieving universal health coverage, which means improved health literacy, improved access to health services, improved patient experiences, and improved quality of care to every single Belizean across this country. As I turn to my constituency, Madam Speaker, with your permission, I would like to again thank my constituents of Orange Oar East for their unending support and confidence and share just some of what we have been able to achieve in the past year. In Santa Marta Village, Madam Speaker, we have renovated and upgraded the community park, distributed equipment to assist with the maintenance of the park and cemetery, constructed through the support of the Ministry of Education, a brand new preschool, provide internet service to the government school, constructed a home through the Ministry of Housing for a deserving family, installed lights at the football field, implemented a continuous upgrading program for village roads within the village, installed a playground set for the young people in the community, and we have assisted hundreds of residents with flood support and have subsidized monthly the village council to assist with expenses. And as I mentioned, Madam Speaker, the residents will in the next few weeks have access to a new health clinic, bringing health to the farthest remote village in Orijua East was a, one of the biggest priority we laid out in our plan as we were campaigning in 2020. And soon, through the support of the Ministry of E-Governance, we will also be inaugurating a brand new digital center in that community. In Palmar, Madam Speaker, we renovated the park, implemented the road upgrading program, installed lighting at the football field, donated equipment for the community maintenance, assisted the village council with monthly subvention, secured land documentation for the LATS committee and residents through the able support of our Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Natural Resources. We have installed a new playground set for the children. We have implemented a culvert replacement program with the support of the Ministry of Infrastructure, Development and Housing. We have upgraded the internet at the community center and we have secured funding for the installation of a new digital lab for the community, which again, Madam Speaker, will bring great benefits for the people of that community. And I want to say in my lobbying and in my efforts, we will soon see the paving of the two main roads that run through the village of Palmar, which will give them greater access and for the drivers and pedestrians. In Carmelita village, Madam Speaker, we have assisted with lighting for the football field, installed new playground set, 
carried out again continuous road improvement. We are installing culverts, new culverts in flood prone areas. We are con continuously support in sports, health and education and social initiatives. The, with the upgrade of the highway, bus sheds are being properly placed through the government road project. We are, have continuously been distributing lands to residents in that area. Over 300 lots and 300 titles have already been issued to deserving residents of the Carmelita area. We have continuously supported the government school. And Madam Speaker, we are currently working on a project on a new subdivision, which we are going to be distributing 500 new parcels of land to residents of Orangewa East. In Tower Hill, again, that village was abandoned. And for the first time in the village council election, Mr. Speaker, we have been able to turn things around and win that village council. We have been able to go in there and build a new playground for the children. We assist the village council with monthly uh, stipends so that they could continuously maintain the football field. We have given them tractor mowers so that they could continuously uh, up, um, maintain their surroundings within the community. We have assisted with education, support through the Ministry of Education. Again, all the social initiatives that we have been able to put through the Ministry of Human Development, Health-wise, and others. Madam Speaker, as the member for Orange Rock South says, the work that he has started in Guinea Grass at some point will also benefit the people of Tower Hill because the intention is for that main road to be paved from Guinea Grass all the way to the Tower Hill Junction. In Chan Pine Ridge, we have again continuously worked with the village council in maintenance, putting up football lights, lights in the football field, supporting the village council on a monthly basis. We have health, constant health clinics to bring about improved health conditions for the people in that community. And very soon, we will see the paving of the main road from the gas station to the village of Chan Pine Ridge. Madam Speaker, as you will know, a significant portion of Orangewa East lies within Orangewa Town. Because of this, we have installed sidewalk and solar lighting at Nature Park, along with a new playground set. We have also installed playground set at the Sandy Field Park and is currently working together with the Town Council in building the proper drainage and sidewalk in that area as well. In partnership with my good friend, the mayor of Orange Walk and the council, we have embarked on a massive project to replace old inadequate culverts as well as a drive to pave roads, which has already commenced. I can announce today, Madam Speaker, that another 10 major roads in Orange Walk East in the town will be paved soon. As well, soon to commence will be the construction of the Raman Cervantes Park. In terms of housing, again, Madam Speaker, we have been able to deliver five homes to the to needy Belizean. Mr. Speaker, imagine we have only been in office just a little over two years. For 13 years, the UDP talked, and still those on the other side are talking. That makes 15 years of talking and no work. That is the problem with them. They don't know how to work. We in the PUP know how to work and deliver for the people for this country. Latter years. Madam Speaker, when it comes to my constituency, I engage in supporting our young people through sports, the Mondialito tournament, who normally is organized by young Chato Perez. We have constantly worked with the mayor who is a sport fanatic and a sport enthusiast in football, in supporting through the Orijua Football Association. Those are commitments we have been doing and working together to bring about change in Orijua. Madam Speaker, even the willfully, willfully blind on the other side of the gallery 
can see that what has been done in the health sector in just the past two years is more than what was done under the UDP 13 years of the Barrow administration. The only thing that the UDP successfully nurtured in the health sector during their time was a rat infestation at the Western Regional Hospital, raccoon falling out at KHMH, and there's much more that we could list out. Madam Speaker, I can promise you all and all Belizeans here today that in just a few months, we will deliver a brand new CT scan diagnostic equipment to KHMH. But let me go further, Madam Speaker. This equipment will be modern, state of the art, and it will come with all the requisite training and a five-year maintenance program. How often do we see equipment be donated, but because we don't know how to use it, we lose it? This won't be the case here, Madam Speaker, because we do things the right way. This won't be the repeat of when the UDP gave a contract to an Orinjua based meat shop owner to deliver fish and other medical equipment to KHMH. Madam Speaker, again, I must herald the support of our colleague and the Minister of Tourism for his commitment in supporting us at KHMH. We are looking at the support of another million dollars that will be invested at KHMH in the health system to ensure that the, the CT scan and the diagnostics uh, area is improved to be able to provide better and quality service to the Belizean people. Additionally, Madam Speaker, we are in negotiations for the procurement of an MRI machine for the KHMH. Our colleagues in Taiwan has graciously offered that MRI machine. And through the, the discussions with the CEO and the management team, we are working on the logistics to get that thing, that machine here pretty soon. Because, because, Madam Speaker, we know that the Belizean people, especially those who access KHMH, find it difficult to get these services through the private sector. And we need to do more, Madam Speaker, and we are aware of that. We need to do more and do better through the public sector health system. Madam Speaker, my ministry has commenced the design planning for the pediatric wing at the Northern Regional Hospital. We have designed as well the Duck Run Health Center. And very soon, we will start the design plan for the tertiary hospital in Belmapan City. And, Madam Speaker, in improving the services and making in, to ensure that we bring more efficiency in the delivery of medical supplies and pharmaceuticals, we are working on putting up the design for a brand new central medical stores facility that will not only be a building, but one that will come very much equipped with the right inventory system, the proper software to track movements of medication, to also ensure that we can have quality medication being delivered to the Belizean people. I'm wrapping up now, Madam Speaker. And in conclusion, I am proud of my government, proud of my people, and proud of where we are as a nation. This is what we came to Belmapan to do, to serve the Belizean people. The future is once again full of promise for Belizeans of all walks of life. In every aspect of development, there is program and the promise of a strong nation. I am excited about the future of Belize, confident that what lies ahead for all of us is a stronger nation where everyone can find reason to say, todos ganamos. After 13 years of waste, we are showing the world that the Belizean people are formidable, that if given a chance, we can build a stronger and better nation. 
And so today, I am proud to be associated with the People's United Party. Today, I am proud to sit in a cabinet led by Prime Minister John Bersenio, and I enthusiastically support this budget on behalf of all Belizean, but especially on behalf of the good people of Orange Walk East. I thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the member for Corozal North. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, please allow me to read through my notes and, and make a few remarks in Spanish as I make, as I make my pre presentation on the General Revenue Appropriation Bill 2023-2024. Remember, as long as you translate, please, the Spanish. Definitely, Madam Speaker. I take this opportunity to convey my gratitude to all the women and join the global community in honoring them. But not just during this month, Madam Speaker, but all year round. I am blessed to be able to stand alongside the most courageous, strong, and powerful force on earth, our women. So it is with much appreciation that I say thank you, and I pledge to continue my support to our women. Now to the budget. <clears throat> For the second year in a row, the Prime Minister and his government continue to boost growth both balancing the budget, reducing the debt, and that everybody will win. The budget presented here today is a deficit budget, Madam Speaker. Much like last year's budget, where projected expenditures exceed revenue, and this government reverts to more borrowing to meet the shortfall. Where is this growth in the current scenario? The Prime Minister stands proud to announce to this nation that under his watch, the economic growth is monumental. And he goes, goes on to compare the economic growth rate during the UDP administration without taking into consideration the COVID-19 pandemic. He makes biased comparisons on two separate and opposing scenarios on the performance of the Belizean economy. But he intentionally wants to blindside this nation that under the UDP, under the UDP administration, prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, the economy was performing the same then as it is today. He deliberately fails to admit that the underperformance of the economy when this administration took over was due primarily to COVID-19. The Prime Minister continues to continues on to indicate that under the 12 years of the UDP, the national debt increased by some $2.2 million, and again, fails to include in the formula that the downfall of the economic growth and the consequent increase in the national debt associated, was associated to COVID-19. He blames the UDP for almost everything, Madam Speaker, but he cannot blame the UDP for racking up the public debt by some $500 million in the last two years. Madam Speaker, let's do some fact-finding here. If we divide $2.2 billion that the UDP borrowed and for which we can account for, for which we have numerous capital infrastructure projects completed across this nation, and for which we instituted pro poor programs that benefited thousands and thousands of Belizeans. But getting back to the numbers, Madam Speaker, under those 12 plus years that the UDP borrowed $2.2 billion, on average, every year the UDP borrowed some $173 million, inclusive of the COVID-19 pandemic scenario. Compare that to the average rate of borrowing of this Prime Minister and his administration. They are averaging some $250 million annually. They are borrowing in the vicinity of some 77 million more than the past UDP administration. This is what the Prime Minister and his administration need to explain to this nation. That you, that, that you, that you are indebting the people of this nation, our children, our grandchildren, and the great-great-grandchildren at a rate of $250 million annually. And what is there to show for this debt? How is it that 250 million annually will be benefiting our Belizean families? Try and find there is nothing much of benefit to the Belizean public at large. He also highlights the un unemployment rate that stands at 5% and 
but fails once more to announce to this nation that the method in which the unemployment index is determined has been adulterated. Similar is the case on the poverty index. In his budget speech, the Prime Minister highlighted that the poverty levels have decreased and that 68,000 less Belizeans are poor. Madam Speaker, you either have a job or you don't. And you either poor or you're poor, plain and straight. Thousands of Belizeans on the streets are unemployed and poverty levels have hit remarkable high levels. This is the true picture of the reality out on the streets. So that the adulteration in the way these figures are determined is a clear intent by this Prime Minister and his government to distort facts and reality. He prefers to portray a picture of a fantastic performance by his PUP administration. Madam Speaker, the reality out there is quite the opposite. Things are hard out there. You go out on the streets and experience the daily struggles of single parents, of parents, our youths, our children, and they will tell you that life out there is hard, life out there is mean. It is literally a hand-to-mouth situation. It is a world of survival, and parents are tasked to cope with the high cost of living and having to stretch their dollars to the limit to be able to buy what they can afford. The pockets of Belizeans don't have money, Mr. Prime Minister. Probably for you and your ministers and your cronies, there is much more money in your pockets. But Belizeans broke, people are broke bad, and people are getting impatient. The Prime Minister, The Prime Minister boasts about fully restoring the wages of public officers and teachers. Well, Mr. Prime Minister, this should not have been taken away in the first instance. Public officers and teachers' wages are not a privilege. It is their right, and to come to this honorable house and boast about restoring those wages as though it was an, a huge accomplishment is shameful. The Prime Minister then goes on to take credit for the infrastructure development projects being constructed across this country without mentioning that five of these projects were started under the UDP administration. He also fails to announce to, the, to this nation that the five projects that were started under the UDP administration were cut by some $64 million, thus putting the integrity of these projects into question. One such project, Madam Speaker, is the rehabilitation of the Philip Goldson Highway, and particularly the Ramata Road, which saw budget cuts to the point that there is no drainage in place to address the flood-prone areas of five communities. The absence of proper drainage on this stretch of highway, Madam Speaker, will not only affect our families in the villages of San Pedro, Cristo Rey, Yochen, Pachacan, and Chanchen, but it will also affect the quality of the roads being built. These are the issues that, these, that this budget needs to address. But perhaps the most concerning and most, and most damning in this budget, Madam Speaker, is the absence, the complete absence of any government program to address the extremely high cost of li living affecting thousands and thousands of middle and low income families in this country. In its publication for January of 2023, the Statistical Institute of Belize indicated that inflation had increased by some 6.6%. This is an extremely worrying situation for our disadvantaged and vulnerable families. Is this situation not alarming enough to the Prime Minister and his government. Wisdom would tell any leader of a nation, Madam Speaker, that there needs to be a shift in focus and that resources needed to be made available to those thousands of families being affected. Madam Speaker, it is clear now that this administration is offering no real solutions to the many problems facing this beloved country. One would recall prior to the general election of 2020, that they pledged to have the solutions to all the problems this nation was facing. 
and they went on a rant to criticize the then UDP administration for the lack of creativity in addressing the challenges and problems the nation was facing then. Here we are today, two years later, under a People's United Party administration, and no clear solutions have been offered to this nation for the problems that have exploded under this UP administration. Where are the solutions you had at hand on campaign trail back in 2020? Where is the creativity? Where are the strategies and plans that will see this nation overcome the problems in crime, in public health, in addressing the high cost of living, in addressing the high cost of inputs to our farmers? Where is planned Belize to address the rampant inflation that this country is experiencing? Where is planned Belize to intervene in the daily struggles of single parents who have to find creative ways to put food on the table for their children? Where is planned Belize to offer our families the necessary assurances that would see a middle income and a low income family earn the necessary money to cope with the massive inflation that is starving and punishing our families? Where is Plan Belize to ensure that at least Tylenol is available at our hospitals and our public health facilities? Where is Plan Belize to ensure that our public hospitals and public health facilities are properly equipped? Where is Plan Belize to ensure that there are enough materials to address, to address the emergency and health needs of our Belizeans? Where is Plan Belize? Madam Speaker, there is no plan Belize, and there is nothing meaningful for our hard-working Belizeans in this budget. Our farmers, Madam Speaker, agriculture has always been the bedrock of our economy. But the struggle for the farmers in recent years have been intense. For the past two years, our farmers struggle trying to rebound from the disruption of the pandemic. This continues to be compounded by the challenges brought on by climate change and the rising cost of inputs. Where are the subsidies for our farmers? I must also plug in as well the same question for our 250 fishers. They have been and continue to be invisible under this administration. When will our hardworking farmers and fishers who feed us be treated with the priority and urgency. I will turn to the Ministry of Agriculture, Food Security and Enterprise. The allocation budget shows a total of 1,925,000 for CAP2 and 12,407,789 for CAP3. In CAP2, allocation support to farmers, disaster risk recovery, that allocation has been reduced from 601,046 to 150,000. All I am appealing at this point in time to the Prime Minister and to the Minister of Agriculture to make sure our farmers are given priority by ensuring that appropriate allocations are made to our farmers. We are very cognizant that, that, that whenever any sort of disaster hits the agriculture sector, the losses can be devastating and can literally cause complete losses to our farmers. Again, the Ministry of Agriculture allocation, under CAP3, there is a $4 million allocation from Sustainable and Inclusive Belize, and another 1.5 for Sembrando Vida Belize. On these two programs, all I would ask the Minister is to ensure its proper and objective implementation and that beneficiaries of these programs, Madam Speaker, be the farmers, the real farmers, and not political cronies. Madam Speaker, I would like to find out from this administration if there is any support in the pipeline for the agro-productive -product sector, as the details outlined in this budget has none, it has zero, it has nada. The sector, Madam Speaker, continues to be battered by the exorbitant cost of inputs. Since 2020, the prices of herbicides, the prices of pesticides, the prices of insecticides have been increasing exponentially, and there is a trend that seems to have no cessation. It is notable that since 2020, inputs have increased by over 200%.
While there have been fluctuations to a minimal extent, the average increases, increase persists to date. This sustained increase in the cost of inputs has severely affected the competitiveness of the sector. Farmers have had to find ways, ingenious ways, to cushion the impact of these increases and not transfer these increases to the consumers. Madam Speaker, our hardworking and dedicated farmers toil the land with passion and dedication. They undergo long hours of work in the burning heat and under the rain. There is no fixed time for a farmer to be at his or her field or farm. Farming is practically a 24-hour schedule. And despite the many sacrifices and losses that our farmers suffer, they still have a sense of shared social responsibility and a big heart for our Belizean consumers. Despite the hurdles, they are willing to suffer losses to get a product that is at the lowest price they can afford to our Belizean families. We hear time and again farmers supporting the cost of consuming cars instead of passing on those cars to our, consum to our consumers. To those farmers, we tell you, thank you, thank you, thank you. For they are true champions in their fields and they know to champion the cause for social responsibility and social justice for Belize and Belizeans. But their sacrifices can only be sustained to a certain extent. It reaches a breaking point where farmers are obliged to increase the prices on their goods and services as a consequence of the relentless increase in production costs. Hence, the increases in the prices of corn, beans, rice, and other grains to meet products and other agricultural products on the value chain. And while we remain grateful to them for their sacrifice, and we continue to honor them for that, we see no reciprocal effort made by this government. The response on behalf of our government is cold and it, and it is remorseless. There is absolutely no assistance in this budget to alleviate the everyday challenges of these farmers, except, except for handouts here and there. Madam Speaker, I will refer you to the request made by BSIASR and two sugar, in, two sugar cane farmers associations to the Prime Minister asking for an increase in the price of brown sugar. This request, Madam Speaker, was strictly done on an economic perspective as the sugar industry, like other industries in the agro-productive sector, has been hit with the exorbitant production costs. The cost of producing white sugar today far exceeds the price being sold at the markets so that this industry is suffering, suffering from losses. The request made was done comprehensively to address the losses to the consumers, to cane farmers, and the impact it would have on consumers, precisely one of the concerns that the cane farmers had. Since sugar cane prices are regulated by the state, this comprehensive analysis was presented for consideration to the Prime Minister and his cabinet. While the prices of other commodities have been adjusted to reflect the increase in the production costs, this administration did not support an increase in the price of brown sugar when it was clearly presented that the industry, and particularly our caneros, our working farmers, were producing at a loss. But what became a slap on the face to the industry and to our working farmers, Madam Speaker, is the fact that no other alternative, no other economic incentive was given to them. None whatsoever. This is your plan, please, to our hard-working caneras and caneros in the north. Este es el mensaje que este gobierno le envía a nuestras caneras y nuestros caneros en respuesta a la alza en el precio del azúcar morena. No les apoyamos. Preferimos que ustedes sigan sufriendo pérdidas y no hay apoyo para el caniero. Este es plan Berice para nuestros caneras y nuestros caneros. I've, I've um, translated them, um, Madam Speaker. But what our sugarcane farmers need to understand 
is that again, this government has attacked the fuel subsidy, which was given to them under the UDP administration fully. This year has been no different from the past crops since this administration took office. As of the start of the crop on December 27, 2022, the fuel subsidy given to cane farmers has been adjusted four times. We're almost going into March, and in, the, in that short period of time, the fuel subsidy given to farmers has been adjusted. At a time, Madam Speaker, at a time when the global prices of uh, crude oil per barrel are at a low of $70, yet we do not see any kind of decrease in the prices of um, fuel, and we see a government that instead of assisting its farmers, it's taxing them more. Madam Speaker, as from 27 December 2022 to January 2023, the fuel sub subsidy averaged at $4.4 to both Corzal and Orange Rock farmers. As of the 21st of January 2023 to the 10th of February 2023, that fuel subsidy was reduced to an average of $3.77 for both Orange Rock and Corzal King farmers. This, Madam Speaker, represented a reduction of 67 cents or 15%. What this means to our farmers is that you are being taxed by this administration 15% more on fuel. As of 11th, February 2023 to March 8, 2023, fuel subsidy was reduced to an average of $3.50, again, another cut, for both Corazal and Orange Rock farmers. This represent, represents a combined reduction of 90 cents, or 21%, that farmers have to pay more on fuel. As of March 9th, the current fuel subsidy was again adjusted, this time from a positive end. After two consecutive reductions, it was adjusted to $4.35. That, Madam Speaker, represents still a decrease of nine cents that the farmers have to pay. All these adjustments to the subsidies on fuel for farmers happening while a petition was made to this administration to increase the price on brown sugar, justifiable as a consequence of the high cost of inputs. Brazen enough, this administration tells our caneros and our caneras, I will not give you the increase that you're asking on the price of brown sugar to mitigate your losses, but I will further go and reduce the fuel subsidies that were given fully under the UDP borrow administration. What a shame on this government. And I remind you, my beloved Caneros and Caneras, that this treatment that you are all getting under Plan Belize, donde todos ganamos, a ustedes, queridas Caneros y Caneras, su ganancia es que sufran las pérdidas y paguen más impuestos. Now, moving on to the Ministry of Infrastructure Development, Madam Speaker. In member, get, member, are you going to translate that? I'm, I'm reading in English and then just putting it in Spanish when I'm speaking. I'm certain the Prime Minister will understand fully what I'm saying. And yourself as well, Madam Speaker. For it to be. Thank you. Member, please continue. Now, moving on to the Ministry of Infrastructure Development, Madam Speaker. In getting into the details of this ministry's budget, I want to start off by emphasizing on rural roads and agricultural roads. Corozal North is a constituency that has an extensive network of villages and farmland. This constituency, Madam Speaker, is known to have one of the most developed areas in sugarcane production and traditional cash crops, so that in terms of agriculture production in the area, a variety of products are produced by our hard-working farmers. In this regard, Madam Speaker, access to their land is very essential, particularly because of the unique nature of agriculture, and this is where agricultural roads become very, very important 
to the livelihood of our farmers. On page 225, under capital two expenditure, item 9040 infrastructure of villages, streets and drains, an, an allocation of three million was made. Item 9041, infrastructure, rural roads and bridges, a total of six million has been allocated. Same page under item 9046, infrastructure, sugar roads, a total of 1.3 million has been allocated. Under item 9047, infrastructure, agricultural roads, another total of 1.5 million has been allocated. Madam Speaker, the combined allocations that are being made for these three items represent $11.8 million, which all constitute road works throughout the rural communities, agricultural roads, and sugar roads for the entire country of Belize. Notably, Madam Speaker, in this fiscal year, we are not having village council elections, and as such, the budget allocation for this year is significantly lower than that of fiscal year 2022-2023, when we had village council elections. Allow me, Madam Speaker, to compare the figures that were spent last year. On page 225, item 937, rural roads and bridges, a total of 7.9 million was spent. Under item 1200, streets and drains, villages, a total of $12.827 million was spent. Under item 1435, rehabilitation of sugar roads, a total of 1.3 million was spent. Under item 1610, maintenance of streets and drains, a total of 7.9 million was spent. Under item 22, rehabilitation of a sugar road, a total of 1.5 million was spent. These items represent a total of 31.5 million that was spent on village roads, agricultural roads, and sugar roads. The difference in allocation, Madam Speaker, between fiscal year 2022, 2023, and that of 2023 and 2024 is $19.7 million. What this is saying, Madam Speaker, is that the rural communities and surrounding agricultural areas will be shortchanged of almost $20 million. The allocations being made, Madam Speaker, is a shame on this administration. This shows you the level of disrespect that this administration has on our villages and our farmers. So that we on this side of the house will not condone these irresponsible actions by this government, and we demand on behalf of the, our people in the rural communities and our farmers for the government to stop politicizing the livelihood of our people and to start treating them fairly. Madam Speaker, this leads me to the concerns of the beautiful people of Corozal North. Out of the 10 villages that we have in Corozal North, only three villages receive partial rehabilitations on their roads. And when I say partial, I am doing so modestly. Almost 90% of the village roads in my constituency have not received any sort of rehabilitation since this administration took over. And the growing concerns that we have for the villages of San Pedro, for the village of Cristo Rey, for the village of Pachacan, for Chanchen, for Shaibe, for San Andres, for San Antonio, for Paraiso and Consejo, is that this administri administration spent over $31 million on rural roads last year alone, and only a handful of streets were done. What will happen to our roads this year when we only have $8 million to spend on agricultural roads and our village roads? The outlook for these villages is dim and hopeless. This is giving the people of, of these villages a clear indication that nothing is going to happen again to remedy the critical state of our village roads. And I call on this administration to be fair and equitable to our rural communities. The communities within Corozal North, who are some of the most productive and hardworking Belizeans, Madam Speaker, who find a decent way to make a living and pay their taxes. Our people deserve better. They are not begging for services from this government. They are very productive Belizeans 
who contribute to the economy of this country and as such expects to see some decent contributions being invested into their communities. Madam Speaker, on behalf of our people who live in the rural areas, we ask this administration to consider their request. Going into the urban areas of my constituency, which is Altamira, Chula Vista, and Rainbow Town, who have similar concerns, the level of abandonment of the infrastructure facilities in these areas is beyond imagination. Allocations being made in the budget can be cited on page 225 under the following items. Item 1202, Streets and Drains, Belize City, which has an allocation of 2.9 million. Item 9022, Maintenance of Streets and Drains, which has an allocation of 5 million. Item 9043, Infrastructure Cities, Streets and Drains, another allocation of 6 million has been made. The sum of these, of these allocations, Madam Speaker, gives us a grand total of $13.9 million. This is what has been allocated to our seven towns and two cities. While the allocations made to the different towns and cities will strengthen the work that each individual town or city council does, this allocation is a huge concern to all. $13.9 million, Madam Speaker, is a meager allocation when we compare the poor, poor performance of some of the town and city councils. And I will refer specifically to Corozal Town, where the road conditions are at a historical worst. At every corner of town, drivers have to struggle to determine which areas of the road are not as bad to drive through. Some revert to finding the roads that are bad, but not as full of potholes. Other motorcyclists and bicycle riders have to skip the bigger holes to drop into the smaller ones and in the process risking accident and injury. Some others divert into private properties to avoid getting into potholes. And many others, Madam Speaker, who have a daily routine to travel in the town are left with the bitter taste of traveling in roads in very bad conditions, which is incurring them huge, huge expenses on repairs on their vehicles. Road conditions are so bad in this town, Madam Speaker, that Corozal has been, named, has been renamed Oyosal. Yes, Oyosal. Oyosal, Madam Speaker, in Spanish, our local Corozalenos would use it to describe their roads as full of potholes. The Corozal Town Council has turned to be the laughing stock of Corozalenos as streets are paved only for repairs to be done on these newly paved streets shortly thereafter. This has become the new norm of paving in Corozal Town. So that when we take into consideration what is needed for Corozal Town to address the infrastructure needs, Madam Speaker, I am just concerned that once more, the beautiful people of Altamira, Chula Vista, Rainbow Town, and as a matter of fact, the entire town will once more not get their fair share of the pie. This makes it the second year in a row, Madam Speaker, that the people of these areas who are all hardworking Belizeans, dedicated parents, youths and children, will not see a decent investment into the infrastructure needs of their communities. So to our beautiful people of Corozal North, the message is clear. There is nothing, nothing in the pipeline for you once more. Empty promises and a plan believes where todos perdemos is now the new state of affairs of the government of the day. Needless to say, the incompetent town council will do no better. Basic services are, deteri are deteriorating by the day, but spending is on the rise. We have an, an interesting 2023-20 be reminded, however, my fellow Corozalenos, that next year we are going into municipal elections. Let this budget be a reminder to you on the day of elections. Moving on to the Ministry of Transformation, Community, Development, Labor, and Local Government. What a fancy name. You know, Madam Speaker, 
It's been two, two years that this administration is in government, and one can perfectly recall that back on the campaign trail, the empowering and economic growth of our rural communities was a centerpiece on their campaign, and Plan Belize kept on, kept on outlining all the tempting promises to our villagers. Plan Belize on campaign mode had a million and one promises to the people of our rural areas, starting from the undertaking of massive, massive village infrastructure programs to improve streets, bridges, culverts, and garbage collection in rural communities, to constructing new hurricane shelters, upgrading and improving of public buildings. Plan Belize even went as far as providing ambulance services to our key satellite clinics in our rural communities. To the majority of the villagers, the promises were so touchy and appealing that they fell for it. Plan Belize proved to be a political show on steroids. Nothing more than just empty promises. Where is the infrastructure works? Where is the ambulance service, services in the satellite clinics? Where are all the embedded promises? Where are all the promises embedded on Plan Belize? Well, it seems to me that the satellite clinics are so close to the moon that the people cannot see where these ambulance services and satellite clinics are. To our hardworking people in the rural communities, I would suggest that you start getting a telescope in order to find them because none is visible on Earth, none is visible in the country of Belize. The rural sectors in this country are completely abandoned. The concerns from food security to security issues to the basic provision of decent water services continue to be a major problem for our villages across this country. So that this so-called Ministry of Rural Transformation is nothing more than just an empty fancy name. There is nothing of sub substance for our villagers nor our town people in this entire budget. The allocation for this ministry, Madam Speaker, is pathetic. 16,295,115 out of our $1.5 billion budget, Madam Speaker. This represents the most invisible figure of 1.46% 1 1 of the national budget. This is a slap on the face to our people of this country. This ministry, Madam Speaker, represents nine, nine municipalities and 195 villages. What this budget is telling Belizeans, Belizeans Madam Speaker, is that out of every dollar, 1.46 cents will, will be spent on our towns and municipalities. Let's take, for the sake of explanation, two, two one cents. You take one cents, you leave it apart, you take the other one cents, you cut it in a half. Out of the half, you have to slice one piece because not even half of that the people of this country won't get. You have to slice it to 1.46. And this is what the people of this country, and I'm talking about village people and I'm talking about the, about the towns and cities, they will be getting out of every dollar that this budget has currently. This, Madam Speaker, is just one reflection of the importance of Belizeans across this nation to this administration, or the lack thereof, I should say. So to our Belizeans out there, make sure you, you, hang on, you hang on tight, because this year is going to be a bumpy ride for our pockets. In concluding, Madam Speaker, I am stunned and in a state of shock by the reductions in, the, in this budget for key ministries whose programs have a direct impact on our most vulnerable families. The Ministry of Human Development, Families, and Indigenous Peoples Affairs, the Ministry of Home Affairs and New Growth Industries, the Ministry of Rural Transformation, my good friend, Community Development, Labor, and Local Government, and the Ministry of National Defense and Border Security all suffered major cuts this year. 
Here we are presenting a budget which is which significantly under resources the ministries that need more urgency, that need more priority. Yet we are spending some $194 million on the Ministry of Infrastructure and Housing. We are spending more money on paving roads and allocating nothing to assist our thousands of families who have suffered increases in the prices of the basic basket. We are paving more streets, yet the price of rice increased from $1.47 per pound to $1.70. The price of flour increased from $1.10 per pound to $1.51 per pound. The price of whole chicken increased from $2.91 per pound to $3.80 per pound. The price of a unit of egg increased from 0.30 to 38. The price of vegetable oil increased from $4.57 per liter to $6.31. And the price of tomatoes increased from $2.08 to $3.53. Madam Speaker, the price of sweet pepper has increased from $2.84 to $4.22 per pound. The price of food that hits hard on our vulnerable families has exploded and we are doing nothing to alleviate the situation. We are spending more on doing roundabouts when we do not have Tylenol in the hospitals, when we have a broken health system, when there is a public outcry for the shortages on materials to properly treat patients, when the maternal and child health unit does not have any, any allocation on capital to investment expenditure, which is needed to address our vulnerable, vulnerable populations, our pregnant women, and our children. There is zero on that allocation, Madam Speaker. We are now allocating more money on infrastructure, yet the price on fuel in this country ranges between $12 to $14 per gallon. And when I have men had mentioned earlier, Madam Speaker, that the price of the barrel of crude oil has gone down to $70 US. Madam Speaker, I see no, subs no substance in this budget to, for our farmers and our fishers. This budget is a budget for the political cronies to benefit and not the hardworking Belizeans. This budget is a budget for the few chosen to have more money in their pockets and not for the thousands and thousands of Belizeans who are broke. Madam Speaker, for these reasons, I cannot support this budget. Madam Speaker, I, I want to share a few remarks that the member of Orangewak East had to say in regards to the budget. What the member of Orangewak East needs to do is to explain to the Belizean public why there is a one million increase in allowances increased from 1.1 million to 2.1 million in the Ministry of Health. What the member of or in drug East needs to explain is why over $9 million has been spent on medical supply and there is a huge outcry, outcry in this country of shortage of supplies. Madam Speaker, at this point I want to thank the doctors, I want to thank the nurses, and all the staff who work at these public health facilities for their hard work and dedication. And I want to thank them as well for taking money from their own pockets, from their own pockets, Madam Speaker, personal money for their families. They are taking out to buy Tylenol, to buy rubber gloves, to buy, to buy, to buy all kinds of materials that they can afford so that they can provide decent services to our needy Belizeans. This is what the member for Indrak East needs to explain. Madam Speaker, I thank you. I recognize the member for Kaya West. Up once, yeah. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Your permission, I'd like to refer to my notes. Madam Speaker, just before going to my notes, 
like to perhaps address my colleague for Corazal North who was talking about increases and practically referring about the sugar industry main topic but in disclosing some of the increases he forgot to mention the fertilizer madam speaker fertilizer is something that we import so perhaps he fails to realize that those increases when he's talking about vegetables and likewise the fuel those are products that are not made in belize imported and that will raise the cost of all products madam speaker including whenever we travel in a luxury tacoma but madam speaker those are the facts we're talking about infrastructure we we're stating no infrastructure while he was referring about road developments he was referring about housing and those are the things madam speaker that i understand there on the other side of the house that i'm not willing to support this uh, at the end of the day budget that we are trying to accommodate for the citizens of this country not forgetting that we are on this side trying to amend all the damages that they did to our country and to the, our people in the mismanagement thankfully for for the honorable prime minister trying to put things in place and trying to secure back our belizean dollar but madam speaker honorable prime minister colleagues belizeans and more specifically the wonderful people of kaya west a pleasant good afternoon let me start off madam speaker by wishing yourself and all the women of this nation a happy women's month I fully endorse the words of our Prime Minister in his budget speech, envisioning the day a woman leads this nation, and ably and remarkably as you continue to lead this House, and your sister colleague, Senator Colorin, Caroline Standiford, the Senate. A happy Women's Month to you, Madam Speaker, and all our beautiful, hard-working Belizean women. That said, Madam Speaker, I raise in full support of 2023-2024 budget estimates. The people of Kaya West, who I proudly represent, supports this budget. They are experiencing development and progress in our area that has long eluded this constituency. I will quickly highlight the many accomplishments the 2023 2022-2023 budget supported in my constituency. Thanks to the kind assistance of our Prime Minister and member of Orange Rock Central and my other colleagues on this side of the House, and the patience and support of the residents of Kaya West, we were able to provide education, school grants, and scholarships to students in high schools, junior college, universities, and those studying abroad, promoting educational opportunities for young people in the district. Thank you, member for Freetown. We were able to oversee the construction of starter homes in Kaya West, which have provided affordable housing to families in need. Thank you, member for Kaya Salt. We were able to ensure that the village water boards are well represented by competent individuals and work to ensure that villages have adequate access to water. Thank you, member for Toledo West. 
we were able to partner with Organization of American States, the OAS, to establish the Tamay Center of Learning, providing educational opportunities to the community. Thank you, Senator Amon Courtney and the Ministry, Ministry, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. We were able to provide assistance to those in need to re regularize the status in Belize through the amnesty program. We were able to rec recognize the achievements of Kaya West women by awarding them awards with the assistance of CEO Tania Santos and Madam Speaker. Thank you, Member for Belize Rural Central, and yourself, Madam Speaker. We were able to assist the Belize Banana Fiber Group in teaching women's groups about the usage of banana fiber, promoting economic empowerment for women. Again, thanks to the member of Belize Rural Central and Toledo West. We were able to support local football teams with uniforms and monetary assistance, helping to promote sports and recreation in the community. I must express thanks to the Benkebiho town councillors who are incremental in the planning and execution of this tournament. We were able to undertake major road maintenance and installation of culverts in Arenal, Cala Creek, Sokots, and Benkebiho, improving infrastructures and transportation in the district. Again, Thanks to the member for Kayosol, CEO Victor Espat, and Western Manager, Mr. Obidio Estrada. We were able to secure funds from NAVCO for the Kaya West sewing classes, promote, promoting voc vocational skill trainings. Thanks to the former national president, Mr. Javier Sabido, with the support of the member for Toledo West. We were able to provide monetary assistance for events for groups in Kaya West, supporting cultural and social activities. We were able to distribute tires for Kaya West taxi drivers, promoting road safety and improving transportation services. We were able to distribute over 500 school bags to schools in Kaya West, supporting educational access for youth students. We were able to distribute roofing zincs to needy families, improving living conditions for those in need. We were able to partner with Beltrade to provide sessions to businesswomen in Kaya West, supporting entrepreneurship and economic development. We were able and partner with Cache to remodel the new Del Carmen Park, promoting community recreation and wellness. We are able and continue to partner with the Embassy of Taiwan in the continued Mandarin classes, having experienced the graduation of over 150 students in both the level one and two courses. Many thanks to former ambassador to Belize, Ambassador David Kao Chao Chen, and we look forward to working very closely with our new ambassador, Lily, Lily Li Wei Su, to continue this and many other collaborative programs. The top of this past budget, Madam Speaker, thanks to RPM and his CEO, Ms. Narda Garcia, and the Community Development Fund, we have lent money, monthly monetary support to all these villages, namely San Jose Socots, Arenal, and Cala Creek, to assist our councillors in meeting their mandates and responsibilities. We have identified and acquired some lands in various parts of the constituency, set up land committees to oversee the proper distribution of these lands and we will continue to work hand in hand with the members for Lake Independence and CEO Paul Thompson to identify even more lands 
to distribute to first-time landowners. Plan Belize in action, Madam Speaker. We have started opening new farm roads for the people of Arenal, Watahole, San Jose Socots, and Calacric. Again, a work long neglected by those on the other side. So what's in this new budget for Kaya West, and what are our plans going forward? Let we quickly highlight those, Madam Speaker. One, we will continue our collaborative work with the Ministry of Infrastructure and the Bencaviejo Town Council to improve infrastructure of Bencaviejo Town. As we speak, massive works are taking place in the preparation for the paving of all border road all the way to the Amin Agar football field, which includes that area that houses John Paul II Junior College. Two, we will work with the Ministry of Tourism and my friend, the member of Pickstock, to open the final seven miles of road that will join Benke Viejo Town and Caracol Maya site and boast the tourism product in my constituency. Three, we will conclude the process of once and for all proper, properly delineating the boundaries for Benke Viejo, San Jose Socots, Cala Creek, and Arenal, being the first constituency to have proper legal boundaries for all our villages and our town. Madam Speaker, while the budget is comprised of tons of figure, and we speak about gross domestic product, budget surplus, etc., etc., the bottom line for our people is their, is their access to housing, land, education, affordable and reliable food supply and jobs. For us in Kaya West, this is our daily motivation. We must provide the means and tools for our people to work hard to improve their lives. I commit to my people of, San, of Sokots to renew my efforts to make San Antonich my site, which sits in their village, be even more beneficial to them. I call on the niche board and the member for Fritong to devise a mechanism that will benefit San Jose Sokots and to do so with the expeditiency. All we are asking is for a cultural center constructed in San Jose Socots with a portion of the proceeds from the Maya sites that sits in our village. It is not only fair, it is the right thing to do. It is what Plan Belize is all about. Everybody for win. Let me also use this forum, Madam Speaker, to again appeal on behalf of our people for improved health care in our area. Benke Viejo Town alone, according to population estimates, has a total population of over 7,300 residents. San Jose Socots is just a little over 3,000. You add it to those, the villages of Arenal and Cala Creek, in the community of Corozalito, and the catchment population of Kaya West stands at just about 12,000 Belizeans. The Kevin and Kenneth Guerra Polyclinic is no longer suffice. It is not meeting the medical needs of our people, and I love the fact that Plan Belize demands that we do better. I call on the Ministry of Health to take seriously the healthcare needs of our people in Kaya West and to put in place collaborative plans to not only improve the clinic, but to think big, to think short, medium, and long term, and to get Benke Viejo the secondary care facility it deserves. Services such as delivery room, it should and cannot be okay in 2023 for mothers in the emergency cases to have to choose to go to Melchor, which is closer to deliver their babies when we can and should be able to provide these services in Benkebiho Town. We also need a minor surgery room and 24-hour emergency services 
to name a few. Honorable member of Orange Rock East, I appeal to you and your ministry to give us the attention and help we deserve. I do not believe in requests. I do not believe our request is unreasonable, nor will I bend to the popular guardian that this is, is failing on deaf ears. We will depend on you, member of Orange Rock East. Madam Speaker, for years, the residents of the new era in Benke have had to endure undue hardships due to the lack of water and electrical expansions. We have been in communication with both utility companies and we understand the challenges that comes with these community expansions. Water is an universal right, and while the town council on the week, weekly basis ferries water to the more than 30 families who reside in the area, I make special appeal to the member for Cayo North and to both Belize Water Services and Belize Electricity Limited to use all their expertise and will to lend assistance to these families. Electrical expansion is not an, a, as challenging as water, water expansion is, still fleeting for these families. This area, Madam Speaker, is a part of the proposed expansion area for Benkebiho Town. And with the growth in population, more expansion is anticipated. We also indicate, Madam Speaker, that San Jose Socots is also in need of water and electrical expansion, and we will continue to knock on doors so that our people can have access to these vital services. Madam Speaker, there are two projects I spoke about last year that are still in the pipeline, namely the Hamak Bridge that spans the Mopan River that would grant access to San Antonich in the rainy seasons when the ferry is closed and rendered impossible. The San Jose Socots Bypass Road that would allow our people of Benque Viejo all weather access to the rest of Belize. These projects are still very much alive and we are very close to raising the final funds needed for their full implementation. Madam Speaker, let me close by reiterating the fact that this accomplishment not only demonstrates my dedication to improving the lives of my constituents, but it also demonstrates the POP administration and Plan Belize drive to promoting community development in Kaya West. I am in 100% and I will not spare a single effort to continue to make a tangible impact on my constituency. I will continue to work tirelessly to support my constituents and promote economic, social, and educational opportunities in the area. To the hardworking and educated people of Kaya West, may I remind us that we are in this together. Let us make 2023 our year. Let us not waver or doubt our abilities to leave a lasting impact in our area. We cannot rest until poverty is erected and zero employment is our true statistic. Until then, we strive, we work, we unite, and we fight for our area. Madam Speaker, we the people of Kaya West fully support this budget. Thank you. I recognize the member for Dan Grigal. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker, with your permission. I'd just like to do this here. With your permission. Thank you. Mem uh, yeah. It says Dan Griga, if you can, no got any glasses. I don't know. Good evening, uh, Madam Speaker, Prime Minister, distinguished members of Parliament, all in the gallery and in the house today, residents, residents of Dangriga, Sarawi, Hope Creek constituency. Uh, 
all my fellow Belizeans. Allow me to recognize, I don't think I need to say now that we have a strong contingent of 10 from Dangriga. Represented here, we have Ms. Gongara, Ms. Monsanto, Brother Massive, Aunt Elda, Mr. and Mrs. Jones, we have Ms. Valine, we have uh, Ms. Dez, we have Ms. Nana, and we have Mia Mariana. Welcome. It is a distinct honor and privilege for me to rise today as the area representative of the beautiful constituency of Danriga, Sarawi, and Hoop Creek for the third time in a budget debate in full support of this year's budget as presented by our Prime Minister, the Honorable John Bresenio, on Friday, March 10, 2023. Before I start my presentation, allow me to join my colleagues to express condolences on behalf of the Dangriga constituency and my family, to my friend, the area representative for Kaya South, Honorable Julius Espat, on the passing of his beloved mother. We pray that her soul may rest in peace and rise in glory, and that our Almighty Father will console Brother Julius and his family during their time of loss. I also recognize the students and teachers who have visited our proceedings. Yesterday from my own primary school, Holy Angels RC School from Pomona, and this morning from Our Lady of Guadalupe High School in Belmopan. We are always very proud to see our young and bright students in the gallery, in fact, living the meaning of competency-based education. Once again, I will analyze the budget using the approach of sustainable human development, which is a new and comprehensive paradigm that is best suited to understand and promote policy development and to improve the quality of life of our citizens. So I will be having my presentation in three parts. Just a quick overview of really what sustainable human development is about is about and how we're using it, how I'm using it in this analysis. Uh, a summary of the four areas of sustainable human development and how in particular, I will apply it to the social pillar and the area of education. And then I will close with a brief assessment of the impact of this budget on my beautiful constituency. Sustainable hu human development is a synergy of sustainable development and human development. It is defined as the process that enlarges people's choices in the present without compromising the ability of future generations to enlarge their choices. The priorities are to satisfy the needs of the world's poor and to ensure the sustainable use of our natural environment. This approach is multidimensional and multidisciplinary, and it has so slowly begun to positively influence how development analysis and work is conducted. You may have heard of the Human Development Index replacing GDP as the main way of calculating a country's level of prosperity. I am pleased that now poverty in Belize is being measured by a multidimensional index that looks at not just income, but includes education, employment, health, and living conditions. This is what sustainable human development promotes. I'll move now to the four areas, including the economy, the social pillar, the environment, and of course, the institutions. And I'm hopeful that it might be enlightening to our friends from the other side who, uh, in particular, the leader of the opposition might find it useful. The annual gross domestic product is estimated to reach $6.253 billion during this budget year. As I noted in last year's budget presentation, to achieve increases in real GDP, it is necessary to increase 
the real growth of GDP by more than the rate of the population. That is really what matters in the definition real GDP. And this is projected to occur under this budget, unlike what happened under the last UDP administration. During those terrifying 13 years, real GDP grew at a lower rate than the population growth between 2008 and 2019. Real GDP per capita growth was actually negative 0.09% over that period. This is the legacy of the last administration based on actual data and the reality of their performance. And the people took matters in their own hands and sent the message in the last general elections. If what the oppo opposition leader stated yesterday was true, then they would still be in power and we would be on that other side. But clearly we are dealing with fantasy versus reality as Minister Fonseca has clearly pointed out. If I had more time, I would elaborate some more, but we're at the end. Uh, maybe that's why I was placed way uh, down the side, um, PM. <laughs> I want to speak about the fact that we inherited an economy that lacked any semblance of resiliency. And that is why we had such a large drop in our GDP, right, over 13%, and such a, a, a large increase in our unemployment. That's the legacy that they left for us. Other countries in the region fell by 5-6% at the most. But because of what they left for us, we ended up just falling over the cliff. Our unemployment rate has fallen under our John Briseño administration to a low 5%. And this is due to a number of factors. I recall a member from Collet suggesting that maybe I I elaborate on some of these things last time, so I, I will take your advice and do that. But it is mostly because of the exceptional performance of this administration, maybe something that you might not want to hear. The, SI, the SIB, Statistical Institute of Belize, has done an excellent job in explaining to the general public how the figure was derived and how important it is for them to abide by international standards in their calculations. At the crux of the matter is that while on the one hand many persons have left the labor force and so are not counted in the cal calculations, on the other hand, thousands have taken up opportunities to earn a living because of our Briseño administration. Our policies to invest in education and training and to make it conducive for businesses to grow and hire more people will serve to bring back those who have left the labor force, returning with new skills and new hope where they will be met by innovative entrepreneurs who will need their services. This synergy of efforts is being made possible due to the creativity hard work and dedication of my colleagues on this side of the house, something that the last administration found alien and out of their reach. The third variable I'll cover is inflation. We have been hearing from the other side denials of what is really occurring with price increases. They, st they seem to be stubbornly ignoring the international discussion from the United States to Europe to Asia to Latin America and the Caribbean on the fight to reduce inflation. Central banks all over the world are grappling with decisions on